Sviso. Sviso. Password. Password. Podium's good. Password.
This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it oh, 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 oh. I'm gonna let it shine. I'm gonna let it 
May be seated. Uh, good morning yet again, delegates. It 
gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this inaugural Johannesburg Week uh, hosted in Johannesburg. I wish I could say welcome to sunny South Africa, but the weather wasn't, it does not allow me to say that today. I stand before you in my capacity as the vice chairman or chairperson rather of AFSA being the arbitration foundation of Southern Africa. And of course, I welcome you on behalf of AFSA and its co-host, i.e. the co-host of this conference. The purpose of Johannesburg Arbitration Week is to showcase Africa as a ripe seat for international arbitration. We are going to discuss during the course of this three days opportunities, challenges, and carve out a way forward so as to make Africa even more attractive as an in international arbitral seat. May I recognize, please, our keynote speaker this morning Deputy, uh, the former, I beg your pardon, the former Deputy Chief Justice of the Republic of South Africa, Justice Dupal Mbeneke, the eminent representatives of governments who are with us today, namely the Deputy Minister of Justice and Constitutional Development, the Honorable Mr. John Jeffrey, the Minister of Justice of the Government of Malawi, the Honorable Mr. Titus Mvalo, the Minister of Justice of the Government of Lesotho, the Honorable Mr. Ramueleki, Richard Ramueleki, the Deputy Minister of Justice of the Government of Zimbabwe, the Honorable Mr. Nobe Mazungue, and the Attorney General of Lesotho, the Honorable Advocate Mutsielo. May I also recognize the presidents and chairpersons of the law societies and the bars of SIDAC, together with their respective delegations, as well as the delegation of China Africa Joint Arbitration Centers. I wish to also recognize the president of the Indonesian Dispute Resolution Board, Dr. Gayo, the past president of the Commonwealth uh, Justice and uh, the South African ambassador to the World Trade Organization, Ms. Olelwa Mlumbi Peter, and all the distinguished guests here present. You are warmly welcome. As we embark upon this very exciting conference, may I request a few honorable delegates to please have regard to the AFSA Alliance Charter, which is to be found in your, in your pack. That charter will form the subject matter of the second session where the delegates will be signing that charter accordingly. So if you could please have regard to that. There is also something else to be had regard to please in your pack. And that is the moot competition uh, documentation. There, if you could please familiarize yourself with the case of the heavenly twins. And uh, that's the case that is going to form the uh, subject matter of the mood that we're going to partake in towards the end of the session today. And award will ultimately be handed down. And the exciting part about that award, if I may whet your appetite, is that there will be an AI produced award and a, uh, a human produced award. So ultimately the question is going to be can the delegates tell the difference, which of the two was uh, produced via AI and which by human, 
by the human hand and so on. So then, that then requires a few of you ongoing participation because as the proceedings unfold, you will be requested to vote, i.e. to indicate on your telephones, on your cell phones, which of the two awards in your opinion is an AI award or which, uh, and which is a uh, human written award. And uh, those are just the two housekeeping issues that I, I wanted to sort of deal with before I introduce to us the next speaker. Now, allow me please to introduce to you our Honorable Deputy Minister of Justice and Constitutional Development, the Honorable John Jeffrey, who will be delivering this morning an opening message to the conference. John Jeffrey is a friend of us uh, at AFSA. He was instrumental in the promulgation and the passing into law of the International Arbitration Act, which completed the uh, international arbitration infrastructure in, in South Africa. And it is because of his efforts, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, South Africa prides itself as a destination that is ready for business on matters international arbitration. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your heads together, heads together <laughs> for the Deputy Minister. Thanks for those kind words, uh, Advocate uh, Lindy and Corsi Thomas. Uh, former Chief Justice Bichang uh, Mosoneke, uh, Michael Cooper and representatives from AFSA, uh, the ministers and deputy ministers of justice from other SADC countries, distinguished guests and friends. It's my sincere pleasure to welcome you to South Africa and in particular to uh, this event. Uh, Advocate Nkosi Thomas has already made reference to the weather, uh, which I think is also one of the reasons why we've had a bit of a later start and some of the chairs are still uh, empty. Uh, so apologies for the weather. Uh, hopefully it, it will clear up before you leave. Some of you may recall that initial, initially attempts were made to convene the Johannesburg Arbitration Week conference in March 2020 but that had to be postponed due to the global onset of COVID-19. We're therefore very pleased that we as South Africa are now able to convene the Johannesburg Arbitration Week, albeit some four years later than we had initially hoped. And we've made significant strides in international arbitration since then. This conference provides us with an opportunity to showcase arbitration in Africa and with a particular focus on South and Southern Africa. I'm told that we will be having over 300 delegates attending this week, with significant, including significant representation from China, North and East Africa, from Europe, and from our SADC neighbors. And I want to extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you. As you know, South Africa's International Arbitration Act came into operation on the 20th of December, 2017. This act incorporated the UN Citral Model Law into South African law and ensures that South Africa, like its Commonwealth, African Union, and SADC counterparts, has a reformed and modernized law on international arbitration. At the time of the passing of our law, we pushed ahead with this important piece of legislation because we realized the enormous benefits of arbitration as an alternative dispute resolution method. For us in South Africa and other parts of Africa, we all know the concept of Ubuntu and the role it plays in our law and in various justice systems. Arbitration and mediation are part and parcel of our heritage. As former Constitutional Court Judge Justice Edwin Cameron once remarked, and I quote, appropriate dispute resolution has a long history in South Africa. In traditional African communities, a sanction was seldom invoked for a breach of customary law. Instead, the primary means of conflict resolution was agreed corrective mechanisms. Parties want to settle their disputes speedily. 
Often they also want to be able to choose a mediator or arbitrator who is an expert in the particular area or field of practice. Often ADR may also be cheaper than going the route of litigation. For many, international arbitration is the foremost way of resolving cross-border disputes. For many, the fact that international arbitration arbitral awards are enforceable nearly worldwide is a significant advantage. In addition, international arbitration institutions provide a structured process, thus enhancing fairness in the process. Very often people, very often people choose to shy away from traditional adversarial justice processes and will rather seek solutions which aim to achieve a win-win solution rather than a winner-takes-all outcome. Another important factor is that having an efficient arbitration regime makes good economic sense for any country. Internationally, many are realizing the advantages of arbitration, and it is therefore with great interest that we are seeing the emergence of an arbitration alliance among static countries. I was also invited some years ago to the launch of the China-Africa Joint Arbitration Center, or KJAC for short, and I'm told that the Johannesburg Arbitration Week will also serve to provide a platform for KJAC and its work since its initial establishment via the Beijing and Johannesburg consensus. KJAC has grown since then to become a partnership between six arbitration institutions, three in China and three in Africa. The Johannesburg Arbitration Week will also present an opportunity for a discussion on a shared BRICS arbitration platform. Finally, I want to take this opportunity to congratulate AFSA on its success as being rated the top arbitration center in Africa by the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. I mentioned earlier that initially this week was planned to be held in 2020. It's now a mere four years later, but we can all attest to how much the world has changed, uh, that the world that we live in has changed since 2020. We're increasingly living in a world where the need to find solutions to pressing challenges is becoming more and more urgent. The best way to address the rising challenges of unemployment, inequality and poverty is to grow our economy and by creating an environment which is conducive to doing so. I want to wish you all a very successful and productive Johannesburg Arbitration Week. Thank you. May I thank the Deputy Minister for his uh, very warm and sincere opening. As uh, I said before, he has always shown he, the acknowledgement of the important work that we here at AFSA are doing. Let's uh, put our hands together to the Deputy Minister once more. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if I may, uh, introduce Justice Dekhang Museneke, very well known to all of us. He requires no introduction, quite honestly, but protocol demands that one says a word or two <laughs> in introduction. Uh, I'm, I mean, it's justice. Uh, justice Dekhang Museneke is a uh, constitutional jurisprudential giant. He, he has had a very unique career, spanning from politics. You know the story about his detention at Robben Island at a tender age, and uh, he then became an attorney, progressed to the bar, practiced as junior counsel and progressed to the ranks of senior counsel when it was unheard of of people our color, in truth, to take. So, and he, he, the status of senior counsel was conferred to Justice Dehang Museneke. Having retired now, he is an eminent and prominent international arbitrator, and he chairs the SADC panel of arbitrators and he is our Vice President of the AFSA International Court. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask Justice Musaneke to deliver our keynote address.
just brightened my day, Madam Program Director. <laughs> nice warm kiss early in the morning. <laughs> that does work for any good guy, isn't it? And any good lady. Thank you ever so much. Madam Program Director, Advocate Lindy Nkosi Thomas, SC, Vice Chairperson of the Arbitration Foundation of Southern Africa. For those who may not know, she is therefore a leader in this terrain. Advocate Michael Cooper, SC. Wonderful to see you this morning, who's chairman of AFSA. And if the truth be told, one of the big, big dynamos in creating the space at which we are and also chairman of the China-Africa Joint Arbitration Center, KJEC. I'm grateful for this invitation to deliver a few opening remarks to signify the start of the auspicious Johannesburg Arbitration Week. Your program builds my address as keynote. Mine can hardly be. When one considers the remarkable and talented contributions to varied features of arbitration to follow in the next three days. The real fascinating weightlifting on arbitration is well ahead of us in the next few days. Mine is more, no more than to signify the start of a remarkable Johannesburg Arbitration Week ahead of us. If I make a few and hurried acknowledgments, permit me to repeat a tried but inspired mantra of Michael Cooper, SC. He teaches with considerable conviction, and I've had him repeat it a few times, and there it is. It is, in his words, it is for the government to take responsibility for updating arbitration legislation and to adhere to the fundamental international conventions. It is for the courts to protect the integrity of the arbitration process and to recognize and enforce arbitral awards in accordance with international norms and standards. It is for the legal profession to develop the particular skills required for arbitration practice, to ensure the observance of ethical standards to produce arbitrators of high quality, to train young practitioners, and generally to foster the culture of arbitration. It is for the business community to understand the particular advantages of resolving disputes by way of arbitration process, and thereby to benefit from cost-effective, quick and fair process. And lastly, it is for that ministering administration center to provide the multiple services that which taken together constitute a credible arbitration center in accordance with international standards. There the code ends. Ladies and gentlemen, a more lucid statement on the ecosystem of arbitration one can hardly find. It reminds us of the unique components, or if you like, constituent parts of the ecosystem that are meant to ensure the wholesomeness, and if you like, the hygiene of the ecosystem of arbitration. All these together produce the outcomes that we hope for. Firstly, I'm pleasantly struck by the attendance at the Johannesburg Arbitration Week and the many distinguished people who chose to honor us and be part of JAW. More importantly, the attendees reflect the ecosystem of arbitration I've referred to a moment ago. Representatives of government at executive and institutional levels from the SADC have honored us with their presence. I'm pleased to see several ministers of government from the SADC states with our starting our own Deputy Minister of Justice and Constitutional Development, John Harold Jeffrey. Good to see you, Minister. We've worked together for many, many decades. And thank you for the promotion to Chief Justice, <laughs> rather belatedly. <laughs> Indeed, present here is the Minister of Justice of Malawi, 
Mr. Titus Barlow, you are welcome, sir. Deputy Minister of Justice of Zimbabwe, um, who I met a moment ago, Mr. Norbert Muzungunye. Talking about the courts, several of my judicial colleagues in both active and non-active service across the SADC region will be active contributors in a variety of panels over the following three days. About that, I'm deeply proud. The days of judicial distaste towards arbitration are truly and correctly gone and passed. Arbitration provides an additional, necessary, expedient, and cost-effective platform for a just resolution of commercial disputes, both domestic and international. There is no rivalry and competition between what the bench properly does and what arbitration affords modern society. The attendance of the legal profession at JAR 2024 is truly and correctly dominant. The prominence of the presence of organized profession in SADC is unmistakable and something that personally warms my heart. By name, Law Society of Swaziland, Eswatini, Law Society of Namibia, Law Society of Angola, the Law Society of Botswana, Lesotho Law Society, Malawi Law Society, Ordem dos Advogados de Mozambique, I hope I got that right, Tanganyika Law Society or Tanzania Law Society, if you will, the Law Association of Zambia, the Law Association of Zimbabwe, and I must add and acknowledge here present the president of SADC Law Association, uh, Mr. Flavio Menete, uh, it's wonderful and hope to see you very shortly, sir. They will all, these leaders of these law societies, come onto their own when they join the deliberations to sign the Sadek Afsa Alliance Charter in the next session. Then the hard work that has pre preceded the signing of, of, of the charter with the support of the leadership of Sadek Lawyers Association will come fully to the fore. As the Sadek division of AFSA takes root, it is heartening to observe the participation and presence of bars and advocates chambers on, in the region and elsewhere. Again, Johannesburg Bar, the Limpopo Society of Advocates, the Pretoria Bar, Pan-African Bar Association of South Africa, Northwest Bar Association, Bishop Bar, Cape Bar, South African Bar Association, General Council of the Bar, Advocates for Transformation, Ordem dos Advogados de Mozambique, Mozambique Bar Association, Dumanoque Group, Group 1, Group 621, Tulamela Chambers, Trinity International LLP, and 39 Essex Chambers. We are indeed privileged to have your attention, presence, and support here. Law firms and attorneys, too many to single out. And I've noticed with many, I've had some dealings, saying them by name might very well. They seem to be less than what I should be doing. But these are vital corks in the arbitration system. They are, after all, the ultimate custodians of the culture of arbitration. Local attorneys, large law firms, all of you, we much appreciate the role you play, and indeed, you stoke the engine. You kickstart it thereafter. And without you, there would be no ecosystem of arbitration to talk about. Properly so, I see here present our companies and parastatals across the region in attendance at you. The arbitral ecosystem would hardly function without the business community embracing the shared arbitration framework. An investment, the business community require modern legislative framework for international arbitration and reputable institutes. I've noticed the presence of accountants, ever present, that inevitable lubricant that we forever need. And so too we have the academy. In my days as a judge and 
much younger judge, I went on endlessly about the required cooperation between the academy and the bar and the bench. It is that powerful taxonomy that the academy provides and the facility for the jurisprudential and philosophical underpinnings of the law that they often provide to remind us of what informs the rules that we lawyers so conscientiously tend to apply. And may I add to say that we have indeed people here present from the North and West Africa, from Ethiopia, from Nigeria, from Kenya. Clearly, ample from the United Kingdom with all the KCs you see on the program, from France, from Denmark, from India, from Indonesia. This is just a wonderful moment and I know at some later time there'll be talk about the presence of various international arbitration centers about which I will say no more. But I'd like to welcome you all, whether from Shanghai or Beijing or from Nairobi. It is wonderful to have you here. Now, Johannesburg Arbitration Group gives us all an opportunity to review and to review in depth where we stand as a country and as a region and as a continent, I mean the continent of Africa in the arbitration world. It is an opportunity which has been given to us through the combined initiative of the Arbitration Foundation of Southern Africa and the eminent co-hosts who are among its leading founding members who are a repository of arbitration skills of the highest quality. We must make most of this opportunity. This is a time to measure achievements, so too our shortcomings, to identify our challenges and opportunities. We share profound responsibility in that regard, a responsibility to ensure that our trade, our commerce, our business activity, whether local, regional, or international, are supported and served by world-class dispute resolution service. You will see, therefore, that the Johannesburg Arbitration Week program includes topics of fundamental importance that have been discussed wherever arbitration practitioners meet. And I refer in that regard to our scheduled discussions, for instance, on the impact of technology on arbitration, on the essential need to guarantee integrity in international arbitration, and in ensuring that arbitration processes are opposite and relevant in a world undergoing profound change and in deep need of ethical foundations. But there's another dimension to the Johannesburg Arbitration Week, which is very real to me and to which I wish to devote particular attention. These are topics in the Johannesburg Arbitration Week agenda, which can only be usefully discussed here at Johannesburg Arbitration Week at this time. These are the topics which focus on our region and on our continent and on the global connections which we have fostered and on which we must build. This conference began with the rendition of two anthems I'm sorry I missed those, madam, and, and I hope there were two anthems sung, and you made sure there were, a national anthem and the regional anthem. It was right to do so because it underlies the importance of Johannesburg Arbitration Week, not only as a national, but also as a regional initiative, as a building block in support of trade and industry in the SADC community with regionally, both regionally and internationally. In a few minutes time, we will watch as law societies of 10 SADC countries come together to create the SADC AFSA Alliance, a partnership which is intended to standardize and to harmonize dispute resolution practice in the SADC countries. It is an initiative which began as a partnership between SADC Lawyers Association and the Arbitration Foundation of Southern Africa. You will find the objectives and the aspirations which drive the partnership reflected in the Alliance Charter, which is in your pack. Members of the Alliance will share a united arbitration platform 
offering the internationally popular AFSA International Rules under the aegis of the AFSA SADC Division, which will represent the voice of AFSA Alliance members. I want to acknowledge how much we owe to the SADC Lawyers Association in leading this project that will build a bridge between our legal communities in the SADC countries. For far too long, <clears throat> our colonial history and heritage, both linguistic and jurisprudential, has fractured the region and kept us apart. That ought not to be tolerated any longer. As we watch the alliance become a reality, so too we watch the bonding and the rebonding of the Sada communities to all our benefit. I would add also that the alliance is not limited to the Sada community. I can foresee that we are building a platform that will be of interest to our neighboring regions as well. Yes, we are constructing a significant and hopefully historic edifice. I want to suggest that the scaffolding is up, the construction is afoot, and it will take some time, patience, but above all, commitment. And yet the fruits of increased trade, investment, economic development, and regional integrations are in the offing and are all worth pursuing. It is in that context also that I draw attention to the importance, importance which the Johannesburg Arbitration Week program places on the emergence of African continental free trade area. It is an enormous project which will help to unite the continent, the need for African arbitration centers to provide appropriate dispute resolution mechanisms for that free trade zone demands our attention. And there is yet a further dimension. Our host, the Arbitration Foundation of Southern Africa, which in my book, and I hope in all of our books, is a top arbitration center on our continent, has been a major contributor to the planning and the establishment of the shared intercontinental arbitration platform known as the China Joint Arbitration Center. That is a partnership between six of the leading arbitration centers of China and of Africa. And all those centers are represented by their respective delegations here at the Johannesburg Arbitration Week. KJEC is a unique shared platform between the Chinese and African arbitration centers, sharing the same rules, standards, and panels of arbitrators. It is the dispute resolution mechanism called into existence by the Forum of China-Africa Cooperation to resolve disputes along the African Silk Road. AFSA again represents South Africa in the shared initiative at the BRICS Law Society in creating a similar shared platform for BRICS. These developments may well change the face of global arbitration practice and it is appropriate that the Johannesburg Arbitration Week program details the developments to date and future prospects and develop and debate what might be in the offing for all of us. But the Johannesburg Arbitration Week would not be Johannesburg Arbitration Week. We want it to be if there was no time for relaxation and a look at the lighter side. It also would not be if young AFSA were not in the mix and were not part of the excitement that ought to flow out of a gathering of this nature. Please familiarize yourselves with the intriguing case of the heavenly twins which you'll find in your pack and enjoy the mood which will allow our leading young practitioners from the bars, from the attorney's firms, and from all around SADC to make their submissions to the AFSA International Panel. And which will also allow us to watch as the award of the panel is compared with an award 
lo and behold, we oldies can't quite ha have a handle on this. An award that a laptop could give us at the press of a button in this new world. Think all of you of all the judgments I've written and all the nights I've spent writing them. Now a laptop can do that, I'm told, with a snap of a finger. Maybe what a loss or what a gain, I am not certain. <laughs> Having said that, enjoy Johannesburg Arbitration Week. Learn from it and give us your guidance and wisdom throughout the Johannesburg Arbitration Week. Again, thank you. And let's keep that inspiration going. God bless. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, from the horse's mouth, the, SADC, uh, the chair of the SADC panel of arbitrators, it tells us that we are here to construct an historic edifice in the region, that is the SADC region. Now, with those uh, words uh, flowing from the chair of SADC, uh, i.e. the chair of uh, SADC panel of arbitrators, our session has come to an end and allow me to hand over to Mr. Paul uh, Paulman Chungu, who will direct the second session. This is the session where we will be consolidating our relationship with the SADC region and uh, the AFSA Alliance shall be signed. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I see what you meant, my lord. I got the kiss too. Uh, good morning, everybody. This session is going to deal with the AFSA Sadek Alliance. In 2019, in Big Falls, the Sadek Lawyers Association and AFSA signed an MOU. The alliance that is about to be witnessed in the signature of the law societies and AFSA is a culmination of the work that has been done to forge relations and to get to a place where SADC has arbitration regionalized and the law society is recognizing that Africa can resolve their disputes in Africa and SADC can resolve SADC disputes within the SADC region and have SADC as the hub of arbitration for matters related to the religion, to, to, to the region. Uh, to discuss and have a few remarks about the objectives, purpose and expectations of this alliance, I am going to call to the podium Mr. Michael Cooper, SC, please come through. The chairman of AFSA and Kajak. Mr. Flavio Menet, the president of the Sadiq Lawyers Association. The Honorable Mr. Tysas Mbalo, the Minister of Justice for the Government of Malawi. The Honorable Mr. Nobet Mazungunye, the Deputy Minister of Justice for Zimbabwe, and uh, Honorable John Jeffrey, the, the Deputy Minister of Justice for South Africa, who we had earlier. Please take your places at the... You may please take your seats, and I'll call upon Mr. Michael Cooper to please either come to the podium or if you're comfortable to make your remarks out there.
can skip one there. The, the panel speaking here on, on, on the objectives, purposes, and expectations, I want to recognize, though, that there is present, and I think that uh, Lindy did, the Honorable Mr. Richard Ramoletzi, the Minister of Justice of Lesotho, is present to witness this occasion, and so he is his Attorney General. The panel here will address those objectives, purposes, and expectations. Mr. Michael Cooper, please. Good morning, everyone. Can you, can you hear me? Welcome to Jaw. And um, may I say what a privilege it is to be able to speak in this session in which we watch the construction of a regional alliance which will transform arbitration practice in the 16 member states of SADC and which ought to have a huge transformative effect on the way in which all of us practice arbitration and the way in which all of us are able to take our rightful uh, place in the world of international arbitration. I want to make three points. It is sometimes said, and it was very generally said, that there was a bias against the recognition of African seats and African centers of arbitration. That there was a negativity which sought to disqualify African arbitration centers from taking an equal place in the world of global arbitration. Is that true? I want to suggest to you that the answer is no. And I want to demonstrate that answer by mentioning the, the facts that are known to me in, in our journey in seeking to become an internationally accepted arbitration center. The deputy minister was largely responsible for the enactment of the International Arbitration Act in South Africa at the close of 2017. Until that time, South Africa hardly figured as an arbitration venue or seat. But at the end of 2017, three forces came into alignment. The first was the government's commitment to a proper legislative framework to support international arbitration, the domestication of the model law into South African legislation. The second was the clear, consistent standards of our courts in respecting international arbitration and arbitration. And the third was the work of the um, key supporters of AFSA, its founding members, in helping to create and transform what had been a local arbitration center into a regional and international arbitration center with appropriate rules, with appropriate court, with an appropriate uh, framework 
in the secretariat and administration of its work. So three things came into alliance at the end of 2017. And from that moment on, AFSA performed as an international center. It was difficult to find the statistics that would demonstrate whether there was in fact an international support for this emerging African seat. Because there were no statistics which showed you whether in South Africa or in Southern Africa, there was a shift towards the utilization of a homegrown center. But there were statistics for Africa south of the Sahara. Those statistics showed us to what extent African arbitrations were being administered by the ICC, to what extent they were being administered by the LCIA, and to what extent AFSA was making any impact. And of course, Africa south of the Sahara is a huge, it is a massive area with various regions which have no uh, innate connection with each other. So to choose the statistics of Africa south of the Sahara were stacked against the uh, emergence of, of, or the measuring of the emergence of AFSA, which had operated in South Africa and in the Southern African region. And yet, by the beginning of 2020, the largest number of arbitrations south of Sahara, south of the Sahara, that were referred to administration, were referred to the ICC. But just behind the ICC came references of the administration of international matters to AFSA. And way behind that, came the number of references to the LCIA. So within two years of the coming into alignment of these three interlocking forces, the arbitration world had recognized and had accepted that AFSA as a regional and international center had its own place amongst the centers administering arbitrations internationally. So you ask the question, is there an inherent negativity against African seats? The answer, I believe, is no. The second point I want to make is that the timing of today's event calls into question is this the right time? Is it the right time for the 16 SADC countries to come together to share a platform for regional arbitration and international arbitration? What are the signs? Well, the fact that I have the honor to sit here with ministers and deputy ministers of justice from SADC countries and those who are in the audience who have given of their time for the specific purpose of showing the support of governments in SADC for this initiative is one sign. Another sign is that 11 SADC countries, I include South Africa, will be making their adherence to the charter this morning, will be joining hands in what is one of the most ambitious uh, African initiatives in the field of arbitration. I know what I'm about to say always causes people to look at me as though 
I had been smoking something. <laughs> the combined land area of SADC is greater than the United States of America. The population of SADC is larger than the population of the United States of America. We are talking about an initiative that in other continents would be regarded as continental in its sweep. So it is a massive, a massive initiative. And it is an initiative with a promise and a, uh, a future which will transform all of our understanding and practice in arbitration. And a last point, if I may. It is something Justice Mosaneki uh, spoke on. This initiative, led by the SADC Law Associations, this initiative is a bridge between countries in the region which had not hitherto shared some form of legal framework. The bridge of arbitration is going to bring our legal communities together in a way that has not happened before. And I'm not imagining it, we've seen it. We've seen it at the workshops. We see it at this conference where we have a huge turnout of the leadership of the SADC countries, of the corporates, of the parastatals of the, of the uh, SADC countries. And so we, we stretch out our arms across and beyond the colonial history, the linguistic disparities, the different jurisprudence, and we clasp each other's hands in a shared initiative which will have its impact on all of our professional lives, on all our professional horizons, but more important than any of that, in the well-being, in the welfare of the SADC countries. I, I was only supposed to give Mr. Cooper five minutes to speak, but in my involvement with this AFSA SADC Alliance, he has spoke with the passion you have seen today, and uh, it's, it's that driving passion that probably gets us to where we are, and the work we were doing, we believed we would get here under his guidance, and I would like us to give him a special round of applause for the great efforts he has done to get us here today. I will now invite uh, uh, Mr. Flavio Menete, the president of the Sadiq Lawyers Association to have. You can come up here um, or you can speak from there. Your preference is yours. Thank you, Paul. I always prefer to talk standing, not sitting. Good morning, everyone. All protocol observed. Today uh, marks a huge milestone in the development of the legal profession and its conscious contribution to development in the SADC region. We have walked a long journey since the conception of the idea to institutionalize the practice of arbitration in our region. Even though the tasks ahead are even solved, it is noteworthy that uh, have started in earliest and we are well on our way. The sayings going goes that the hardest thing about going on a marathon is putting our, on our shoes 
tying the shoulders and uh, setting foot on the track. After that, the run is a breeze. I'm therefore inclined to start by conveying my profound gratitude for the SADC stakeholders, fortitude and commitment because we have taken many significant steps. In 2018, the Sadek Lawyers Association Council resolved to constitute a regional panel of arbitrators. This was in response to a deficit of structured services in arbitration around the continent. In many cases, bar associations are requested by the private sector and government to provide expert arbitrators, expert arbitrators in high value matters. Until the resolution to institutionalize international commercial arbitration, most appointments and tribunals have been ad hoc and based on no objective standards to guarantee quality, efficiency, independence, and impartiality. In 2019, the Sadek Lawyers Association accordingly signed an MOU with AFSA as the recognized leading body in international commercial arbitration to partner us with technical backstopping in order to transform the leadership we could provide to our respective member states in providing dispute resolution services. This resulted in the formation of the AFSA SADEC, law, AFSA SADEC division, the vehicle through which the project to establish a regional seat for international commercial arbitration will be implemented. It is therefore no doubt a historical moment that will be etched in the history of Africa and the world, where we announce a regional consensus in establishing the truly regional seat for international commercial arbitration. We have constitution, constituted a regional panel and we have adopted the AFSA international rules as a basis for harmonization. To do this, we ride on more than 25 years foundation of Southern Africa. Of our, I, I mean, we ride on more than 25 years of hard work and determination by the founders and drivers of the Arbitration Foundation of South Africa. Today, the dream becomes a reality expanding arbitration to all countries of SADC region. For that, we thank the Arbitration Foundation of Southern Africa. Without the support of the respective governments of SADC member states, there will be no realization of this project. I recognize in a special way the presence of the leaders of government from South Africa, Malawi, Zimbabwe, Lesotho, and Zambia. The, the step to securing the realization of Africans and SADC as a serious destination for foreign direct investment and a preferred seat for dispute resolution is the determination of the state to secure, to ensure competent dispute resolution mechanisms on Africa soil are given due recognition. I urge all bar leaders present or represented here to work with our respective governments in order to take the necessary measures, necessary efforts for this newborn, newborn body to be included as a preferable one and avoid cost with our several trips to New York. Paris, 
London and other places, specifically, especially when we are dealing with matters related to our resources. As president of SADC Lawyers Association, I am privileged to preside over this momentous occasion and to receive the support of fellow president of respective bar associations across the, the region today. I thank you all, my brothers and sisters, and I look forward to shaping the legacy of a prosperous SADC region together with you. Today, we put together the nuts and bolts of the much talked about arbitration project. I recognize that uh, you have all made a mammoth personal sacrifice to be here. Resources are scarce. We are just coming out COVID and the lawyers have yet to fully find their the, the feet while other members were lost to the pandemic. It is therefore an indication of our commitment that you are here. Looking at the contents of the agenda before us, I am sure that the sacrifice was worth and it and the outcomes will justify the effort. I note that uh, for the first time, we, as the legal profession, have given birth to a project which we believe in the extent that we have invested in. Normally, we do out with a beginning boil and expect donors or so-called development partners to fund, to fund us. However, the fact that we have planted the seed on our own speaks to our independence and impartiality. It also heralds a new chapter in our existence as an association where we fully own the outcomes of our efforts. I salute you. Thank you and wish you all progressive and positive deliberations. Thank you very much. Um, the, the commitment of the Sadiq Lawyers Association to this project is, is, is probably uh, shown even more with the realization that we have present today two past presidents of the Sadiq Lawyers Association who were instrumental in the decisions leading up to and uh, getting to the Sadiq Lawyers Association signing the MOU with AFSA. I will recognize you, Mr. James Banda. He was the president when we signed, and I recognize Mrs. Kondwa Chivira Sakala as well. Thank you very much for keeping the commitment and uh, keeping the flame burning and still coming to see this alliance get to fruition. I will now call upon uh, the Honorable Mr. Titus Mbalo, the, pres the Deputy Minister, the Minister of Justice from Malawi. Please come through, sir, today. It is a great honor to stand before you this morning. I am here representing the government of the Republic of Malawi on this esteemed gathering that is the Johannesburg Arbitration Week. Our presence here is a, a testament to Malawi's unwavering commitment in enhancing the landscape of international commercial arbitration within the SADC region. We consider this as an important part of the regional integration and a true and practical 
Africanization of the on continental issues. That commercial disputes within the continent can be efficiently and effectively managed and resolved within our region instead of, as has been happening in the past, sometimes having to be referred to an arbitral seat in London or Singapore or other places like that. The highest law of our land in Malawi is, as you would expect, the Republican Constitution, which the people of Malawi collectively adopted in 1994. The principles of national policy through Section 13 uh, paragraph one of that constitution enjoins the government of the Republic of Malawi to adopt and implement policies and legislation aimed at ensuring that differences are, are settled through negotiation, good offices, mediation, conciliation, and most, most importantly and relevant to this gathering through arbitration. Two years ago, the Malawi government therefore took a significant step of acceding to the New York Convention. This positioned us as a credible and reliable venue for resolving international commercial disputes. This action underpins our vision to make and maintain Malawi as an attractive seat for international commercial arbitration, fostering an environment where justice and economic development converge seamlessly. We were therefore happy to see that in January 2022, the Malawi Law Society, the Sadiq Lawyers Association, and the Arbitration Foundation of Southern Africa, AFSA, embarked on a mission to cultivate and institutionalize a robust arbitration culture. Their collaborative efforts started with organizing an inaugural international commercial arbitration conference, uh, which took place in Mangochi, in Malawi, uh, where the Attorney General was, was in, in attendance, supporting and, and, and representing government interests in the initiative. This event marked the beginning of a transformative journey, educating nearly 200 lawyers and business um, uh, captains across the SADC region on the intricacies and benefits of international commercial arbitration. The journey did not stop there. Uh, in August 2022, we received and honored an invitation by the Malawi Law Society and the collaborating partners to attend a high level constructive engagement, engagement conference towards the establishment of the Malawi International Commercial Arbitration Center and the signing of the project uh, partners MOU there on, on Monday, 15 August 2022. Our president, uh, His Excellency the President, uh, of Malawi, Dr. Lazarus Makathi Chapera, agreed and attended the conference and opened that conference uh, with a high note uh, address. The high note speech was delivered by no other than, uh, than uh, Mr. Uh, Michael uh, Cooper, SC, who is here. He was the one that gave the keynote address at the conference. We have since made significant uh, further steps, uh, including and significantly a legislative strides uh, through the enactment of the International Arbitration Act in 2024, 2024 uh, just this year. This legislation was proposed by the Malawi Law Society 
and AFSA in September 2023, the government of Malawi had no difficulties taking this through the legislative process. Uh, it aligns our legal framework with the UNISTRO model law. This act not only facilitates the use of arbitration in, in resolving international commercial disputes, but also ensures the recognition and enforcement of arbitration agreements and foreign arbitral awards, reinforcing our commitment to international standards and best practices. I am mandated, I'm mandated under, under, under the law as Minister of Justice to decide its effective debt. And I can assure you here that that will happen. But what I'm waiting for is to take your technical advice on when the main players would like this to come into place. Uh, the, the, the reason for this is that it would be counterproductive if I appoint a date of effectiveness today and then it, take, it takes a long time to come, in, to come into operation. So I want, I'm waiting just to be told by the technical people when they're ready to operationalize the, the, the center. Moreover, I've noted that on 14th March 2024, our Supreme Court uh, of Appeal in Malawi has endorsed the principle of competence, competence. This, to us, is a very important development. Because it underscores our judicial support for arbitration. Uh, this principle of competence, competence recognizes arbitration as a one stop forum for resolving a dispute. This landmark decision reaffirms our, our stance on, on minimizing judicial intervention in arbitration, thus, enhancing our attractiveness as an arbitration-friendly jurisdiction. Let me say at this point, um, I know I don't have much time, uh, 25 minutes, but I'll still, I think, uh, indulge you in a, an example which I'll give you of um, what happens when you don't have an international arbitration center locally. Um, I was involved as the as counsel, before I became minister, I was a practicing lawyer. And uh, in one of the cases that I did, which involved uh, an international uh, uh, company and uh, a local company, in which the local company was subcontracted, uh, and in the agreement that, that they signed, of course, I wasn't involved in the drawing up of the agreement, and I wasn't the lawyer at that time. I became a lawyer only when there was a dispute, and so I was approached. Uh, by the local company to assist. Upon reading the agreement, I noticed that the parties had agreed to defy disputes uh, to an arbitration se uh, center. Arbitral seat appointed was Singapore. And so there was a practical problem where we then said, let's go to the High Court commercial division, which we did. But the High Court said, no, we have no jurisdiction. This matter must go to arbitration in Singapore. So you can see the inconvenience. And my clients were unable even to raise AFS to go to Singapore. So that's, that's what happens when you don't have a, an international arbitration center uh, locally or regionally. It's a long time ago. Let me say at this point that uh, as government, we feel that we have fulfilled our core responsibility under the Memorandum of Understanding that we signed with the Malawi Law Society, the Arbitration Foundation of Southern Africa on 15 August 2022. We have set the full legislative framework for international arbitration in Malawi. We have already given statutory authority for the center to use the name Malawi. Uh, in its name, in Malawi, the law says that Malawi is a protected name and so you don't, you don't use it in your name unless you have had approval from government, which government has approved in this case, so Malawi can be used in the name of the, of the center. We have left it to the Malawi Chamber of Commerce, the Malawi Law Society, and the general business community to kickstart the administration of the center, but we will remain supportive of the center 
needs and any other support they may need from government. But as the Supreme Court has noted, government will not in, inter, intervene in, or interfere, but it will only definitely facilitate and provide the right environment. Let me also take this opportunity to thank um, Mr. Michael uh, Cooper, SC, um, the chairman of the of AFSA, and Mr. Uh, Patrick Mpaka, the chairman of the Malawi Society, and Mr. Des Williams, the chairman of AFSA Static Division, together with all their teams for their relentless effort to see to the establishment of the Malawi Arbitration Center. In conclusion, the government of Malawi, uh, in concert with the Malawi Society and AFSA, is dedicated to fostering a conducive environment for international arbitration. Our collective efforts also in aim in to position Malawi as a, an attractive and a premier destination for arbitration in the Central region and beyond. We invite the international community, investors, and legal practitioners to leverage the Malawi International Arbitration Center for resolving commercial and investment disputes, assured of our commitment to impartiality, efficiency, and excellence. Thank you for your uh, attention, and uh, we look forward to welcoming you to Malawi, the warm heart of Africa, where justice and development go hand in, go hand, in hand, and where we believe in not just work, 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 but we believe when you come, you can also enjoy attractive tourist sites and enjoy the friendliness of the people of Malawi that Malawi is known for. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, when, when, Honorable Minister, I will, I will confirm that Mike Cooper, myself, Susan Mutangadura, and Stanley went to Malawi for the inaugural conference. And uh, the, the, when you say unwavering support for arbitration, we lived it because the decisions have been made like we don't usually get them made by governments. The support was, was, was excellent. And if I would say anything to any other country in the SADC, when it comes to adopting uh, arbitration legislation and moving things forward, I would say, uh, be like Malawi. The, the, <laughs> the only thing, Honorable Minister, is that Patrick is to blame. We did come to Malawi. We worked, worked, worked. But if we had spoken to you, we would have known that there was more than just the work to do. <laughs> Please uh, permit me to invite uh, Honorable Nobet Mazungunye from Zimbabwe. Thank you. Uh, first and foremost, let me acknowledge the presence of the chairman of the AFSA, uh, Mr. Michael Cooper. We acknowledge your presence. And all, we also acknowledge the presence of the ministers and deputy ministers here present. We acknowledge your presence and also esteemed guests. Uh, let me start by acknowledging and also appreciating the work which has been done by the organizers of this event. We appreciate as this promotes unity amongst the SADC countries. And also, I will also take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, 
the work also being done by our president of Zimbabwe, President Emerson Dabutzomunangagwa, who is also a legal practitioner by profession, and also his com uh, commitment in advancing the Zimbabwe's arbitration system. And we appreciate him on that, and also for supporting all efforts being done by the Law Society and all other relevant stakeholders in the country. And as you are aware, that government or governments have a number of roles in international commercial arbitration. Governments can also choose to be party to an arbitration agreement and can therefore be involved in the arbitration process as a party. Governments can also provide resources and support to arbitration institutions and also support the use of arbitration through various means. And also, government can also enact laws and regulations that govern international arbitration and can also ratify international treaties and conventions on arbitration. And as the government of Zimbabwe, the government of Zimbabwe supports institutions of international arbitration, which is clearly seen by sending a delegation to support this event. Further, the government of Zimbabwe acceded to the Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards, that is the New York Convention on 29 September 1994. After ratifying the New York Convention, the government of Zimbabwe domesticated it through enacting the Zimbabwe Arbitration Act, Chapter 7.15 which governs arbitration in Zimbabwe and largely mirrors the unicitral modern law of international commercial arbitration, that is the modern law. Furthermore, Chapter 8 of the Zimbabwe Arbitration Act replicates Article 35 and 36 of the model law and provide for the recognition and the enforcement of foreign arbitral awards. Under Article 35, the Zimbabwean High Court recognizes and upon a written application enforce a foreign arbitral award unless the provision of the Article 36, that is grounds for refusing recognition and enforcement are engaged. It is thus commendable that the laws of Zimbabwe recognize arbitral awards regardless of the country from which they originate. This clause is very comforting for all proponents of arbitration as a form of alternative dispute resolution. All in all, it is important to note that acceptance by Zimbabwe to allow the registration of foreign awards is an important step and contributes positively to the embracing of arbitration in the settlement of disputes. The government's perspective on the role of lawyers in international commercial arbitration and also the government sees lawyers as a key part of the arbitration process since they help to ensure that the process is fair and just for all parties involved. And also, lawyers also help to facilitate communication between parties and provide advice and guidance on the legal and practical aspects. And that is the position with regards to the situation in the country of Zimbabwe. And Zimbabwe as a country has got three arbitration centers. And I understand that we are also here to learn uh, as we converge here at this event. As I have already been impressed by the AFSA and the work which uh, has been done so far. And I hope as a country, we have something similar or also take notes and before forge ahead as we go forward. And also under the Second Republic of the country of Zimbabwe, which is under the stewardship of Comrade Idim Nangagwa, our ministry has been tasked to ensure that the conventions we are party to must be realized 
and those that must be domesticated must be domesticated. And I'm happy that we have domesticated the Industrial Modern Law through Arbitration Act, as I have alluded on earlier on. And also, I'm also pleased by the comments which have been made by the chairperson of the AFSA, which, indicates, which indicated that as a block, as the Sadak, uh, we are very powerful. And I'm pleased by those sentiments as indeed our president in Zimbabwe has also proposed and also in a, in a mantra to that effect, which he says in Shona, Nikainova kwa nevi nevayo, o ilizwe la kiwa ngabadisi balo. And what that mantra means, it just means that the country is built by its own people. And therefore, as Sadak, the commercial or arbitration development in the region can also be strengthened by the SADAC members. So we appreciate also that despite improving the, and also allowing, improving the commercial arbitration uh, in, in, in the region, it also helps as the governments of SADAC to be united to forge a relationship together. And on that note, uh, I want to appreciate again the efforts which has been done by the, by the AFSA and the organizers of this event. And as, on that note, I will end here. I will not we will hope and expect that the alliance and the, uh, will bring so much changes uh, and as envisaged by the country. And we accept and we also agree and appreciate the invitation to be here. I thank you. Honorable Minister, you, you may have heard that uh, the MOU that led up to the charter today was signed in Big Falls. So it started in Zimbabwe. So you really need to see this to the end. When the documents are brought to your office, just sign. <laughs> please, please permit me to invite uh, Honorable John Jeffrey, who needs no introduction, please. Uh, thanks very much, Program Director. I've already spoken, so I will be quite brief. Uh, from the South African government side, we passed the International Arbitration Act um, in 2017. Uh, so that's the legal, the legal framework. Uh, obviously, it's not just a law, it's how it's implemented. Um, but that and in implementing it, we need to accept that various factors play a role uh, in whether we can establish ourselves as trusted and respected players in the field of arbitration. And besides issues relating to formal legal infrastructure, aspects such as the neutrality and impartiality of the legal system, our national arbitration law, which uh, needs to be seriously needs to be updated. Uh, and our track record for enforcing agreements to arbitrate and arbitral awards. It's equally too imp important to ensure that arbitration keeps up with the times and is cost effective and delivers a speedy resolution of, of disputes. So we um, passed the law. Um, uh, it's then up to different role players to make use of it and we're very pleased uh, to see that the, wor the work that has been done by AFSA and by KJAC in uh, using, using that law. Uh, and really our, go our job as government is to continue with the uh, legislative and policy formulation aspects. Uh, I, I'm not sure if everybody is aware that the uh, International Arbitration Act has been amended. Uh, the amendment took effect last week, uh, but don't worry. Uh, it was in the Judicial Matters Amendment uh, Act that, the, that uh, came into effect last week, uh, which amends a number of acts. The amendment to the South African Arbitration, International Arbitration Act, was a very small typographical uh, change, a I becoming a one. Uh, so it's not going to affect uh, anything, uh, but it, it is showing that we are, we are updating. Um, 
We're pleased with the, uh, I mean, international arbitration in Southern Africa depends on uh, a network of institutions committed to excellence in the provision of best process for private dispute resolution at domestic and regional levels. And we're pleased with the development of the charter um, in the SADC region. I just want to close with, um, I had hoped that um, Michael Cooper wasn't going to give them and he didn't. Um, I hope my facts are right, but we're seeing a rapid growth, a rate of growth in arbitrations in the region, uh, or in South Africa particularly. Since the enactment of the International Arbitration Act in 2017, international arbitrations have been registered and processed at AFSA from all over the world, and AFSA now registers on average two international matters per month. Uh, AFSA also remains deeply involved in the CAJAC project with China and the discussions for the creation of a BRICS arbitral mechanism. I'm told that AFSA processes some 400 domestic matters a year. And then another aspect of AFSA which I want to uh, speak about and uh, I really acknowledge is that AFSA also trains up to 100 young practitioners in arbitration and mediation each year and has established a young AFSA division to encourage young practitioners to become involved in alternative dispute resolution. Uh, so um, on behalf of the South African government, uh, we're here uh, to give support as much as we can to, to international arbitration and alternative dispute resolution. Thank you. The, the minister makes the right noises. He says the right things and we are hopeful that this alliance will prosper, especially that uh, South Africa is the host for the alliance and we are grateful for your cooperation. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we come to the end of this session and uh, I'll ask uh, uh, the speakers to... Uh, Mr. Menet and Mr. Cooper, you can remain but uh, the, the Honourable Ministers can take their place uh, out there. And uh, I will ask, please, um, thank you so much. I will now ask, I will now ask uh, Mr. Des Williams, the Chairman for the AFSA Division, to come up together with Mr. Patrick Lane the chairman of AFSA International, to step up, please. We will go very quickly to the next stage, which is part two of this plenary, the adoption and the signing of the charter. I will call out the names of the law society heads from the various countries who will come up um, in alphabetical order. And uh, I will call you up. We are constrained with time because the session uh, is limited in time and I will gracefully ask the, the law society heads that uh, you can make, I'll allow you to make a few remarks. Three minutes. Uh, it is so difficult to ask lawyers to f speak for three minutes, but uh, I, I was telling the president for the Law Society of Zimbabwe that I was empowered by my chair that if anyone speaks for more than three minutes, I can execute a rugby tackle here. I am going to call upon the president of the Law Society of Angola, Mr. Jose Luis Domingos, to please come up. Um, are you going to say something? If you don't have anything to say, it will be okay. You can come up and sign. <laughs> I, I, I am saving time here, but please say a word. 
ladies and gentlemen, a sir, you'll speak in Portuguese. É. E, para não cometer o erro de esquecer-me de alguém, considerem-se todos saudades ou cumprimentados. E, Angola, a ordem de advogados que represento, está aqui porque acredita seriamente que a África continua em busca da sua afirmação como continente e, consequentemente, de seus países. E é com este objetivo que existem as uniões regionais, de forma a proporcionar aos habitantes dos seus países um bem-estar que permita viver com a dignidade que é de se esperar para qualquer ser humano. Os nossos países ainda enfrentam sérios problemas naquilo que tem a ver com proporcionar esta vida digna que todos merecemos. Acreditamos firmemente que a União Regional é o caminho para edificarmos as nações que precisamos. E isto só será possível se tivermos instituições fortes, se a nível dos países, ou 16 países que integram a região da SADEC, se consiga encontrar um denominador comum naquilo que é fundamental para que a mesma atinja os seus objetivos. É verdade que se olharmos para os nossos países, eu não acredito que, que a nível do, dos outros esteja diferente, porque terei como partida a nossa realidade, a eficiência dos tribunais é ainda um grande problema. Temos justiça bastante congestionada, que dificulta a implementação de um ambiente de negócio que atraia o investimento ou facilite a integração Económica. Como vencermos esta realidade? Pensamos, indiscutivelmente, que a implementação de um centro internacional de arbitragem é fundamental para que a justiça ou a solução dos conflitos que surjam no âmbito da integração económica tenham a solução ao tempo que a economia exige. Não existirá certamente, união regional forte que incentive o desenvolvimento dos países da região se não existir uma justiça que esteja ao nível da expectativa dos investidores. Acreditamos seriamente que a adesão a esta aliança é fundamental principalmente para permitir que qualquer cidadão que invista na região tenha certeza que encontrará uma justiça ao nível dos litígios que surgirem. Segurança jurídica é fundamental para concretizar o, o objetivo da região e certamente isto contribuirá para que a arbitragem em Angola também atinja um nível desejável. Thank you, Mr. I'm going to call upon uh, Mr. Osego Garebaman Mono from Botswana, please. If you have something to say, very, very briefly. <laughs> and uh, I'm standing right next to you. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to be rugby tackled. <laughs> I've seen what they do in rugby. Um, I'm very honored to be here uh, representing uh, Botswana, in particular the Law Society of Botswana, and I want to say that we will give all our support uh, to the establishment of uh, this um, arbitration center in the region. Now, alternative dispute resolution may seem like mode de jour, but these mechanisms have been with us since time immemorial. The ancient Bushmen are said to have resolved their disputes by talking and talking and talking some more. 
possibly more than three minutes. While the great Roman lawyer Cicero noted that a person going to court expects to win or lose, whilst a person going to arbitration expects not to get everything, but not lose everything either. In modern times, we know that disputes are a byproduct of doing business, and every business person wants to be provided with a solution to their disputes. For that solution to be relevant, it must be provided within the shortest amount of time practicable, and this is one of the objectives of the AFSA Alliance. The AFSA Alliance is geared towards elevating arbitration as an alternative dispute resolution within SADC countries, because arbitration is a lifeblood for commerce. Through the institutions that will be created within the region and within the SADC jurisdictions, the expectation is that the international investor who wants matters decided quickly, fairly, and cost-effectively will be inclined to have their dispute resolved locally and not abroad. The business person within SADC who wants to operate across borders will have a supportive institution that allows them to resolve their dispute privately. Our countries are at different stages of implementation. However, we expect equal support to be extended to each member state in order that we realize the purpose of the alliance, especially the establishment of the secretariat. Botswana expects further that there be gender parity in the establishment of the panel of arbitrators and encourages SADC countries to elect people who are of a high standard and deep expertise to elevate the alliance which will be competing internationally. The era of alternative dispute resolution, especially arbitration, has truly come of age. Today's theme is the famous quote from Pliny the Elder, that from Africa there is always something new. Indeed, Africa's time to bring something new has arrived. Here is to the promotion of international commercial arbitration, predictable frameworks, and advocacy for good laws. I thank you. Thank you. The next uh, signatory was supposed to be the president of the Law Society of Eswatini. Uh, I must mention that Eswatini endorses the charter. The president was unable to travel, and uh, we'll get that signature later on. Uh, this applies so to Tanganyika, who have also endorsed the charter, but were not able to be present today. And uh, the signatures will be appended to the charter at a later stage. I will now call upon the president of the Law Society of Lesotho, Mr. Lintletuke, please to come. Just on a lighter note, I cannot believe no one is talking about that case we saw here. <laughs> Perhaps I'll have to move an expert application before Justice Dikham Moseneke for the extension of that case to all of us. <laughs> uh, Forty years ago, Lesotho enacted uh, the Arbitration Act of 1980, which was our initial recognition and commitment to arbitration as an alternative dispute resolution mechanism. Now, as the representative of the Law Society of Lesotho, I must say navigating the landscape of international arbitration can sometimes feel like finding your way through Lesotho's 
winding mountain trails. It is both challenging but equally rewarding. We are a landlocked country entirely surrounded by South Africa, but we recognize the strategic importance of fostering regional collaboration, especially in the realm of uh, dispute resolution. And despite our landlocked status, we stand poised to contribute meaningfully to the objectives outlined in the charter that we are just about to sign. We have several expectations. We seek to harness the collaborative potential of this alliance to bolster our capacity for international arbitration. And we envision this endeavor as a beacon of hope, guiding us towards equitable resolution mechanisms that support economic development and stability in our region. The Law Society of Lesotho has a role, and we stand ready to bridge the gap between Lesotho's unique geography and the broader international arbitration community. We see ourselves as the pioneering guide guidelines, leading the charge to ensure that Lesotho's voice is heard and our interests are represented on the global stage. And I must emphasize that despite being entirely landlocked by South Africa, Lesotho is committed to forging independent pathways towards dispute resolution excellence. We recognize the power of unity and diversity and eagerly anticipate the opportunity to collaborate with our regional and international counterparts. And in conclusion, let it be known that Lesotho may be small in size, but our aspirations are as grand as the towering peaks of our beloved mountains. With a hearty dose of determination, we embark on this journey with optimism, knowing that together we can reach new heights in the realm of international dispute resolution. Thank you. I will now call upon the president of the Malawi Law Society, Mr. Patrick Gray Mpaka. Uh, Mr. Mpaka is like a brother to me. And uh, since I'm lost for time, I hope he, the brother will give me some minutes here and, <laughs> and not speak for too long. No, you, Please go ahead. Very much, Foreman. You can rest assured. You see, the advantage that I have is that uh, I managed to come with the, my Minister of Justice and he has said everything that we needed to yes. say from Malawi. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. <laughs> what I can do is just to invite you distinguished delegates to read the Minister's remarks, but also read this little book, booklet that we have prepared from Malawi it's available on the SADC stand, but I also request the SADC Secretariat that it must be circulated electronically to, so that you can see wh how, where we are with the project in Malawi. And then we are requesting, we are ready to sign the, the, the AFSA, and we are requesting that we work together to make our region robust in international arbitration. Thank you very much. I told you he was my brother. <laughs> Maybe I should be calling everybody my brother. I will call upon the president of OMA, Mr. Carlos Martins.
morning. Uh, I'm not Carlos Martins. I'm representing him. Uh, my name is Miguel. Um, I would like to bring back some of the sayings that early in this morning were brought in this room. Uh, in the first anthem, we heard that together we must stand. And we also heard, I guess from Zimbabwe, that a, a country is built by its own people. But what I want to say from another saying is that, uh, it's an African saying, is that if you want to go fast, you go by yourself. But if you want to go further, you go with other people. So I believe that this initiative means that we as uh, the region embracing a project that can make this international arbitration a great platform for the region. Mozambique has uh, domesticated some of uh, arbitration rules. We do have a local arbitration law and in our investment law, we do have some provisions allowing to uh, the resolution of the disputes can be made through the international arbitration, but we do not have uh, international arbitration law. We are working so far in this matter, but we really are very eager to see what this new platform can bring for this region. Thank you. The next signatory will be the president of the Namibia Law Society, Mr. Clive Kavendeji, please. Should I reveal that we are brothers? <laughs> yes, uh, program director, you did some violence to my surname. <laughs> Yes. I'm sorry, please. Uh, Frank, Director, I will not disappoint you. I will uh, uh, use uh, one or two minutes. Uh, I stand by the protocol already established. Uh, it is my distinct honor and privilege to have brought a, deleg a delegation from Namibia to this very important gathering representing the Law Society of Namibia. My name is Clive Kavenji. Uh, I'm the acting president of the Law Society of Namibia. May the menace reflect as such. The Law Society of Namibia is a member of SADC Law and is fully affiliated to SADC Law resolutions to institutionalize commercial arbitration in Southern Africa. We are committed to facilitating the convergence of key players in international commercial arbitration to fully develop domestic capital to provide professional services in arbitration. It is our sincere belief and hope that the Alliance Charter that will be signed today will pave the way for a regional framework that will assist in dispute resolution in commercial matters. Further, the Alliance Charter, Charter ought to and will strengthen economic growth and increase cross-border trade in our region. As Namibia, we join hands and welcome the initiative and, in, and endorse the Alliance Charter and recognize, recognize its importance as a tool to unlock the potential of the SADC region to overcome or to become a significant destination for investment and efficient dispute resolutions. We look forward to, in the near future, establish a fully-fledged domestic center modeled on the standards and services of AFSA. Finally, finally, we congr congratulate the region on the steps taken towards the establishment of such an important framework. Thank you, my brother. <laughs> and 
it will be there. I would like to call upon, I don't know if it's the President of Chair of the Legal Practice Council of South Africa, uh, Janine Maybach, please. Good morning, everybody. At the risk of being tackled by a gentleman in public, I would like to rely on the protocol already observed. Um, I'm delighted to stand on the platform today as the chairperson of the Legal Practice Council. Some persons present may not be aware that the Legal Practice Council of South Africa is a national entity unlike any other regulatory body in the legal profession in that the Legal Practice Council is the singular national statutory regulatory body established in terms of the Legal Practice Act. The first elected council took office just over five and a half years ago, and the National Legal Practice Council, along with its nine provincial councils, regulates the fees and exercises jurisdictions over all practitioners, those are attorneys and advocates. The Legal Practice Council, differently to which most law societies, has its mandate to protect the interest of the public, to regulate the ethical conduct, and importantly I'd like to mention is to stress, uh, to set the norms and standards for the legal profession. In a former position I held as a president of the Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Alternative dispute resolution has always been paramount, and I was honoured a few good a few years back to have been invited abroad to an international arbitration centre, who shall remain nameless, as the leader of organised business. The centre was advocating for the use of arbitration to organise business across the globe. At the time of the visit, I had wondered why we had not duplicated or for that matter, bettered what they were doing in the African space. It is therefore particularly pleasing to see that the Alliance Charter provides for the harmonization and standardization of arbitration practice in the SADC countries, thereby constituting, constituting the Southern Africa as a destination of choice for the parties investing, transacting, and doing business in, SADC, in the SADC region, solidifying a secure national and international commercial arbitration arena. I wish to commend all the parties who have participated in bringing us to this point of being able to endorse the Charter. I see the heading of this plenary reads, APSA SADC Alliance, a regional game changer. I would like to be presumptuous to take it further than that states that this charter is a paradigm shift, not only for the SADC region, for the entire legal profession, and importantly, for the fact that the charter coagulates a secure, credible platform for national and international business community and legal community to transact within. The implications here of, on our respective economies and our profession is exceptionally far-reaching and positive. The Legal Practice Council is most desirable of playing a cooperative and a collaborative role within the parameters of the Alliance Charter. I therefore gives me great pleasure to formally endorse the EFSA SADC Alliance Charter on behalf of the Legal Practice Council of South Africa. I thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stanley, I am correct that uh, the president of the Tanganyika Law Society is not here. They endorse the charter and we will get it signed off at a later stage. At this point, uh, I am going to call upon Mr. James Banda on behalf of the Law Association of Zambia. The president of the Law Association of Zambia wouldn't be here and uh, he has delegated 
uh, to Mr. James Banda for. Oh, and Mr. James Banda is my brother. <laughs> <laughs> Justice Moseneke, um, a few years ago, I think two years ago, I mentioned that each time we meet, I keep forgetting to bring uh, a copy of your memoir. I've remembered to bring it today for your signature, so I'll see you after this. <laughs> Uh, colleagues, uh, my written instructions from the President of the Law Association of Zambia is to confirm that Zambia fully endorses and uh, will sign the charter uh, today as a representative of the President of the Law Association, I will sign. I was also instructed to mention one thing which is significant in Zambia which we witnessed last week. And since the ministers were talking about their presidents, I might as well talk about our Republican president as well, His Excellency President Hakainde Chilema, who graced the occasion of the launch of the Lusaka International Arbitration Center last Friday. So that's fully operational. <laughs> and has the full support of all the professional bodies in Zambia the governments, uh, many other stakeholders, and all the players in the economy of Zambia. But the question is, in all that scheme of things, what does that mean to you, uh, colleagues? And what does that, the signing of this charter mean in, in that scheme? Firstly, it means we have access to the panels uh, which have already been established by AFSA. Secondly, colleagues, it's an opportunity for all of you to be part of what is happening in Zambia and in the region. So we will call upon you. We have uh, brochures which have been brought by my colleagues. We do have a desk, uh, a, a, a desk somewhere in the exhibition center where all the information related to the Lusaka International Arbitration Center has been provided. So, Please reach out to us. This is an opportunity which we can't miss. All the issues which have been discussed today about commercial arbitrations being handled in the region must come to a reality. We started discussing this issue 10 years ago when I was serving as president of the Sadiq Lawyers Association. And it is very, very gratifying to see this happening that we are signing this charter. So let us give it our full support and participate fully. Uh, thank you very much. Please take a seat. Uh, there you go. I will call upon the president of the Law Society of Zoom. Zimbabwe, Rumbizai Matambo, please. As a mother to boys only, I've watched enough rugby matches to understand the threat that was delivered to me earlier this morning. <laughs> but Paul, man, be careful. <laughs> Our experience in Zimbabwe um, is that arbitration has steadily increased as a preference for, up for di dispute resolution. Rather than sticking to the long, winding proce process of litigation, you find commercial disputes are increasingly being are resolved by way of arbitration. And as a regulatory body of a profession, my office finds itself inundated with requests to appoint arbitrators. I think I am correct in saying almost on a weekly basis, we are getting requests for, for appointment of arbitrators. So for us, it, this is a very important step um, towards integrating our systems, modernizing our laws, training our members, and ensuring that we also participate 
uh, as, an, as an arbitral center in the southern region. A number of our practitioners are also specializing in the area. Looking around the room, I see a lot of faces from back home. And some of our members are already on the AFSA panel. And so for us, this is long overdue. As you heard, uh, this started in Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe, and our, our Deputy Minister has committed to finishing what we started. We're therefore looking forward to, and our expectations after signing this charter, are that we will then put in place an administrative framework with proper rules and procedures and resources to deal with a professional arbitration center. We have the expertise, we have the baseline legislation, as you heard before, and the political will, as you see, we have come with our deputy minister today. We have already been collaborating with AFSA at many levels. Last year at our flagship event, our summer school, we hosted Stanley and his delegation from AFSA, where we had a long and uh, fruitful deliberation and discussion where our members were introduced to all the issues surrounding um, APSA. We therefore, we have also collaborated with, with SADAC LA um, on training and sensitizing our members on their value and availability of participating in APSA events. We therefore look, look forward to the strategi strategizing and harmonization of dispute resolution in, in the Southern African region. And we look forward to cooperating following the signing of this charter with AFSA and other members of the region. And more particularly and importantly for us, we look forward to Harare becoming a seat for the resolution of not only domestic, regional, but international disputes. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hereby confirm that the Law Society of Zimbabwe and Zimbabwe as well acknowledges and endorses this charter, and I'm happy and privileged to be signing on behalf of my society. Thank you. The last three signatories to the Charter have either spoken before or are intended to speak, so I will not call them up to the podium, but call them directly to speak. I will start with Mr. Michael Cooper, SC, the Chair of APSA, to please sign the Charter. Mr. Des Williams, the chairman of the AFSA SAD division. <laughs> Mr. Flavio Menete, the president of Sadiq Club. And finally, Mr. Patrick Lane, SC, the chairman of SAFSA, AFSA International. Um, save for 
a couple of countries whose representatives have endorsed this AFSA Sadiq Alliance Charter is duly endorsed and signed. And can we give ourselves a big hand? We are going to go to the final segment of this plenary. And uh, I will call uh, Mr. Stanley Nyamanhindi to come up to the podium. And I will also call Professor Liz Bosman to please come to the podium. Our next speakers will talk to the issue of securing the charter objectives. It is one thing to get to where we are, but where do we go from here? Allow me to please call upon Mr. Des Williams to make some quick remarks about how we will secure the objectives of the charter that we have signed. Thank you, Paulman. I'm, uh, I'm feeling a bit of time pressure here, and uh, I'll uh, move along as quickly as I can. Um, it was six years ago at the annual SADC Lawyers Association meeting in Botswana that I first met Stanley uh, behind me here. Um, and we uh, discussed our ideas for the development of a shared arbitration framework and the promotion of international arbitration within the SADC region. Despite the unwelcome intervention of, uh, of COVID, the past six years have been very eventful on that front. The presence of, high level de of very high-level delegations here this morning um, and the signature of the Charter uh, mark an important development for us all. We have established a network committed to collaboration in the achievement of the objectives outlined in the Charter document, which you have all seen. Much has already been done, but the challenge which we now face lies in securing those objectives. So allow me a few minutes uh, to tell you very briefly what has been done and to see how the Charter's objectives will be achieved. Uh, I have limited time and so I'm going to uh, deal only with three or four uh, major objectives and I'll leave it to Stanley to fill in uh, the gaps of which there will undoubt undoubtedly be many. The first objective stated in the Charter is that the Alliance should, and I quote, become a leading network of institutions committed to excellence in providing fair and reliable systems to resolve disputes uh, privately, uh, to build panels of mediators, conciliators and arbitrators, and to train and develop arbitrators and mediators in southern Africa and beyond. As will already be evident to most of you here this morning, uh, the key achievement of the Charter is the commitment of the Alliance members to building up a fully-fledged building up fully-fledged arbitration centres with the capacity to administer arbitration at both a regional and domestic level. Um, it is important for us to acknowledge that in most SADC countries, lawyers will be more familiar with arbitration at a domestic rather than an international level or regional level. We expect, therefore, that in most SADC countries, mm -hmm. the arbitration centres will initially focus on domestic arbitration. If the practice of domestic arbitration meets the required standards, local members in all member states will gain the experience required for the step up to regional and international arbitration. And this is something that uh, Pat Lane will tell us more about um, a little later. And so, domestic arbitration will, as we see it, be the lifeblood of the growing body. 
In order to promote this growth, AFSA will continue providing training for SADC panel arbitrators and for technical support and for technical support staff. Panelists will continue to be evaluated and rated with potential to rise from domestic and regional panels, and in that way, the pool of experienced arbitrators will continue to grow. At the core of this commitment that you see here today is a commitment to excellence and to the promotion of the uniformity of internationally recognized standards in the administration of arbitration within the region. The key strategies for promoting standardization and uniformity include regular strategic meetings, annual work sessions, and an annual regional symposium designed to achieve these objectives. The Alliance already has, assigned, has already signed an MOU with the government of Malawi, and today we witness the presence of ministers of justice and attorneys general from South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Lesotho. Uh, the launch of the regional panel in 2021 was marked by the participation of governments of Namibia and Zambia, and all indications are that the participation and involvement in these initiatives will continue to grow, particularly after this conference. An important strategy for the promotion of uniformly high standards is that the Alliance uh, will continue to play a key role in arbitration, law, and reform. Um, the AFSA SADC division recently assisted in the development of a modern international arbitration act in Malawi, which you have heard about this morning. Um, we congratulate the Honourable Minister on taking this um, important step. Botswana and Lesotho are currently reviewing their arbitration law, and AFSA remains willing and able to assist at whatever level we can. There are two, require, two key requirements for any country seeking to play a role in, on the international arbitration stage. Firstly, modern international arbitration legislation, and secondly, the New York Convention. In the Southern African context, modern international arbitration legislation will use, usually be based on the UNCTRAL model law, usually, but not always. Um, and as for the New York Convention, all that is required is ratification and accession. Most, but not all, SADC countries meet these requirements. One of the Alliance's objectives must be to encourage member countries to meet both requirements, without which they will be at a major disadvantage in the world of international arbitration. Another very important um, area is the need for court support for arbitration. In the past year, courts from both Malawi and Lesotho have, refu have referred to the importance of the Alliance and referred cases to the Alliance in matters where parties had agreed to arbitration. Increasingly, the courts recognize the importance uh, of party autonomy, that key principle of party autonomy in arbitration. It is important that the Alliance should do whatever it can to promote that important principle. One of the features of the development of international arbitration in South Africa has been the strong support of the courts and the recognition of the importance of the principle of party autonomy um, and of restricting court interference uh, in arbitration process and awards. It is encouraging to see that a similar approach is being adopted and followed by most courts in other ASADIC countries. The Alliance will also be considering um, further expansion against the background of the undoubted need for cooperation and bridge building within SADC and other African states. The need for uniformity and harmonization of, of arbitration practice is not limited to SADC countries. And for example, similar initiatives are underway uh, in East Africa. This is not a short-term objective, but in the longer term, it will be important to consider collaboration with other countries and organizations which share our vision. 
So as I indicated at the start, I'm, I'm mindful of time constraints, and as I'm to be followed by three speakers uh, uh, who will undoubtedly um, have, uh, be able to add to what I've said. But before I sit down, let me thank you all once again for supporting this conference and uh, our commitment to the development of arbitration in the SADC region. We have here a real opportunity to provide the building blocks to promote the Southern African region as a regional arbitration center, which not only meets, but exceeds international standards. That objective will be achieved. Thank you. Thank you. I now call upon the chairman of AFSA International, Mr. Patrick Lane. Oh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I think we've witnessed a momentous occasion today which has the potential of changing the face of dispute resolution in Southern Africa. And I congratulate all those who have joined the Charter in creating something which now has to be implemented. But of course, like all things in life, it is the implementation that matters. What I'm going to talk about is how do we implement it from the international point of view. You will have seen in the Charter itself the constant reference within the Charter to the best process for private dispute resolution. International um, region levels and international levels, you will see the use of the word excellence, uh, a commitment uh, under one of the first objectives, 3.1, is a commitment to excellence. Um, 3.2, become a regional and international leader to foster domestic and ratification of international standards. So a thread which runs through this entire charter is meeting international standards. Now, just on a bit of background, after the promulgation of the 2000 International Act, um, AFSA International, the, the division of AFSA, set about writing a cutting-edge set of rules. At the same time, it created for the first time in Southern Africa a court of arbitration to meet the international standards which would be applied um, elsewhere. Now, it then set about establishing panels of arbitrators from international sources. So, we have panelists sitting in on our panel of arbitrators which come from Australia, they come from Vietnam, they come from Europe, they come from America, they come from South America, they come from Africa. We have a court which is also multinational in terms of its existence and it does the administrative elements. Um, but let me not say, diminish for a moment, the significance of the Secretary General of AFSA. Svetlana um, has helped uh, and will continue to help and you will hear her later in her presentations as the manner in which she is there to help the, um, achieve the objectives of the International Division of AFSA. But why then do I talk about the international about excellence? We as an association and, and now as a charter must believe that it is only excellence, it is the excellence which we impart in our awards, in the manner in which we administer the arbitrations, that will in fact give us the foothold that we see and is available to us. The we lack, in terms of Southern Africa, members on our panel of arbitrators, and we need you. We need 
the people who are sitting here, we need you to qualify to be on our panels. But we have set fairly high standards to make certain that one achieves the excellence that is required by the international community, that we meet the criteria of the New York Convention, and that our awards are respected. And just for example, we have had, um, I think our awards amount of, uh, in the two years or three years since COVID, we have had 146 appointments and we haven't had one successful challenge of a single award. Now that is important because that is the reputation ultimately which we wish to carry forward to the rest of the world and to Southern Africa itself. And so I'm here to encourage all of you to move, and I know sometimes it is, uh, people ask, well, how do I do that? You practice domestic arbitration, you practice a regional arbitration, and you reach a level of competence and, um, comf and, uh, and confidence that you are then in a position to apply to international for admission to the panel of international arbitrators. Um, the test is very similar to the test which um, Singapore applies. Uh, for example, it would require um, you to, um, uh, to submit to awards properly redacted and have a sufficient CV and background experience to meet the, the panel. But let me say this, we encourage you all because we need you. It is something we need to grow and is something at this point in time is lacking in the Southern African context. The other, we, last year, um, I think my, my chambers in London, uh, 39 Essex, held a workshop. We encourage you to attend those workshops because that is an accelerated way of getting to understand the, the forms and nature and what the requirements are of international arbitration. We are planning to have another workshop this year um, on the writing of awards. Um, and again, we encourage you to come to those workshops because that again brings you into uh, our space and I say again, and I sound like a stuck record, we need you. I'm going to cut it short. I know that our time is short. Um, but welcome to the international community. And we look forward to seeing all of you on our panels in time to come. Thank you so much. I now call upon Mr. Stanley Nyamanhindi, the CEO of the AFSA SADC division. Thank you very much, Paulman. <clears throat> if the other speakers uh, were your brothers, uh, due to pressure of time, I feel like I'm your son. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's quite amazing that it's been six years when I hear Des speaking to the first time that we met and spoke as an idea about a regional seat for international commercial arbitration in Southern Africa. But I think more importantly, it's amazing to me that uh, we came back to South Africa. We were in Botswana at that time. We had another meeting in his office at uh, Wexman's. And uh, after some time, we decided to take the conversation across you know, town to, to Mike's office. And perhaps as they say, it ought to be the rest is history, but I don't think it's history. I think we should dare ourselves to say it's history in the making because of what we've witnessed today. And so one of the most important things to realize, I just want to be very brave, is that we need different components in order to paint the canvas that we have presented right behind us. I think you saw the countries and the Southern African continent turning blue not, not anything coincidental, because blue is my favorite color. 
Uh, I just work for uh, AFSA and SADC lawyers, and they also happen to have uh, blue as their colors. But this, this canvas, in order to paint it, working in a regional space requires courageous and consistent efforts to come up with successful outcomes. If we meet again next year or the year after, we have to be able to demonstrate that collaboration, and this is how we can have the existence of the regional space. Now, it's a bit exasperating working in the regional space because you say to someone, oh, well, I'm staying, that's fine. Uh, where are you from? I'm, I'm from the region. Region as SADC. And they look at you with a blank, blank face. It's, it's a bit different from saying, well, I'm, I'm in Joburg, I'm in London. Somebody can associate you with some sort of geographical space. So if we don't have these synergies, we're not able to tap into the capital that we have got dormant, lying dormant amongst us in the Southern African region. And I do want to believe that the cooperation and the collaboration we're inviting is the means through which we can tap into that capital. So one of the important things about this charter, if you look at uh, 8.4, uh, that clause speaks to the fact that it's a private initiative that is recognized by our state actors in SADC. And we really want to reiterate the support of the ministries of justice, the attorneys general. They've been very, very, very supportive. This is an important aspect because it underlines the independence and the impartiality that is required of an arbitration mechanism or a dispute resolution mechanism. And this alliance creates an opportunity for shared strategies across Southern Africa. And in that respect, we look forward to a shared alliance framework of governance. I do want to believe that the roadmap that we came up with when we started this journey sets us to come up with an annual meeting that is in the SADC region. And we hope to invite all of you to this. Uh, when it all started, we said we we're going to go to Seychelles. So it was called the roadmap to Seychelles. I do believe that we, we will meet there um, in the very near future. And we are already extending this invite. But that means that we now have that framework, which we collaborate to monitor the implementation and work together in the SADC region. And um, may I say that SADC, as a regional economic community, is a key player to recognize and cooperate with. Uh, I do believe the ministers of justice are here, but they've got a committee, which is uh, the Committee of Ministers of Justice and Attorneys General. Perhaps when you go back, uh, ministers, honorable ministers, speak to the rest of the ministers who have not been here so that we move with the same consistency and the same pace in the region. Uh, in the technical parlance, SADC, as a state actor in the regional economic community of Southern Africa, has got what we call the Regional Indicative Strategic Development Plan. And uh, this strategic plan speaks to different areas, infrastructure, agriculture, industrial development, and it is the blueprint through which foreign direct investment is injected by international development cooperation partners and multilateral institutions. And I do believe that closing the gap using this AFSA alliance and this structure will help us to then emerge with a stronger region where we open up new markets for the legal profession, new markets uh, for um, you know, uh, our investors, and perhaps just to also underline the fact before I uh, reach to my conclusion, that SADC in the latest research is a net um, importer of services. Now, the implication of this is that we are quite behind in um, generation of revenue in the $3 trillion GDP of the Africa continental free trade area. We are behind East Africa, you know, for instance, uh, West Africa, which are also now net um, importers uh, or should I say net exporters of services. So if we're going to turn around this situation and find SADC making more, I think the legal profession has taken the right stance. And uh, this collaboration and cooperation that we seek is one of the most important Trojan horses for liberalization of trade and legal services and uh, enhancing cross-border mobility of these legal services. But in the final analysis, let me just say that the membership to the Alliance is a clarion call for beyond borders and sectoral cooperation in creating 
a comprehensive arbitral bridge that unites the geopolitical and economic space that Africa is, indeed our region. But uh, Southern Africa, uh, at, the same of, at the same time, must lead in this harmonization. And we need to actively pursue the involvement of all the stakeholders that we have identified that were in this room in order for this dream or this ambitious statement to become a reality. And I thank you all for your time, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to mention that all the signatories to the Charter, we will be getting a group photo after the last speaker. And um, it's my great honor to call upon uh, Professor Bosman. I will not go into the introduction of who she is. I, if, if, if you are in the right room, you know who she is. And, and if, you, if you don't, then you will get a bio in the conference booklet. Professor Bosman, please. Thank you so much um, for that very kind um, introduction. Uh, good morning, distinguished guests uh, and distinguished delegates. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be here today, and thank you to ABSA for this invitation. Um, I think this is a very timely conference. Uh, now, we've heard a lot of metaphors used today already. We've heard about uh, construction, bridge building, milestones, keeping the flame burning, um, some, and some classical references. But I'm going to go with a mountaineering metaphor to start off with. Because it does seem to me that the development of a strong and established arbitral practice in this region has been tantalizingly close to climbing to the summit of our Everest or Kilimanjaro for some time. And I think that an event of this nature and an initiative of this nature has the potential to provide that last little bit of oxygen or push to get us to, to the summit. Now, the Avisa Sadak Alliance is very ambitious. Um, it aims to create a standardized and harmonized framework for administered arbitration, um, characterized by values such as openness, efficiency, sustainability, respect for human dignity, and the rule of law. Now, any one of those characteristics would be enough to inspire the builders of a new system. Um, and they indicate the mindset that is needed to achieve a successful regional framework for administered arbitrations. Southern Africa is not the first region to be thinking along these lines. Globally, uh, we've seen in recent years uh, the development of a number um, of new arbitration hubs, uh, both in emerging economies and in more established economies. So I thought it'd be interesting to reflect for really no more than 10 minutes um, on the particular benefits that emerging hubs can bring to international arbitration practice as well as some guiding principles to bear in mind. Now first, why are regional hubs so important and so special? Um, and first, I think it's useful to remind ourselves that they exist not primarily to compete with established hubs like Paris, London, Geneva, Singapore, Hong Kong, but instead they can offer um, a number of unique benefits to the jurisdiction and the region in which they're based, such as potentially an adapted cost structure um, they might include building capacity of lawyers with local knowledge who are familiar with the culture and the languages of the jurisdiction. They offer the potential to provide specialized dispute resolution mechanisms that are adapted to suit particular kinds of disputes prevalent in the region or particular ways of resolving disputes. So you can think of examples such as right here, South Africa's CCMA. Um, in India, the Construction Industry Arbitration Council. Uh, in Hong Kong, tailored rules for securities arbitration. In Singapore, uh, CX derivative trading and clearing rules. Specialized mechanisms can also include um, or support um, uh, important elements of local legal practice. Here, I, I also pulled out a few examples. Dutch arbitral practice, for instance, includes the availability of what are called standalone summary arbitral proceedings popularized by the Arbitration Institute in first instance, and later incorporated into Dutch arbitration legislation. A procedure derived from court procedure, 
uh, from court practice, uh, meeting a need for the quick and pragmatic solutions that Dutch litigation lawyers were accustomed to having within their toolkit and expected to find also in arbitration. In Sweden, think of the SCC's pioneering use of expedited procedures um, and its newest innovation, the express dispute assessment. In Hong Kong, think of the Financial Dispute Resolution Center requiring parties to first mediate before they move on to arbitration, reflecting an increased emphasis on use of ADR procedures that were an early feature of practice in that region. So new arbitral hubs can clearly offer specialized solutions that meet the expectations of local users or are responsive to issues or legal practices peculiar to your region. A celebration of the positive potential of diversity, if you will. And to establish and maintain a strong regional hub, there are plenty of guiding principles to show the way. Now here I'm going to try not to repeat um, a lot of what um, Des and Patrick so eloquently raised once we go into the implementation phase for this um, alliance. Um, but first on my list of um, implementation measures would be of course solid and modern arbitration legislation. Um, in Africa as a whole, there are now 13 um, arbitration acts based on the ancestral model law. And that's been a critical development, both for local practitioners um, and for international visitors. Um, South Africa's 2017 International Arbitration um, Act has been a game changer in South African arbitration practice um, for international cases, as we've heard a number of times um, this morning already. There are 12 other jurisdictions across the continent that are model law based, um, and there's also the 17-member uh, OHADA uh, block, which um, uses arbitration legislation that is model law adjacent. In the SADC region, uh, there are now uh, six um, member states that have adopted versions of the UNSTRAL model law, uh, with the addition of Malawi recently. Um, and so there's expertise in, the, in this region for fellow members of the Alliance to actually draw on in terms of getting legislation passed, uh, choices that are made, the extent to which it's adapted to local practice, and then um, in the implementation. A related area of, um, of movement would be reform of domestic um, uh, arbitration frameworks. Now whether the same statute applies to both international and domestic cases, or whether domestic legislation is made broadly compatible with the international statute, I think that some level of compatibility is very valuable um, and it meets the expectations of all end users ultimately. The second essential element in building a reputation after good um, and solid um, modern arbitration legislation would be courts who are willing to support but not interfere during the course of the proceedings. And the third element is consistent enforcement of arbitral awards under the New York Convention. Um, most African states are by now signatories to the uh, New York Convention, um, and almost all SADC member states are as well. Those that aren't um, also have the example um, and the expertise of members, members of the alliance to actually draw on in um, acceding to the convention. But that's only the first step. Uh, the second step is going to be how, what the courts actually do with that um, convention once um, the state has signed up to it. Consistent enforcement by the courts is really important. And not only consistent implementation enforcement in practice, but also making it clear to users that courts are behaving in a consistent way. Transparency. So, for instance, South Africa's track record with regard to the enforcement of foreign arbitral awards is very good, certainly at Supreme Court and Constitutional Court level. But it's really important that where there is a good track record, <clears throat> that that is made widely known. Here we have a fantastic platform used in the region already called SAFLI, um, an online free platform for the publication of court judgments. Platforms like SAFLI should be supported, funded and encouraged because commercial users won't risk seating their arbitrations in um, unproved or relatively unproved jurisdictions unless not only is the framework in place, but they're confident that the courts are applying that framework in a consistent way. A fourth element um, is good case management. 
And then um, another element would be transparency um, in developing confidence in the work of local decision makers, um, which is why publication of arbitral awards is becoming increasingly important. And here, ICA, through um, the large um, established and curated Cleave Arbitration Database, uh, use Mundi, which has extensive coverage, um, and other platforms for non-commercial cases, offer good platforms, um, with ICA actively growing its existing database of published anonymized awards in commercial uh, cases. So what can newer institutes do to contribute to a good framework and transparency around good application of the framework? So I think institutes need to critically develop their focus and their purpose. Who are the key users going to be? Which categories of disputes will they focus on? Who can be relied on to support the center? And how will institutes um, generate income to cover running costs while caseloads are growing? A couple of good examples can be found um, in uh, Rwanda um, and in Saudi Arabia. So uh, what, the, what KIAC, the Kigali International Arbitration Center, um, has done is to enter into agreements with the Rwandan government um, for the insertion of KIAC arbitration clauses in many government contracts. That's exactly what Saudi Arabia is trying to do um, in its recent uh, push to develop an arbitration hub in that region. And that has the power to provide a steady supply, uh, supply of cases to the local arbitral institutes. Now, EFSA, of course, historically relied on a very steady flow of domestic cases before capitalizing on the passage of the 2017 International Act, um, and now includes a very impressive number of international cases. But lastly, everyone involved in an arbitration project, government policymakers, key arbitration specialists, arbitral institutes, they all need to commit to capacity building of arbitrators, arbitration council, and case managers. So how do you do this? For arbitrators, uh, you start to build diverse lists of potential arbitrators. You offer arbitrator training, um, and by being sufficiently uh, transparent in, in appointment processes, it really should be clear to users what the pool of arbitrators is in that, um, in that, that, that institute of fishing in, which fish are swimming in the pool, how they got into the pool in the first place, what the criteria are for reeling them out of the pool, um, and the extent to which institutes are embracing diversity and inclusion in their appointment practices. A very good way of ensuring diversity and inclusion long term is through accountability, public accountability. So for instance, um, a lot of institutes in, um, in Europe have signed up to um, the Equal Rep Representation in Arbitration Pledge uh, committing to uh, reaching gender parity in the appointment of, of arbitrators. That's the kind of initiative that encourages the publication of statistics and encourages compliance with those goals. Um, <clears throat> I hear often that institutes are hesitant to publish statistics because they think it might make them look bad. I don't agree. I think uh, a commitment to transparency, a commitment to improving representation, and being able to show steady progress from year to year, in fact, makes, makes the institute look good. And it's much more powerful in the longer term. What else can institutes do? Well, they can also use the opportunity offered when called upon to make a direct appointment of an arbitrator to entrust that appointment in appropriate cases uh, to less tested, younger, and more diverse decision makers, particularly in low value cases and for co-arbitrator appointments. This too grows the pool over time. Though perhaps I've now exhausted that particular fishing metaphor. Um, for arbitration council, capacity building can be done by offering continuing legal education to qualified attorneys on the conduct of arbitral proceedings, on effective advocacy, on process management, and by providing uh, practical skills training for younger practitioners. Many organizations already offer such training on the continent. AVSA does it very effectively. The Association of Arbitrators does. CIR, the African Arbitration Academy, ICA, Young ICA, and now, of course, Young AVSA. So let's use and expand what is already there. <clears throat> Effective and sustainable capacity building requires patience, I think, um, and the willingness to adopt a potentially long-term horizon because it involves a long-term commitment to building skills throughout the lifespan of a lawyer, starting with teaching at university level. 
The University of Cape Town has taught international arbitration practice at LLM level for nearly two decades, as has uh, the University of Stellenbosch. Uh, UCT is consolidating and expanding its teaching and, cap and capacity building with the launch of its new arbitration and dispute resolution unit in October of last year. Other universities in Southern Africa, I think, should follow suit um, at both undergrad and postgrad level. And again, there's a pool of expertise within the region to draw from and collaborate with. And then, of course, after university, young practitioners will need early skills training, um, such as the skills training workshops offered by Young ICA. Uh, and they'll need exposure to arbitral proceedings, even if it's in a very junior or supportive role. So they often need guidance during first time or early exposure to those arbitral processes. And this is a role often done very well by established arbitral institutes with legal staff available to provide guidance to parties and their attorneys on procedure, good practice, um, and effective case management. I think there's no reason that um, AVSA and affiliated <coughs> institutions couldn't play a very similar role. So even I think with all these building blocks in place, perhaps the most useful quality required of institution builders is patience and a long-term vision. Uh, the principles, the priorities, and the goals of this new AFSA SADC Alliance certainly include vision. Um, and now it's time for the patient work on the ground and behind the scenes, putting all that equipment in place to prepare in advance to that summit that really does loom so close. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for your patience during this session. Um, at this point, we will break for tea for 15 minutes because we've lost time, and we will go into the next plenary session. In the meantime, I would like to call upon the dignitaries that signed the charter to come forward so that we can sign off. Thank you so much. Huh? The
there's a lot of very scrambled and self funded and there's a lot of material to, uh, to follow. But I don't know if you can be as living on it. David, can you hear me? Hey, we can hear you, David. The light is like. Will you just carry on speaking for a bit, David, for like two minutes? Okay, that's fine. Um, as I say, what was happening was that there was some very scrabbled sound in the background, but perhaps I wasn't linked into anything. But I can certainly hear you, uh, so hopefully uh, the rest of the panel will be hooked Sorry, into the same not. sound system. <laughs> can you hear me? Will you just carry on speaking, David? We're just testing the audio. Yeah. Okay, great. If you could just test the audio. I'm sitting in Hong Kong and uh, the, it's a rather cloudy day and um, it's been like that for some time, but um, I'm hoping that the sun will still come out. Okay, okay um, perfect, David. We're happy with audio and visual. Um, we're just going to wait for proceedings to start and then we'll call you in. Uh, that's right. As long as I can hear uh, the panel members uh, with the same clarity that I can hear you, that would be great. Because there was a lot of distortion earlier, but maybe I wasn't. Yeah, uh, I think the, the, the lack of communication with my mic is because I'm by the AV team now. I see. Okay. Well, as long as, uh, as, long as you can make sure I can hear the panel, that would be great. Okay, perfect. I think you can just mute your mic for now, and then we'll call you in when we're ready to go. Perfect. They obviously control the MP uh, in that sense. Yeah. So it's, I think a lot is still to be judged. Well, yeah. it, well, it first like has exactly, to be finalized. Exactly. <laughs> not, not just tested. Like, there's a lot of thought yeah. that still needs to go to the This is on for me. How much longer are you going to wait?
by Judge David Unterhalter, who is participating virtually as he's literally on the other side of the world. Many in this room are probably familiar with Judge Unterhalter. Before he was appointed as a judge in 2018, he was one of the foremost senior counsel in South Africa and participated in many matters in the fields of trade law, competition law, constitutional law, and commercial law, and had many high-profile cases before the Supreme Court of Appeal and the Constitutional Court. He has acted as an advisor to the South African Department of Trade and Industry and has served on a number of WTO dispute settlement panels. He was also a member of the WTO appellate body and was the chairman appointed twice in that regard. Um, Judge Unterholzer holds degrees from Trinity College Cambridge, Wits University, University College Oxford. He's been a professor of law at Wits University since 1998. And from 2000 to 2006, he was a director of the Mandela Institute, which is also part of Wits University, an institute focusing upon global law. He's published widely in fields of public law and competition law. Sitting immediately to my left is Johan Human. Johan practiced law for five years before he joined the Department of Trade and Industry in 1984. In 1997, he was appointed as head of Trade Remedies Authority in South Africa. And between the years of 1996 to 2000, he was a panelist on five WTO dispute settlement panels. In 2001, he joined the WTO officially, and in 2008, he was appointed as the director of its rules division. In this capacity, he was responsible for all matters related to dispute settlements concerning a number of key WTO agreements, including the anti-dumping agreement, the subsidies and countervailing measures agreement, and the safeguard, safeguard agreement. He was therefore directly involved in over 50% of all disputes referred to the WTO during the period of 2008 to 2018 when he retired. But after retirement, they didn't let him go. He still served on his sixth WTO dispute settlement panel. Next to Johan is one of my partners from Rebel Wenzel, Meleki and Zamande. Meleki is a partner in our competition trade and investment practice. He practiced at Weber Wenzel for 16 years and then he joined the International Trade Administration Commission of South Africa, ITAC, in 2018, where he was the chief commissioner. But to our delight, in 2022, he came back to Weber Wenzel, and his practice specializes in all aspects of international trade and investment law across a range of sectors. He assists clients both local, with local and foreign investigations relating to customs duty amendments, anti-dumping, safeguard, and other trade remedies and gives trade and investment advice on accessing benefits and rights enshrined in bilateral and multilateral trade agreements, such as the AFCFTA Recording in progress. and the South African Customs Uni Union Agreement, as well as various economic partnership agreements between different African countries, the European Union, and the United Kingdom, as well as the WTO agreements. Sitting next to Mel Leki is Vlad Mavsvich, also one of my partners at Rebel Wenzel. He has an extensive international and domestic arbitration practice, and he has represented parties in many high-profile pro litigation matters in South Africa over the years, in every possible court, I think, in the country, possibly, <laughs> as well as before specialized regulatory tribunals, parliamentary committees, and commissions of inquiries, and has run many domestic and international arbitrations under the auspices of, of many international rules, institutional rules, for example, ICSID, LCIA, AFSA, ICC, to name a few. Vlad is a prominent member of the international arbitration community in Africa. He's the director of the African Arbitration Association, AFA, and is recognized as an expert in arbitration and dispute resolution in numerous research organizations, Legal 500, Chambers Global, Who's Who Legal, and Best Lawyers. So with this uh, excellent panel before you, we are going to be discussing the African continental free trade area and the role of dispute resolution in African trade and investment. Now, I must level with you. AFCFTA doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. And I sometimes struggle to pronounce it without seeming too clumsy. And I've tried to take this initialism and turn it into an acronym so it'd be just one word I could pronounce, but I unfortunately have failed. So I ask you to bear with me as we make repeated mentions of the AFCFTA, and hopefully we will manage it every time. 
the AFCFTA is the largest free trade area in the world, and it has the potential to transform African trade and investment radically. But in order for this to happen, it is critical that it has a fair, effective, and inclusive dispute resolution mechanism to govern or regulate any disputes arising in regard to the free trade area. Currently, the only mechanism in place is limited to state-state disputes, and this leaves out critical role players, and as a result, may weaken the harmonization and progressive objectives of the FTA and undermine its efficacy. The recently adopted protocol on investment provides for the future negotiation of dispute resolution mechanisms. And this is what we are going to discuss today on this panel, an attempt to hash out what kind of dispute re resolution mechanism should best be adopted by the AFCFTA. So to kick us off, I'm going to hand over to you, Johan. In our description of this topic, we make a very bold statement, saying that the AFCFTA has the potential to transform trade and investment in Africa radically. One of the statistics that backs up this statement is the, fact, uh, the estimation that the AFCFTA may expand the Africa's economy by 29 trillion US dollars by 2050. That's 26 years. That's a lot of zeros, Johan. Maybe you can, to set the scene for this discussion, um, take us through what the AFCFTA aims to achieve and broadly how it aims to do so. Thank you, Erin, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. But allow me also as uh, internationalist, but also continentalist, to congratulate uh, AFSA on what you've achieved and what you've done, and uh, the chair as well. Uh, you've done really, really a great job, and what makes me really excited is that you can be one of the significant building blocks with your alliance now with SADC in uh, developing alternative dispute settlement mechanism for, for Africa. I think that is really, really critically important. I can see your work in three pillars, domestic, uh, region, Africa, and then also international, because as some of the other speakers, ministers have said, it's critically important to indigenize dispute settlement in Africa. We have a certain way of uh, approaching disputes in uh, part of our culture, and we need to take uh, that into account. So I can see different pillars for you, actually, then four pillars that you can really, really play a significant uh, role. And also, if you look at how, uh, I'm not going to use the acronym, acronym. <laughs> I'm just going to talk about the agreement, so then you know what I'm talking about. The agreement is based on, on that, because what does the agreement uh, aim to do, it is to enable the free flow of goods and services across the continent, a single market, and to boost the trading position of Africa in the global market. So a two-prong uh, approach now. We're talking about 1.3 billion people to grow to um, 1.3 billion to 2.5 billion by 2050. But wait for, for this. By the end of this century, the estimate is that uh, the African population will represent 40% of world population. Because at that stage, the Chinese population is already starting to decline. The Indian population will also start to, to decline. So 40%. So there's a huge, huge opportunity uh, for the agreement to achieve what uh, we wanted to achieve. Also take into consider consideration that the median age of uh, the African population is 19 years. So there's a huge future dividend that we as the current generation and the younger generation, you people, you have a special responsibility to make this work. Now, when we look at the agreement, well, we, we know the challenges in, in Africa, fragmented markets, huge infrastructural problems, logistical constraints, and, and, and. But uh, so the opportunities are all there. Now, how is the agreement going to achieve 
This, it is, it's going to be complicated, it's going to take time, but I'm, I'm quite positive because if you look at the seven protocols envisaged, we in phase one, the, uh, the goods protocol, that is tariff elimination and non-tariff barrier elimination, that has been adopted. The services liberalization protocol has been adopted. And then on uh, IP, competition policy, and then also on uh, investment, uh, the agreements have been adopted, but not uh, implemented yet, some of them. Good progress has also been made on the negotiations on digital trade and women and youth in trade. Now, when you look at the different protocols, the seven protocols, I'm not going to go through them, but there's one important one, and that's the one on dispute settlement. And the protocol on dispute settlement, Mililecki will uh, talk about that, is um, based on the WTO dispute settlement uh, agreement, um, sort of um, to, to a great extent. But that is government to government, as Erin has said, but when we look at the protocols, the specific protocols have more tailor-made provisions on dispute settlement. And in the uh, dispute settlement chapter of the investment protocol, there is a provision for different types of dispute settlement. Now, the agreement, uh, there's been broad agreement on um, on, on the investment protocol, except on the issue of dispute settlement. There are two outstanding issues. The one is expropriation, and the second one is on uh, investor state dispute settlement. As we know, that's a, a little bit of a, of a controversial issue, but that is where arbitration uh, comes in and uh, the development of a system that is acceptable to uh, to all the, the signatories. Now, uh, said implementation has already started with um, uh, certain tariff obligations have already been accepted and implemented 12 of the 47 uh, members that have um, uh, ratified the agreement have started to implement their tariff obligations, part of it. So there's, uh, there's been good good progress. On the issue of the dispute settlement and uh, expropriation, the expectation is that uh, the agreement will be ratified, or the hopes are that it will be ratified by the end of, of this year. So uh, that means that the Alliance and AFSA will have to, to start preparing themselves, uh, depending on what will be in the detail. That's just in, in short. Thank you. Johan, perhaps I can just ask you, um, we've mentioned, obviously, there's 55 members to the AFCFTA, and I think people generally, when they think about trade and investments, they're thinking about states as the players. But who are the other role players? Who are the other people that are affected by this agreement? Well, um, abroad, um, you, you have your, your states, then you have the investors, you have uh, um, the, the population, the, the citizens, they directly if affected. So it's not only government to government. And um, I think um, the alliance, AFSA and the alliance, you have a, a very strong a line that you can take in, um, in getting uh, the governments to take your views also into consideration as an active role player. Because if you look at Kumesa and in the uh, East African community, in their dispute settlement provisions, they have, uh, or, or the treaty provisions, they have a particular role for uh, civil society and uh, professional associations. You have the Law Society, the East African Law Association, uh, very much present in the EAC negotiations. And that is critically important. Um, the, the Consultative Business Council in one of these treaties is also um, an organ of the community. It's mm -hmm. not just uh, an observer, it is an organ, so their views have to be taken into account, and that's critical. So the ball is now in your court to make your present, uh, presence heard and to influence the process. And as President um, Kenyatta 
of Kenya said when the uh, DRC was, um, became a member of the AC, he said the, the treaty, the AC treaty is uh, people-centered and private sector driven. So uh, that's, that's very important. And the AC is a very important building block to the, to the agreement. Thank you, Johan. Melu, maybe you can help us here taking a closer look at the AFCFTA's current dispute resolution agreements, particularly the protocol and rules and procedures on settlement of disputes, which is part of the agreement which established the free trade area, and the protocol and investment, which Johanna has mentioned. Won't you elaborate on these different dispute resolution mechanisms? What are we currently working with? Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks, Erin, for the opportunity. Um, maybe let me just uh, leverage the last point that uh, my colleague Johan just talked to uh, in relation to the users of the instrument that we're discussing today. Uh, in doing so, I'm almost starting back to front in terms of my presentation, and I <laughs> hope you will indulge me on that front. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm doing so because I think context is important. Uh, the trade in Africa is not confined to trade by large multinational companies or businesses. In fact, in most instances, it's uh, individual uh, crossing the border to sell their wares uh, on a relatively small scale. And uh, the structure of the agreement uh, the, in terms of who has access to the dispute settlement mechanism is that state parties are the ones that act either on their behalf or on behalf of uh, their nationals. And when you compare that to what happens in, in East Africa, I believe, uh, the regional uh, body, the trade body, provides access to individuals. And I am reliably informed that uh, the states who are sued in that body often respect the judgments of the regional bodies more than they respect judgments of their own uh, courts, domestic courts. So, uh, the, the structure of the, of, of, of the agreement, uh, insofar as the dispute settlement clause is concerned, uh, by restricting access to state parties, I think, um, it creates a bit of a challenge. There is some modification, as Johan said, uh, in the context of the investor, I mean, in the context of the investment uh, protocol, but um, that's still an evolving uh, document, uh, because the important annex there too is still the subject of negotiation. Um, I will, with those uh, introductory words, in fact, let me just make uh, further background remarks. Uh, at the core of the AFCFTA is preferential trade agreements and preferential investment agreements. In other words, it's a club where African states say we will deal with each other on more favorable terms than we do when we deal with non African countries. Uh, so, one of the key important features of that is that as a member state, you are foregoing certain benefits, typically uh, it's tariff revenue uh, that you'd otherwise get uh, in exchange for being a member of this club and hopefully get, getting the economic spin-offs that come with being a member of this club. So when a party to the club or a member of the club breaches some of the tenets of the agreement, it becomes quite a big deal because you have made real sacrifices as a state. Uh, a lot of the smaller African countries de depend quite a lot uh, for their fiscal uh, management on income generated from tariffs. So being part of this bargain is not a small uh, decision. To perhaps zone in then on the uh, dispute settlement mechanism, um, 
the founding article is Article 20, which provides for the establishment of the dispute settlement mechanism for the AFCFTA. And that mechanism is to be administered according to the protocol on rules and procedures on the settlement of dispute, what I call the DSM protocol. Uh, part of the idea of establishing the dispute settlement mecha mechanism is to ensure transparency, accountability, fairness, predictability uh, in dispute uh, settlement process. As I remarked earlier, um, regional courts in parts of the continent uh, play a more important role than uh, domestic courts. So establishing a, a mechanism such as this one is, is quite important and elements of transparency, accountability are, 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 are absolutely key. Um, I'll also be talking briefly to the investment protocol. And in this regard, I just want to refer you to one aspect of the investment protocol, which interestingly imports uh, um, the provisions of Article 20 into that protocol. Article 46.3 says that uh, the rules and procedures governing the dispute prevention, or oh, sorry, dispute prevention, management, and resolution of disputes covered by this protocol will be set out in an annex to this protocol. Uh, as matters stand, the annex to the protocol remains the subject of, of negotiation. To carry on then, the protocol on dispute settlement, its scope of application, as I said, it's a state-to-state -state, uh, protocol uh, the disputes relate to the interpretation, application of rights and obligations under the protocol, I'm sorry, under the AFCFTA. And I would like to just extract uh, three or four salient features of the protocol and dispute settlement. The first one is, is what I call choice. Uh, it's one of those instruments where you are spoiled for choice in terms of the path you can follow towards uh, resolving your disputes. Two, uh, another salient feature is that the establishment of a, a standalone dispute mechanism uh, gives assurance that you've got a neutral body that will independently and uh, faithfully hear your case. Three, uh, efficient and binding process. One of the benefits of a, an existing st uh, standing dispute settlement body is that it is, in terms of how the agreement is structured, it is the men or the people who serve on the structure are people who are nominated by member states and where they serve on panels or on, uh, the, on, 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 the, on the appellate body, which are some of the dispute settlement structures that, are, that will be put in place, uh, they serve there as experts who've got not just uh, experience, but they've got subject matter experts, subject, subject matter expertise. So you've got international trade lawyers, you've got public international law trade lawyers, you've got uh, arbit uh, arbitrators of long standing. And what that gives you, which you don't get in domestic courts, is that uh, you're not sitting before a judge who listens for, uh, to a family case matter and <laughs> to your complicated international trade matter. I'm not suggesting that family law is simple. But um, it's, you, you are dealing, you are appearing in front of people who are subject matter experts and that obviates the need to educate the judge before you get into the real cuts of your case. So that's one of the strengths of, 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 the, of the settlement mechanism that uh, the agreement proposes to establish. Just briefly in terms of process, an initiating party must notify the other party and, as I said, indicate the choice of, of, of mechanism they want to follow in, in, in setting the dispute. Broadly, there are two phases. There's a phase that seeks to, and it's a mandatory phase, that seeks to have the parties resolve the dispute amicably. Uh, if that happens, it's cheap, it's quick. Uh, if that doesn't happen, then you move over to a more litigious uh, mechanism. Secondly, uh, I've spoken about the neutrality of the body. 
that, that's the second. I've, I've spoken about the binding and efficient process. That was the third thing I wanted to extract. And the fourth feature I just wanted to talk to is the confidentiality <coughs> aspect. Um, the beauty of tribunals such as the ones that have been contemplated here is that by their nature, they are designed to deal with sensitive information. <laughs> and when you are involved in disputes involving trade, involving investment, you, ex you essentially expose the guts of your business to the panelists or to the members of the tribunal. And you only will do so if you've got the comfort that the information that you present is protected and is kept confidential. And one of the key aspects and requirements, uh, obligations that rests on the dispute settlement panel or the appellate body or the dispute settlement body is that information that is provided to them in confidence uh, is kept confident and is protected. At the same time, uh, those bodies are required to produce uh, reports that explain the basis of their decision. So they then have the challenge to make sure that in producing those reports, uh, which are, are, are not confidential, uh, the proprietary information and classified information of the parties is kept out. So that is as far as I, I go in terms of the the dispute settlement mechanism. I just want to speak quickly, if I still have time, to, to, to the investment protocol. Johanna said that it's not um, yet operational. The version we're working with is a January 23, 2023 version. Um, but you understand it's far advanced in terms of uh, it being ready for, for, for adoption or for implementation. Uh, one of the features about it is that it will not apply to disputes that, have, uh, that arose before it came into effect. Um, because it's an investment protocol, uh, most of you will be aware that member states, African member states, already have some, for, are already party to some form of um, uh, investment protection agreements, whether it's bilateral investment uh, treaties or uh, agreements that are incorporated in other uh, multilateral agreements. There is that a need then to harmonize and to deal with particularly uh, bilateral investment treaties. And how the investment protocol pro proposes to do that is that uh, bilateral, intra-Africa bilateral investment treaties should be terminated over a five-year period from the date of implementation of the protocol. Uh, and controversially, but very importantly, even the clauses that talk to the survival of BITs need to be uh, also eliminated or terminated. Uh, that's going to be quite a challenge. It, it will be interesting to see how that is going to happen, uh, how that, what, what challenges uh, that faces, but it's quite, uh, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> um, one of the key features of our investment protocol is that it preserves deliberately the space from a policy and a regulatory point of view for, for, for state parties to be able to continue to use those, instru uh, those instruments uh, to advance public interest, whether it is environment, good environment, whether it's uh, um, energy efficiency, it's uh, women empowerment, or th those type of or labor rights, critically. Uh, some of you might be aware that the US is already leaning on China uh, to uh, start, I don't want to use the word comply, but uh, to start uh, increasing the labor standards of the Chinese employees because uh, as matters stand, the US uh, employees enjoy quite a lot of rights which make them uh, relatively more expensive than the ones in China. So in Africa, we'll probably have this, uh, the same challenge. So what the protocol does is to anticipate that type of challenge and try and, and level the, the, the playing field. Um, I'll skip quite a few things and try to go to... Well, maybe maybe we should move on, but maybe um, if you, yeah, at, towards the end of the discussion, if you have any points to make, yeah, we I, can continue. I am, I'm, I'm going to skip and just make one or two remarks about sure. the, the annex. Go for it. Yeah. Uh, the, the, this is the annex to the investment protocol, which is supposed to give the detail on the, on, on the rules and the procedures and the processes that need to be followed in order to give effect to the, 
to the articles of the, of the protocol. Um, as I said, the annex is not in place, but just to share a, a, a few thoughts about what should be in the, in the annex. One, a, a mechanism uh, which enables parties to notif oh, uh, for notification of the Secretariat of the AFCFTA. Two, uh, rules on the state-to-state -state dispute or state investor dispute. Three, this one maybe I'll just skip, it's a bit complicated. And <laughs> four, um, as I said, there is a deliberate emphasis on, uh, conf on, on prevention of, 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 or, or management of conflict before it gets to an adversarial stage or a, 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 a litigious stage. Mm. Uh, we need to have rules and guidance on how uh, dedicated state bodies that are responsible for that are to achieve that, and even state parties are going to participate in that process. Let me stop there for now. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Melu. And um, Vlad can pretty much pick up, I think, at that point. So there has been a technical note that has been published regarding the annex to the protocol, um, and it's quite a high-level note, particularly when it speaks to the kind of unamicable dispute resolution mechanisms that, I guess, are being contemplated in respect to what should be put into the annex to the protocol on investment. Um, and it mentions potentially using the dispute settlement body under the protocol and rules and procedures on the settlement of disputes. It mentions arbitration, and it mentions referral to domestic or regional courts. So that's quite a broad range of potential mechanisms that can be used. Um, so it gives very little guidance on which one is probably the appropriate one. So Vlad, maybe you can get, just give us our, your thoughts on, and maybe leveraging off what Melu has mentioned on the, the aspects or the core and foundational principles that really should kind of focus or structure the choice of the dispute resolution mechanism that makes se most sense for the protocol on investment. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Uh, so I think to, uh, to be able to assess that question, you need to go uh, back to what both uh, Johan and Mileleki have said about the structure of this agreement. So on the one hand, you have the main agreement and most of the protocols that deal with state-to-state -state issues. So most of the protocols, other than the investment protocol, don't involve investors directly. They, they involve issues between states, and that's why the dispute resolution uh, protocol, the dispute settlement protocol, deals with state-state disputes. It creates the, uh, what's called the uh, dispute settlement body that has the appointees, two appointees from each state. That, that body then sets up the panels that will hear specific disputes and the appellate panels. Uh, and that whole, uh, the, the, that body then uh, takes back the recommendations of those panels and enforces them but in a way that, that would be enforceable as between states. So it's not normally enforced through the court process, it's enforced through other trade-related measures. So you'll see in the dispute resolution or dispute settlement protocol, it specifically emphasizes the non-litigious uh, manners of enforcement. Uh, uh, one of them is to withdraw concessions that would otherwise be applicable in a, to a particular state or to offer compensation or to have other trade measures that force a state to comply with the dispute uh, settlement resolution. Uh, now that is, uh, those kinds of dispute settlement mechanisms are not well suited to, uh, to situations which involve private entities, investors. So, uh, when we consider the protocol on investment, which is centered on rights and responsibilities of investors, obviously you need a different mechanism. Uh, now, that protocol does say that the state can, exercising its diplomatic protection uh, entitlement, take up the case on behalf of, of the investor. But we know historically the reason why that's been ineffective is, is because the investors' interests often divert from or di diverge from that of, of their host state. And there are all sorts of, of political considerations that obviously enter into the picture when you deal with state-state uh, uh, disputes. So we've seen very few successful diplomatic 
protection cases around the world where investor rights have been vindicated. And the kind of enforcement mechanism that I've talked about under the dispute settlement protocol is just not very well suited to, to uh, um, enforcing investor rights. So when we are looking at uh, investor state uh, duties and, and rights, uh, we need something else. And obviously the first, the first port of call that all lawyers here will have is to the uh, bilateral investment and international, uh, sorry, and multilateral uh, investment treaties and the mechanisms that were there. So what, what we've seen is that, uh, and, and I, I know it's uh, something that Aaron wants to discuss in more detail later, but uh, what we've seen as a first cut of Annex uh, A to the investment protocol is an investor state dispute resolution mechanism that's akin to what we've seen in bilateral investment treaties, which would refer most of the disputes to arbitration. Uh, to international arbitration. Now, of course, that would, that, that would make sense to a, a lot of lawyers, but from a political perspective, that's been quite a fraught area uh, in the last uh, decade or decade and a half. And a lot of governments have s uh, sought to move away from that. Obviously, South Africa took quite a, uh, a monumental and, and perhaps a slightly dangerous step of withdrawing from various multilateral and bilateral investment treaties. Some countries have followed suit, but very few. Uh, the question that arises is, uh, how can we balance the, the need for an effective enforcement mechanism that gives, right, uh, gives effect to uh, investor rights and also states' rights, and I'll talk about that very briefly, uh, but at the same time, also balances the, uh, the state's regulatory needs, which the, state has, uh, the states have uh, effectively, over the past decade and a, a half, said that those can't be vindicated through uh, international arbitration because they believe that international arbitrators are pro-investors and have that kind of bias. Uh, and, and so what we've seen with this protocol uh, the reason why I think Annex A has not been finalized is that struggle. Uh, now, from an investor perspective, I'm not sure that there's much for the states to worry about because if you look at the uh, history of uh, international arbitrations in uh, especially ICSID and UNCITROL cases that deal with uh, investment treaties, the reason why those, uh, those uh, arbitrators came to the assistance of investors is because the um, uh, substantive standards in those treaties gave uh, substantial rights to investors. What we've seen with the protocol, and this is quite important, is that the protocol seeks to balance that on the substantive front. The protocol is not a bilateral investment treaty that's just been converted into a multilateral, um, uh, 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 cross-continental uh, behemoth. It's absolutely not that. First of all, it contains rights and obligations. Now, uh, 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 rights of investors, uh, rights are internally limited. So, whereas in the past you had um, uh, expropriation required uh, uh, full and adequate uh, compensation in terms of the Hull formula, which effectively was interpreted to mean, mean complete compensation, now, the protocol seeks to limit that and says it has to be fair compensation having regard to a whole host of factors. And this will, be, uh, uh, this will resonate with a lot of South African lawyers because, of, of course, our constitution seeks to balance that compensation right too. Uh, then on the fair and equitable treatment, the, uh, the treaty does give, uh, give uh, effect to uh, a fair and equitable type of treatment, but it says it must be no more than recognized under public international law and customary international law, which means it's very limited in scope. It's not the bilateral investment treaty kind of uh, open-ended fair and equitable treatment. Uh, the same can be said of a number of other protections that are offered in the treaty. So, so there are internal limitations to the substantive standards. Mm -hmm. But secondly, 
the, the treaty, and perhaps quite ominously for investors, contains a number of responsibilities. Now, it's not absolutely clear when the protocol is not a is not a contract between the state and the investor how that will be enforceable. But I suspect if the investor wants to enforce the rights, they also will have to uh, uh, accede to the responsibilities. And I think that's how the, the protocol is structured. And those responsibilities are quite far-reaching in the kinds of areas that Mululeki mentioned, uh, labor rights and environmental rights and the need uh, not to engage in unlawful, immoral, or corrupt practices. So, uh, so the states have an opportunity to bring counterclaims, and that's expressly envisaged in the protocol. So there's nothing to fear, I think, from a, a, a fully um, enforceable arbitration, international arbitration type of Annex A uh, setup. And, and I think the, uh, the recoiling from that uh, uh, is unfortunate and I think, I think might, might um, diminish the efficacy of uh, the investment protocol because it seems to me that at some point there comes, uh, there comes a, a, a tipping point uh, where it's no longer of sufficient interest for investors to invest when they have the burden of responsibilities and also no way of enforcing the rights that they, that they uh, apparently have under the protocol. So I think one must be very cautious in devising Annex A to ensure that it gives uh, rise to effective enforcement. And effective enforcement that doesn't only rely, rely on state uh, interference as you would find in dispute settlement in normal WTO and AFCFTA dispute settlement mechanisms. So I, I think that's, that's my, uh, my take on it initially. <laughs> Obviously, there's a lot more to say, and yes. we could spend hours discussing it, but I think... Let's not. <laughs> Thanks, Vlad. Um, David, over to you. Um, you've heard Vlad's opinion on the dispute settlement body and using that as a potential mechanism for an investor state uh, dispute resolution mechanism. Um, and as suggested in this technical note, that's one of the things that's being considered. But David, given your experience with the WTO, maybe you can weigh in on that analysis and also perhaps on any other thing that Vlad has mentioned in respect of the investor state dispute resolution mechanisms. Yes, well, thank you very much for uh, the invitation to speak. Um, uh, I think obviously we begin with the recognition that this is an enormously ambitious uh, exercise that has been agreed upon. Unlike, for example, the EU, which began with a steel and coal uh, agreement and then developed institutions over a long period of time. Uh, this is an agreement which uh, starts with uh, an ambitious uh, idea of dispute resolution, which is drawn essentially from the WTO. And since we know a great deal about the WTO dispute settlement system, we can assess some of the strengths and weaknesses and some of the things that have to be put in place. Now, as other speakers uh, have emphasized, um, in respect of most of the substantive uh, features of the agreement, putting aside investor protections uh, for one moment, the dispute settlement system is effectively a carbon copy of the WTO dispute settlement system. And I just want to spend a moment on that, that system because there's a certain kind of irony where members of the WTO are engaged upon uh, the changes to the dispute settlement system because of the disaffection of at least one prominent member of the WTO. Uh, this agreement, however, has pretty much uh, adopted the WTO institutions of dispute settlement uh, entirely. Now, I think we know from experience that in order to make dispute settlement work um, for the purposes of state-to-state -state, uh, disputes, the institutions have to be extraordinarily robust. And that means in order to instill the right degree of com uh, confidence, you've not only got to have uh, the usual features of, uh, of what is required for dispute settlement, but you've got to have very high levels of confidence that you have highly competent people who can fairly administer these rules and interpret them in a fashion that uh, will create an acquis that is acceptable to the membership. And if you don't get that very strong institutional support right at the beginning and develop it progressively over time, then the institution begins to get disaffection. And once that is the case, it can fail. 
So I think there's a big question right at the beginning as to whether these institutions are going to be built in the right way with the right people and appointees, and they aren't going to simply be uh, places of sort of patronage for favoured uh, appointees, because if they do become that, then the institution will lack credibility, and one very much hopes that that's not the case. I think at the moment there's a fundamental relationship. There's much criticism that is offered about the fact that uh, those who can use the dispute settlement system as currently envisaged are there, are, are states, and it's to enforce state rights and obligations. I don't see that as such a great difficulty. I mean, if the WTA is an example, what happens is that private, se private sector organizations place pressure on their governments to vindicate the rights of uh, the uh, private entities through the states of which they are they form part and that's certainly how the wto uh, dispute settlement system developed to the high point that it did so i'm less troubled by the fact that it's states that have locker standi for the purposes of implementing most of the agreements that have been uh, concluded what that means as vad has correctly pointed out is that the mechanism in, of enforcement which is critical to having agreements of this kind has a particular character and it is essentially a character that is relevant to state institutions and state parties such as for example the withdrawal of concessions and the like and we know from the wto that the process of enforcement is itself very long very drawn out and one has to have remedies that are appropriate to the kind of disputes that are relevant and the sorts of infringements of right that are likely to be found and that's why one has that kind of enforcement mechanism relevant to states I think Vlad is absolutely correct that structurally speaking, in investor state disputes, you have two things that are going on. The one is, well, what is the remedy going to be? And for example, in an expropriation case, it's really about the extent of the loss and the species of damage that has been suffered that really needs to be compensated. Now, once that's the case, that is not an ideal kind of remedy that is likely to be easily susceptible of enforcement through dispute settlement that is appropriate to states. And hence, it seems logical that arbitration would be the favoured uh, favored mechanism because we know well how arbitration works for the, for the purposes of investor state disputes. Here's the problem that Vlad has already in some sense covered the ground, but the problem is really this. Because the substantive features of the investor state uh, protocols in respect of investment protection involves both rights and responsibilities of investors, it also entails very substantial recognition of the kind of public policy imperatives that states are likely to want to see vindicated in the balancing of investor interests against state interests. And here's the problem, and it's the political calculus that has yet to be finalized. Do you trust in arbitrators who are appointed through different mechanisms that are not within the entire control of states through institutional, through institutions that states have appointed? Do you trust them, them excuse me, to make this balance right? Now, if Vlad is correct, the substance of the, uh, of the protocol allows much space for the balance to be properly struck. The advantage of a panel appellate body institution is that you have a, a mechanism that is intended to create some stability and clarity through the institutional solidity of standing bodies, at least in respect of the appellate body, though in the WTO case, that's the very thing that is now being attacked. So there's some guarantee for states that because the institutions are created through these mechanisms, you would have stability and predictability and clarity. Once you go for an arbitration model, there is much less certainty that you're going to have that measure of predictability because in the nature of arbitration, the arbitration decides the particular dispute. It has no precedential value. And consequently, the kind of consistency that you're seeking is much more at, 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 at issue. And that's the kind of complexity here. Do you go for arbitration and remedies that are appropriate to arbitration, generally speaking, speedier and more appropriate? 
or do you pack it into the panel versus a pallet body model, which might give you more stability and clarity and has more state input in a sense, but the mechanisms for getting to answers are slower and the kinds of remedies at the moment are not those particularly well suited to investor state uh, uh, disputes uh, settlement. I think that's the essence of the problem. Thank you, David. And that's very insightful and I think it leads us on to the next question uh, for, and I'm going to skip to the question to Melu, which is really about taking heed of what the European Union is dealing with at the moment, where they are moving away from these intra-EU arbitrations between investors and states in the EU. And since 2015 have been looking into this model, although it is to do with investment and trade with other countries, their multilateral investment court. Um, and so perhaps it's thinking along those lines of, is an investment court the balance between as David has mentioned, these investor state interests, but then also understanding the value or the kind of cons that come with arbitration and the value of having a more permanent body. Thanks, Erin. Yes, uh, in fact, it's uh, the, the European Union has been at this for, for quite some time, for a few years now, and it's still at it. Um, just to capture it, uh, there is a retreat from the bilateral investment treaties that were in place amongst or in between the various uh, European Union member states and replace that with what's termed an investment court system which uh, is specifically mandated to deal with uh, investment matters and by design then take into account uh, the various uh, considerations, uh, state interest as well as investor interest that uh, have been canvassed uh, to date. Um, it's, a, it's an ongoing journey. I, I do think that we would be well advised uh, as Africans when we look at our annexure to look and see what, uh, our annexure to the investment protocol to look and see what uh, is happening and what is the thinking and what has been written uh, in the European Union in the European Union in relation to what they're doing with the uh, investment uh, court system. Maybe I can open that up to the rest of the panel. Any thoughts, Vlad, Johan, David, on in the investment court model? Uh, well, uh, I guess the key question is who is appointing the, the members of the investment court and how are they going to be appointed? And it's not even clear at this stage uh, uh, what the EU is going to settle on. Um, and I think that, uh, and, and maybe that is a model that can, be, uh, that can be adopted, or maybe it's a hybrid. Because uh, it's, it's very important for the parties to, the, to a dispute to feel that their interests are being represented in some way, or that they, are, um, they have a, a stake in the process. Uh, both on the adjudication side and obviously uh, they do have a stake on the outcome side, but they want to know that on the adjudication side they have that stake. And I think for a lot of investors, if, um, if, it's, uh, if it's a body that's completely extrinsic to them appointing uh, and that body is not extrinsic to the state that's the host state, I think that will be, uh, that will be seen as inherently biased and may in fact lead to a whole host of uh, other proceedings to set aside that process or, or, um, uh, or, or to impugn it. So I think, I think what might be a compromise is maybe each party appoints one arbitrator and then the third one is appointed by the investment court. So that one at least has, uh, I can see the benefits of there being uh, from a jurisprudential perspective of there being a system of precedent a sort of more or less um, um, uh, accepted institution that resolves by way of arbitration disputes. But I think there needs to be, uh, there needs to be a mechanism where everyone who's party to the dispute feels that they are being properly represented. And these are important disputes. This is not, uh, mm -hmm. we're not dealing with trivial matters. Thanks, Vlad. David, I mean, just to, just to highlight, 
just to highlight one feature, which is this oddity in the uh, in the protocol, which um, because investors have, owe both obligations and will enjoy rights, if they invoke the mechanism, as Vlad has pointed out, they are taken to give consent to the dispute settlement body that they choose. Now, that doesn't seem to be too onerous if they're selecting arbitration. But if their only option is to select into an institution, um, then their consent is a little bit coerced in ways that might seem not entirely reciprocal. So there are, I, I, I think it's a very complicated problem. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, an investment court has many desirable features, um, but of course its composition has to be, again be one that would win very wide legitimacy uh, from different sectors, including the class of investors who are relevantly interested. And I think that's where some of the hesitation comes, uh, comes about. Um, and uh, so I, I can understand. I mean, there are hybrid and mixed models, possibly arbitration at the first level with the possibility of an appeal that adds cost and time. Uh, and the appeal could be to a, a permanent body. So many things still to consider. But there's a tension at the heart of this whole problem. And that's probably why it's taking so long to resolve. Thanks, David. Maybe just sticking with you. Um, given your experience with the WTO, um, and obviously we've also seen plenty of examples where dispute resolution bodies have been hamstrung by conflicting interests and agendas. Are there any obvious lessons that we need to learn or the AFCFTA needs to take into consideration when forming its dispute resolution mechanism? So I'd say a few things on the score. The first is, uh, I mean, many people will assume that there's going to be a rush to use the system. Uh, I think that's an unproven proposition. I mean, we know from regional trade agreements that the first port of call is almost always some kind of negotiation, which is highly desirable, and some sort of settlement with some kind of set of concessions that are made. I mean, standardly, that is how states first and should first approach trade disputes. So we firstly don't know how tentative states are going to be about trying out these mechanisms. And I think, just to emphasize an obvious point, the second thing is that these institutions have to be visibly robust, both in terms of who's appointed to them and the support and backing that they get from the institution to make them uh, robust uh, as institutions. So that's the second thing, and free from influence and genuinely independent and capable of, of, of acting in accordance with the terms of, uh, of the treaty. And um, the, uh, the, the third is that, you know, the, the threat of sovereignty still runs very strongly, uh, and we shouldn't forget that. And we've had examples, Sadek among them, where there are very great commitments that are made at a treaty level, and then there are actually all kinds of commitments that turn out to undermine the very commitments that are made at the treaty level. That's not the ambition. Clearly, that's not how people have gone into this agreement. But we need to recognize that there is skepticism, caution, and a degree of unfamiliarity. And much of that uh, can undermine uh, the efficacy of the system. I think what it requires is that particularly among the big trade actors, if the WTO model is anything to go by, two things have to happen. One, the significant trading uh, countries within and under the agreement must use the mechanisms to, as it were, pave the way. That's what happened with the WTO. The big trading countries use the system. And then one's got to make sure that there's proper facilitation to make sure that smaller countries think they're getting a fair shake at these institutions to make sure that they've got the support uh, that they need in order to use the mechanism so that the rule of law aspects of this help the small as well as the, bi as well as the big. Getting all of that right in the right way is not easy to do, uh, but that, that I think, uh, those I think are the lessons to be drawn from the WTO, but Johan will also be able to help us on that. So then maybe just to end off, um, Johan, we have eight regional economic communities in Africa who are also under this umbrella of the AFCFTA. They have all over the years made their own approaches to dispute resolution. 
Um, any lessons you think that the AFC FTA should learn from these regional bodies? And let me open that to the panel. It'll be the last thing that we will discuss. Any lessons you think we can learn from our regional bodies? Yes. Um, the, the two most active ones in, in dispute settlement have been the East African Community Court and the Comesa Court. So both of them have courts looking at it. Now, what's also interesting is that in the EAC Court of Justice, um, you bring a claim, you just need to be a resident of one of the member states, and then you can bring a claim to the court. And then in a scheduling conference, after uh, you've uh, explained what your case is all about, the judge will then look at it, and if he or she thinks that uh, it can be disposed easily, then he uh, refers it to arbitration, or he decides or she decides that it should go for arbitration. And then that judge is then the arbitrator, mm -hmm. and the case has to be disposed of within 21 days. Because as we know with business, uh, time is of the essence, so you, you need to move quick. Now, okay, 21 days might be, might be uh, too, too quick. So that's, that's quite an interesting sort of way of combining the two. Now, I can see a hybrid that the judge might decide that, okay, let's go for arbitration, and that's mandatory. Um, and also in, uh, in, um, in Comesa, you have a cooling off period before you submit your uh, notice of intention to start a dispute. You have six months period where you, uh, sort of the cooling off period, and then you're forced to consider alternative dispute settlement mechanism, uh, which includes then arbitration. Mm -hmm. And then also there are rules how you uh, appoint your arbitra arbitrators. So th I think there are uh, lessons to be learned from, from, from these two institutions. Excellent. Any comments, Nelly? Thanks. Uh, two brief points. One is that uh, the state parties to the agreement must comply with the orders of the tribunal. Otherwise, the system won't function. And that's a key lesson from the regional bodies, particularly East Africa, as you have spoken. Uh, but secondly, the capacity of the state to make use of the instruments, uh, as well as the political will, those are, are critical. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, maybe not just regional, but we've seen, uh, for instance, in places like Dubai and Abu Dhabi, there are free trade areas. And what's interesting about the dispute resolution mechanism that's been adopted in those areas uh, is that it draws jurists and, and others who specialize in commercial matters uh, from all over the world for dispute resolution mechanism purposes. Uh, and and it, it seems to me that um, in the context of the AFC-FTA, there's really, really nothing to fear for any of the African states. Because on the one hand, they, they, uh, the AFC-FTA says that um, state bodies acting as a plenary can determine interpretation of the agreement. Now, that's an important power, and that's a power that's always vested in them politically. Uh, secondly, they can always change the dispute resolution mechanism going forward if they see that something is not working. But I think the sooner an effective dispute resolution mechanism that has legitimacy and, and shows itself to be independent is instituted, the sooner we'll see the, this program uh, rolled out. I mean, we really, delay is not in anyone's interest. Thank you, Vlad. Excellent. I think we should stop there. <laughs> There's much to think about. As you've heard, this is an incredibly complicated topic. Um, my best wishes to those members who are part of the AFCFTA and are working on putting this annex together. Um, and I look forward to seeing what they come up with. There's obviously an excellent opportunity here for a dispute resolution mechanism which meets the bespoke kind of needs and nature of the continent and to grow its trade and investment to be put in place. 
I just want to thank my excellent and knowledgeable panelists. I really appreciate all the work that you've put into this. Thank you. I'm not sure what's next. <laughs> I think it's lunchtime, if I'm correct. Oh, here we go. Excellent. Thank you. Oh. Afternoon again. I hope you've had a very interesting morning, very insightful. Uh, before we break for lunch, allow me to please take a moment just to thank our speakers uh, lunch sponsor, Stone Turn, and say a word or two about who Stone Turn really is. Stone Turn is a, is a multidisciplinary uh, team that, uh, I need to read this carefully, I think I'm, I'm hungry, so I'll, I'll take my time. It's lunch time after all, the sugar levels have dropped. Stone Turn a global professional services firm, works with law firms, corporations, and government agencies in solving the most complex and consequential business issues. Stone 10 has earned the trust of clients and regulators worldwide by deploying multidisciplinary teams of industry leaders to provide unique expertise with forensics and investigations. Founded in 2004, Stone 10 operates from offices in five continents. And here in South Africa, Stone 10 has a presence in Gauteng and in the Western Cape. In as far as uh, arbitration is concerned, Stone 10 uh, sets up teams of experts for claimants and respondents in disputes across a variety of international fora. We, and they, Stoneton has extensive experience providing quantum damages calculations, analysis, and investigative expert witness services in complex international arbitrations. So ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, a round of applause please to our generous sponsor. And thank you. May we now break for lunch, 45 minutes, please. The ushers will show you where to go. Thank you.
moderator of the next panel, so I believe it is incumbent on me to request everyone to please rejoin us in the main venue and to take your seats, and we'll be getting started shortly. Is there someone who could please help us with the seated mics because we need, will need to be using those. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, cool. Thank you. Give you this one. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back from lunch. It's always difficult following a Weber session but I'm glad that we've had the intervening lunch period and that I have a panel that's as distinguished as the previous one to assist me in making this an easy panel for me. Um, we're going to be talking today about the Africanization of arbitration and we're going to be looking at perspectives from practitioners, counsel and arbitrators. And really what we're looking to do is get perspectives from across the continent as to how we have got to where we are in Africa at this point um, in the Africanization journey, and then we'll also be looking at some perspectives on the future and how we see things unfolding as we look towards the next steps in successfully implementing the Africanization of arbitration on the, con on the continent. Um, I suppose the important first part for us to really understand is what does it mean to Africanize arb arbitration? And when I was sort of researching this topic and looking into what we could discuss today, I came across a quote from Francis Olegge, who is a member of the faculty of the Nigerian Institute of Chartered Arbitrators. And he had the following to say in, a, in, a, in an essay that he wrote a couple of years ago. He said, he said, to Africanize means to make African, or in a broader sense, to succeed in making African through interests and perspectives that influence the system. Africanization of international dispute resolution therefore implies that international dispute resolution should take Africa's priorities and aspirations into consideration. And we must remember that an international dispute resolution system can only be international if founded on cooperation and compromise. So having defined the concept, he says that it's important to examine it as a movement that has continuously influenced international dispute resolution. So for purposes of today's panel discussion, I'd like us to have a look at that through the lens that I've already outlined, sort of from a you know, um, purpose of looking at the past 10 years and how we've got to where we are today, and then having a prospect of looking to the future. All right, 
in doing that, um, I have a, a panel here with me today who um, comes from across the continent and abroad who will really be able to assist us in unpacking what, what Africanizing arbitration means on, on our continent. And from various different perspectives, they'll be able to talk to it in their roles as practitioners, arbitrators, and as counsel. So to my very far left, we have Joed Babamia from South Africa. He's an advocate at the, South at, the, at the bar in South Africa in Johannesburg, and he regularly advises clients in banking, construction, insurance, mining, and telecommunications related matters. His private practice is largely an arbitration-based practice that ranges from general contract, delict, and enrichment matters to advising and representing clients in respect of various regulatory matters. He's acted extensively as an adjudicator in construction disputes, as an arbitrator in construction and commercial disputes, and also as a mediator. Uh, Jawed is also on the panel of arbitrators for AFSA, and he's also acted as a judge in the High Court of South Africa in Johannesburg. Then next to Jawed, we have my colleague Cecil Kuyo, who is from our office Nairobi um, in Kenya, and he is an advocate at the Kenyan Bar and a partner in the disputes team of our Bowman's office there. Cecil has more than 15 years of post-qualification experience and considerable knowledge and expertise in commercial litigation practice. Um, he routinely sits as an arbitrator in domestic arbitrations under appointment by the Chartered Institutes of Arbitrators through the Kenyan branch, and he's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Then, moving across to West Africa, we have Mr. Festus Onia from a best friend firm of ours, Udo Doma and Belo Osaji in Nigeria and Festus specializes in commercial litigation, arbitration, and international arbitration. His other specializations include labor and employment law, as well as tax litigation. Festus has acted as counsel in several high-value arbitrations, including under the ICC arbitration rules, and very recently, he was appointed as the sole arbitrator to uh, oversee a matter under the ICC arbitration rules. And then last but not least, on my left, we have Natasha Peter, who was born in Africa but has um, since moved abroad and is a dual qualified English barrister and French avocat. She's a partner in the Paris office of Trinity International and she has over 20 years experience in international arbitration, litigation and dispute resolution management. Uh, Natasha also works extensively in Anglophone and Francophone Africa and so I think she'll have some good insights for us into the topic that we're talking about today. So, as I mentioned, and as a starting point, we'd like to look at the, uh, the Africanization successes that have occurred over the past 10 years. Really, we're looking at how Africa has taken ownership of arbitration on the continent and, and, and sort of stories of success that we've seen developing over time. So, as a starting point here in South Africa, I'd like to ask Jawaid to, to assist us with some, some input and views particularly in relation to the promulgation of the International Arbitration Act that took place in December 2017. In the short time since that legislation has been promulgated, we've seen various improvements and changes in the ownership of arbitration. And so, in your role, Joed, as an arbitrator and as counsel, could you perhaps please give us some examples of the manner in which these improvements has taken place? And specifically, how would you characterize this, the success of our international legislation in providing parties with comfort that their disputes and arbitration processes are in safe hands in the region and that we can accordingly now consider the matters to have been Africanized? Uh, good afternoon, all. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, your question raises three important issues, uh, it would seem. The first is, what meaning do we give to the term Africanize in the context of international arbitrations. And, and I know that's a question that several of our colleagues asked me just before I actually got up over here. Uh, I told them very briefly that it really means to sit in the bush, watch the big five, and settle your disputes. <laughs> but that's not particularly where we, we headed. The second issue that it raises is, has the objective, whatever meaning we give to Africanizing arbitrations, been achieved in South Africa? And then the third issue, for purposes of answering your question, really speaks to the extent to which the International Arbitration Act contributes or contributed towards us achieving that objective. If I can quite briefly unpack the first issue on what does it mean. 
Well, we, we at our nascent stages insofar as international arbitrations are concerned, and that's relatively speaking. So when we try to give meaning to what, it, what we want to achieve for purposes of Africanizing arbitrations in the international context, what we're really seeking to achieve is inclusiveness. We're seeking to be relevant on the international stage. We're seeking for our pool of resources ranging from arbitrators to lawyers to experts and the like being included in respect of international disputes. Of course, if we successfully manage that, then in time to come I have no doubt that we would have far loftier aspirations, aspirations such as creating templates and being trailblazers so that the international community can follow, but it's baby steps. Moving over to the second issue, to what extent we have managed to achieve that objective over the last number of years. I must say, several years ago, when I was pretty much a baby junior at the Johannesburg Bar, um, it, it seemed fairly dim, from my perspective at any rate, as to where we were in respect of the international stage. There were few of our colleagues scattered here and there that were instrumental. But, like I said, that was far and few between. What you would get from time to time is a situation whereby a dispute which emanated in South Africa with multinationals, with the, the arbitration clause requiring the choice of law to be South Africa, the seat of the arbitration to be Johannesburg or anywhere else in South Africa, then effectively being hijacked for want of a more appropriate or better term. And the entire arbitration would then be run overseas with a, an overseas panel of arbitrators, an overseas set of lawyers, etc. The role that we would end up playing would be a very limited role. It would be uh, along the lines of that which was educating the arbitrators about South African law, principles of South African law whether it's interpretation of contract or any other type of law that was applicable to the dispute. But that has changed over the years. That has changed over the years in the sense that you would see not only from experiences of counsel, but also from surveys that have been conducted. You would see, for instance, surveys that were conducted by the ICC that goes back to 2019 that shows a steady increase in terms of the number of parties that are involved in sub-Saharan Africa uh, in respect of international arbitrations. You would find that from the LCIA as well. And you would also find those type of statistics from the Oriental Studies uh, or the Africa Survey Review. And while those are not seismic shifts, they are nevertheless promising shifts. And that ultimately then leads to the question that you've asked. Has the International Arbitration Act contributed towards that? And my answer is no, it hasn't. It's a minor contributing factor, and it's minor in this sense. The International Arbitration Act, which came into effect some six years ago or so, it has a good provision in terms of what the model law should be, and that's the UNCTRAL rules, which is applied by over 70 member states internationally. It also has some good provisions pertaining to the enforcement, and I take it no higher than good provisions. But that's not the reason for the steady increase that we see in respect of our participation in international arbitrations. I think the reason is that we have been making earnest attempts at harvesting the correct reputation for our institutions in South Africa and generally in respect of the continent. We are making earnest attempts in ensuring that we have top-class arbitrators that are presiding over the matters. We are making earnest attempts in ensuring that the arbitration centers are properly geared in terms of their facilities, in terms of their rules, in terms of their management and the like. And the experts out there, leaving aside the lawyers, are also making earnest attempts in ensuring that they are getting noticed. So the steady increase, and like I said earlier on, it's, it's not seismic, but it is promising. But this steady increase arises from a collaborative effort from all stakeholders. Yes, more is required, but it is promising nonetheless.
Thanks very much, Joette. I think certainly the question of relevance is, is one that resonates, and I think, um, you know, we're looking at this room today where there's so many of us here and an event like this is, you know, finally taking place, I think is a testament to that, and it's part of the, the, the small steps progress that you mentioned is being made, so agree with that point in, entirely. Cecil, following then from that, um, it would be interesting to hear from your perspective in East Africa as to how the arbitration landscape has developed and improved in Kenya over the course of the past five to 10 years, uh, particularly with reference to how we've seen your, your cases and jurisprudence unfolding. Um, and sort of following on from Joey's point about the involvement of practitioners in their own matters, how has the reliance on international law firms um, diminished or, or, or improved in order to deal with briefing patterns and the like? Thanks, thanks, John. Um, I think, let me start from the perspective of um, our uh, Kenyan domestic uh, arbitration landscape. I think, you know, generally there's been a, an uptick, uptick of, 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 of uh, arbitration, more so because of the support of our judiciary. I think uh, previously, maybe 10 years before, you know, the judiciary used to be considered as uh, almost obstructive. But I think, I think with, with the, the concerted efforts, I think, of our Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, of which I know my chairman is somewhere here, together with my vice chairman. You know, they've been, they've been taking active efforts even to train our commercial judges so that the decisions and jurisprudence that you see from our courts is more or less facilitative rather than obstructive as it had been before. Um, another, I think, key development is the Nairobi Center of International Arbitration. Again, coincidentally, about 10 years old, you know, now. Um, of course, there are arguments, uh, you know, about, about its independence. Uh, but I think we, we are seeing a general, a general improvement, I think, in the landscape because most government institutions are now insisting that uh, for most projects, they must embed, you know, the NCIA as, as, as the default body, you know, for dispute resolution. Um, I think another innovative feature that I've seen, I think, in the past sort of 10 to 15 years, we, we, we had a, 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 a Chief Justice Emeritus, Professor Gwidi Mwigai, who came up with a model that uh, he would want to reduce reliance on ILFs. So what he insisted is that he, would wanted, he wanted to stock up the capacity of, of state councils. Uh, he insisted that, uh, that all matters must be, you know, the state councils must, must do the heavy lifting together with the cooperation of local firms um, and only had maybe KCs, you know, to lead the matter. So ultimately it became cheaper for the government, you know, in, in, terms, of, uh, in terms of mandates. But I would say even in terms of understanding uh, the nuances of, of, of matters within our jurisdiction became better. Um, um, I, I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm at liberty to speak about sort of empirically the number of successes that we've had in the International Arbitration Front, you know, maybe four or so cases have been determined in the government's favor just simply because of that move to ensure that uh, there's, a, there's a local hand towards matters that the government, you know, instructs. instructs, uh, uh, instructs. I think also maybe a feature that uh, I see interesting um, um, in the last maybe 10 or so years is, is the stature of, of, of arbitrators. Um, we, we uh, as a nation, I think, pride ourselves in terms of our training. Um, and, I, and I see, um, in addition to being, uh, to being placed um, on, on the database of you know, the, the international bodies, the L LCIA, uh, exit panels, we are seeing more and more Kenyans you know, being appointed to actually preside upon on, on panels. So there's been a considerable step and move towards, towards development. Um, we are not there yet, definitely, but, but I see hope. You know, I see, I see progress, and uh, I think I can only say that the future is, is bright. Great, thank you. I think certainly it sounds like the right kind of progress has been made to take ownership, and as you say, it's probably a road that needs to continue to be traveled, but at least we're seeing the signs of that starting off. The other point that was interesting me, to me was, as you say, the support of the judiciary is quite important. And I think it resonates with a point that Lisa Bosman made earlier today um, about enforcement of awards and, and 
you know, parties wanting to make sure that they're in a jurisdiction where they're comfortable, that their award will be enforceable. So that certainly is encouraging to hear. Festus, moving to, to West Africa and to Nigeria in particular, um, understand that Nigeria has taken significant steps to entrench its uh, domestic arbitration profile within Nigeria, and that practitioners have made a great effort to grow and protect the local, local arbitration community. So how successful would you characterize these developments to have been, and are you able to comment on Nigeria's ability to demonstrate to the rest of Africa how to go about Africanizing arbitration and taking ownership of dispute resolution? And in particular, are you able to draw on distinctions between how Nigeria compares to similar jurisdictions in West Africa? Thank you, Jonathan, and uh, let me also thank the organizers of this conference and Bowman for inviting me. I think that um, um, you know, when you look at Nigeria, Nigeria has a very large pool of uh, international commercial arbitrators, has a very large pool of uh, competent, um, highly regarded, highly qualified arbitrators. And I think this is in part as a result of the you know, efforts of the various arbitration organizations and bodies we have in Nigeria. We have, uh, for instance, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. And uh, when, just before we came on stage, I was having a conversation with Cecil and I was surprised to learn that we have about three branches of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in Nigeria. We have one in Lagos, Port Harcourt, and in Abuja. Uh, we also have the Nigerian Institute of Chartered Arbitrators. We have uh, uh, the National Committee of the ICC. We have the um, Maritime Arbitrators Association, Lagos uh, Court of Arbitration, the Regional, Lagos Regional Center for National Commercial Arbitration, and uh, just to mention a few. So uh, these organizations, organizations and associations, through train, uh, uh, training, seminars, and conferences, have been able to build capacity amongst Nigerian arbitrators, uh, lawyers, even judges. Most judges actually take the membership courses in, in the hope that when they retire, they will, they will, they will, they will, they will take up arbitration job. Uh, so if, uh, and I should also mention that Nigeria plays an active role on, uh, you know, in the ICC. Uh, in 2012, so in 2002, when the ICC refreshed its uh, Commission on Arbitration and ADR, Nigeria uh, um, sent uh, 35 delegates to that commission, and as you know, the ICC commission uh, is the think tank for the ICC that formulates policies, engages in several projects. So in terms of, I mean, if you, if you think about Africanization in terms of capacity building, I, I would say that yes, there is, that it has succeeded in Nigeria, we have built capacity, built out capacity. We have a number of uh, arbitrators in Nigeria who are competent, who can handle highly complex, uh, real international disputes. Um, but as a lawyer who also practices as arbitrator and also as a litigator, um, I, I, I find that despite the availability of a large pool of competence, I mean, competent arbitrators in Nigeria, you see have a number of arbitrations coming out of Nigerian projects, uh, uh, large-scale projects, oil and gas, energy, being arbitrated in foreign jurisdictions, notably in London, in Paris, and, and in other places. So the question is, how come, uh, despite the availability of skills of, comp of competent arbitrators, you see have uh, African projects, African uh, disputes arising out of Africa being arbitrated in foreign, uh, foreign seats. And it is in that uh, context that I, I think that the idea of Africanization has not uh, you know, been achieved. Um, I, I have seen some writers about, a, about movement and campaign to Africanize arbitration, and I do not think that Africanizing arbitration in the sense of having disputes arising from Africa, being determined in Africa, is not something that will have to be, that will be achieved by uh, agitation or a movement. It's something that has to be achieved by deliberate efforts and policies by the different African uh, states and governments that, to make their respective jurisdictions attractive as seats of arbitration. Uh, I do think that one thing that African states will have to do 
to inspire confidence of commercial users in their, in their respective jurisdictions at seats of arbitration is to ensure that their judicial system is efficient because there are quite a number of touch points between arbitration and, 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 uh, and uh, the judiciary. And so if, for instance, you, you, you want to go to court to seek an interim measure or to enforce an award or to challenge an award, you have to be confident that you are choosing a seat that has uh, an efficient legal system. In terms of being supportive of arbitration, I, I, I think that most jurisdictions have supportive judiciary that are arbitration friendly. But when you, 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 uh, you find out how long it takes to conclude litigation arising from arbitration, that might not be as efficient. And when you look at jurisdictions like the London, or Singapore, or Paris, one factor that is common is that in addition to having a modern arbitration law, those jurisdictions also have very efficient uh, uh, judiciary that you know, come to the aid of arbitration in a quick and a speedy manner. Um, I, I hope we'll have time so I can tell you about the recent Nigerian arbitration law that was passed last year and the provisions that are contained in that law to ensure that arbitration matters are fast-tracked through the courts in Nigeria. Thank you. Thanks, Festus. <clears throat> I suppose the question of capacity building and ensuring that the jurisdictions are attractive seats is something that also is something that needs to be looked at for a future-looking aspect. So when we get to part two of the, of the questions, we might delve deeper into that as well. Natasha, then I suppose it can be taken for granted that the Africanization paradigm shift and the success of African practitioners taking ownership of arbitration on the, con on the continent uh, can have various impacts, both intended and unintended, on how arbitration work is perceived and allocated. Uh, so from your perspective as a pr practitioner and as an arbitrator who was born in Africa but is now based in Europe and, and, and operates largely from Europe, how has the successful shift of work towards the, comp the continent changed the approach of foreign practitioners uh, and arbitrators in this field? And have you seen an increased collaboration and interaction in the international dispute resolution arena? Well, thanks very much, Jonathan. And thanks also for inviting me to speak on the panel. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, there are, I think there are many, many ways to answer that question, but let me try maybe a personal one from the point of view of someone who's qualified in England and France, but from South Africa. And, um, I think what it does is it really highlights the creative tensions and the, the synergies um, that arise from the various African legal traditions. And obviously, from my point of view, what I see most is the common and civil law heritage, um, but that's sitting alongside so many other things, Roman Dutch law here, Portuguese, um, obviously African customary laws, um, and then the, the various initiatives to modernize and Africanize these heritage legal systems. Um, and I think where parties to an arbitration are spanning some or all of these divides, um, it becomes complicated because it creates mismatches in expectation amongst the parties. Um, and I'm thinking of things, you know, ranging from document disclosure to witness handling to more substantive points like, you know, how, how does the arbitrator deal with the question of good faith in the contract or force majeure in the contract? Um, and I think one of the most interesting things for me anyway, practicing in Africa, is really seeing how these ideas and expectations derived from all the various legal cultures confront each other and how they're resolved and how an arbitrator manages really to build confidence in the parties that there is a fair procedure that will take place. And because I think that's absolutely crucial to the legitimacy of the arbitration process itself. Um, the parties need to have confidence in the procedure in order to have confidence in the award. And they need to have confidence in the award in order for the losing party to hopefully pay voluntarily um, so I think that it also has a broader impact, this legitimacy question, um, because in particular, one often sees arbitrations which have come about because either one or both of the parties is not entirely happy uh, with going before the local courts. 
And in those circumstances, I think arbitration does have a real role to play in terms of upholding the rule of law um, and in terms of promoting access to justice. So I think what is really, really necessary in those circumstances is to have a tribunal that can win that kind of legitimacy. And the only way it can do that is by really having a deep understanding of the legal traditions um, and the backgrounds of the parties and the council that are appearing before that tribunal. On the other hand, from a council's perspective, uh, this is equally important because you need to have an understanding of your opposing party um, and how best to combat their case, and often how best to combat their case in the eyes of an arbitrator that is themselves from a different legal tradition. So I think it's this uh, flexible and culturally sensitive approach uh, that's one of the biggest contributors that the Africanization of arbitration uh, is able to make to the international arbitration community. Um, and on your second question, are we seeing increased collaboration and cooperation between European and African practitioners? Absolutely, yes, I certainly think so. Um, and I was just at Paris Arbitration Week a couple of weeks ago. I counted no less than 10 events with an African theme. So it's something that's important to people. It's something that people are talking about. Um, I also think, uh, and maybe this is just my perspective once again, having moved from a large law firm to a boutique law firm, I think that European law firms and American law firms are getting better at working in collaboration uh, with African law firms. Um, and I was happy that Jouade also agrees with this. I think uh, gone, gone are the days when a European law firm will take responsibility for saying, oh, it's a common law system, I know that, I'm comfortable with it, or it's a civil law system. I think there's a real move towards working with uh, a co-counsel as a real genuine equal partner. So just coming back to my first point about different legal cultures, I think there's a huge advantage in this kind of collaboration which does go beyond getting the job done in the individual case. And that is that one of the beauties of arbitration is really its flexibility and its ability to tailor itself to the facts of the individual case and the needs of the individual parties. And how are you going to get this flexibility if you don't have a toolkit of procedural ideas and substantive ideas uh, that you can deploy and tailor to the individual case. And I think you really develop this by working across cultures and by seeing these tools deployed by someone uh, who has that tool as part of their legal culture and seeing them deployed expertly. Um, so I think one of the best ways of developing that toolkit is through this collaboration and exchange. Thank you, Natasha. Yeah, I suppose an important consideration to keep in mind is also the fact that in the, in, the, in the Africanization sort of discussion, um, it's not the ability of taking ownership to the exclusion of others, but the fact that, as you say, the flexibility of arbitration is key and collaboration with others is sometimes the ideal way of getting the job done the, the best way and maybe the most efficient and effective way. Thank you. All right, so, so we've looked at sort of how we've got to where we are today and um, sort of how we think Africanization of arbitration has occurred on the continent over the last few years. And I suppose more important than that is where to from now. And the, the, the question that follows is what the future of African arbitration will be and how we continue with these Africanization efforts in a sustainable and, and logical way going forward. So just to, to go back to you, Jawade, the capacity to deal with international disputes doesn't often escape conversations around the Africanization of international arbitrations and perhaps the misconceived conclusion that Africa is not conducive for such dispute resolution. I think based on the discussion we've had already today, we see that that's definitely a myth that's in the process of being dispelled, if it hasn't already. Um, so while that's the case, I think we, we've all accepted that there's still a lot of work to be done in order to ensure that Africa continues to develop and maintain a reputation for possessing the competency to compete in this arena. Um, so in terms of a, a continent that's now seeking to attract an array of investors, what are your views as an arbitrator 
as to how Africa will ensure that disputes concerning its affairs are resolved in Africa by African arbitrators and in line with principles underlining Africanization. Jonathan, the key term that it seems we all have employed is making Africa attractive. But one thing that we've got to understand is that alternative dispute resolution platforms don't exist in isolation or in a vacuum. It, to make your alternative dispute resolution in any country or on any continent attractive, that requires a shared commitment towards achieving that goal by a variety of stakeholders. Now, of course, this is not a complete list, but the key stakeholders that must be involved in a process like this are government, the judiciary, practitioners, and the arbitration centers. Let me briefly deal with each of those. It's important to get the buy-in from government right at the outset, but not in respect of just ADRs. What government has to do is that it's got to make sure that it presents itself as an attractive destination for multinationals to visit, including in respect of arbitrations. It does that by showing its commitment to the rule of law. It does that by appropriate policies that it adopts insofar as ADRs, business, investment, and the like are concerned. It does that by the type of laws that it promulgates ultimately. Insofar as the judiciary's responsibility is concerned, remember, there, there isn't really a competition between the judiciary on the one hand and arbitrations on the other hand, but the judiciary plays an important role in informing whether arbitrations are sustainable on the continent. We've got to have a judiciary that makes pronouncement of laws that are clear, that are certain, and that are palatable and understandable by the foreign community. In the absence of that participation by the judiciary, it becomes difficult for multinationals to have South African law as the choice of law, notwithstanding the fact that a dispute may emanate from South Africa. Insofar as practitioners are concerned, practitioners need to move away from the formalism uh, and the rigors of court processes, which we are very much accustomed to, and understand that arbitrations remain fair, but they are efficient. They remain transparent, and they also ensure fairness. One of the criticisms in the African uh, Arbitration Survey of 2020 was the fact that this continent in particular suffers from the formalism of its court rules and its court processes, which makes it quite unpalatable for people to, to want to invest in arbitrating on the continent. So while we may have the rules, we shouldn't transform those rules into the same mode that we do when it comes to the court rules. And then finally, insofar as arbitration centers are concerned, we've got to ensure that our arbitration centers have the state-of-the-art facilities, have excellent management insofar as the administration of those arbitrations are concerned. And most importantly, which I, I leave for last, is that we've got to take the lead insofar as our rules are concerned. Uh, the rules are important because they inform parties whether they should be arbitrating on the continent and particularly in South Africa. They inform parties whether there is uh, way too much cost involved in arbitrating in South Africa, way too much time spent in arbitrating in South Africa, way too much arduity in so far as arbitrating in South Africa and the rest of the continent is concerned. So, so my, my take home advice really would be a shared commitment. It doesn't have to be a, a witting collaboration, but a shared commitment to these ideals to really, in, to, to really in, improve in all spheres. Thanks, Jawaid. I think those are all points well made and definitely some good food for thought. Um, Cecil, I think it's become undeniable that we also, as we move forward, um, have introduced a new generation of arbitrators and arbitration practitioners uh, across the continent of Africa. And many of these people have an immense passion to pursue arbitration and to make it a success for Africa. And these arbitrators and practitioners 
think and act differently to their predecessors on the basis of their uh, economic positions, their interactions with current affairs, various trends and developments, as well as you know, modernization and the, the increased use of um, you know, technology aimed at improving the efficiency and the expediency of the dispute resolution process. So assuming that the Africanization narrative is a matter of fact, what values in international arbitration do you think should inform the continuation of such um, attempts at the narrative? And, and are you able to draw on your experience as a practitioner in Kenya, um, as well as a partner of our firm you know, that has a footprint across Africa, to, to, to comment on those points? Thanks, Thanks John. Um, I think, I, think I, have, I have like three values that I think we should, we should extol. Uh, number one is on the bit on excellence. I, I think we, 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 are, we share a room here with, with excellent uh, practitioners, just drilling down on practitioners. We shouldn't be afraid of showcasing you know, our excellence. I, I was happy, I think, in the morning, um, I think the chairman or, or maybe the president of AFSA was talking about empirical data from AFSA and the number of awards either that have been that have been challenged, I think I think it was it was quite low. I, I think we shouldn't be afraid of speaking about our success stories, either as institutions or, or uh, 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 from this continent, because I think we have a lot uh, that is going 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 well for us. Um, um, in terms of also showcase. Um, you know, we, we are attending the inaugural, you know, Johannesburg Arbitration Week. We, we had our own Nairobi edition um, two, two years ago, and we are having one, I think, this week. I think Lagos is organizing for one um, this, this coming, this coming, few, this coming new, uh, few months. We shouldn't be afraid of, 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 of showcasing this, this ability that we have, you know, from, from a practitioner's point of view. I think number two that is most important and usually is an elephant in the room with regards to matters in our continent is uh, integrity. Um, um, we've had a running discussion from our, from our domestic, uh, from the domestic front about you know, um, the integrity of, of arbitration processes. But I think this should be a given you know, for, for us as practitioners especially that, that it, sh it, should be, it should be quite normalized that, that, that uh, the questions about integrity should not even arise, um, either for arbitrations that are, that, are, that are presided over by, by us, you know, arbitrators from this continent. I think third and last point for me is on proactivity. Um, there are a number of best practices that, are, that, are, that we can adopt for, from the international um, arbitration community. Uh, and I think there is scope and opportunity to translate those best practices into our domestic front. I think most of the time we consider those are things that are done you know, internationally you know, by the LCIs and ICCs of this country, but we don't translate that into your, your, your domestic small you know, commercial arbitration matter that you're presiding over. There is scope and opportunity even to uh, translate those, those tech developments you know, into, into our arbitrations. Um, I think for, for maybe the younger uh, practitioners, you know, there's all, always opportunity for involvement in, 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 in summer schools. There's always opportunity for involvement in, 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 in being thought leaders, in, 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 in preparing articles, you know, that can be read in journals internationally. I, I think there's great opportunity for us, you know, to be at the forefront, to participate rather than maybe to, 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 to sit back and grouch and say that we are not, we are not being involved. Um, um, you know, there's great opportunity, I think, to invest in our people. Um, and, and our people have shown great verve, you know, in being involved in this, in this agenda. So, yeah, let's, let's get going. Great. Thank you. Definitely promotion and participation, I think, is key. And um, sort of the education and, and, and upbringing of, of junior practitioners is also great. So... I think we're all also looking forward to the young AFSA moot later today, which will showcase that as well. Festus, from the perspective of Nigeria, I understand that the new Arbitration Act came into force in Nigeria about a year ago. Um, and often we see new legislation of this nature being aimed at sort of closing gaps or addressing inconsistencies in the framework or the practice uh, over time. And so, are you able to share your thoughts with us, please, on how Nigeria's new legislation is possibly going to assist in further progressing 
the Africanization agenda, and do you have any anecdotes or stories from practice in the last year that sort of shows how practitioners are already implementing this to their advantage? Yes, you are correct, Jonathan. We, uh, a new Abization Act took effect in Nigeria in May 2023, uh, replacing the previous law that had regulated arbitration for well over 35 years. And as you also rightly noted, that law followed the usual trend of filling gaps and addressing uh, deficiencies observed in the operation of the former law. So this, this law uh, contains uh, a number of new uh, provisions that dealt with the inefficiencies uh, we noticed in the previous arbitration and mediation law uh, act and uh, contains uh, some wholly new or innovative provisions. For instance, uh, it, it includes uh, or contains a provision on award review tribunal, which uh, parties can opt in and make use of rather than going straight to the court when they want to challenge an award. So parties could decide to appoint a second review tribunal to review an award. It contains uh, all the provisions that you would expect to see in a modern arbitration law, joinder of parties, consolidation of proceedings, emergency arbitrations, more elaborate uh, provisions on uh, the powers of both the court and the tribunal to grant interim measures. I mean, uh, you can name them. But there is an aspect of that law which uh, hasn't uh, received um, um, you know, sufficient uh, comments from the reviews that I've seen. Uh, and that aspect is that that law also contains a set of rules that will henceforth govern arbitration matters in Nigerian courts. So beyond the very beautiful uh, substantive provision that I just mentioned, it contains a set, a set of rules as Schedule 3 to the law that will govern any arbitration claim in the High Court or arbitration appeals in the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court. And the aim of that set of rules is to ensure that uh, arbitration matters are fast-tracked. For instance, it provides that any arbitration claim in the High Court will have to be listed for its first hearing 30 days after, it's been, after the proceedings have been served on the, on, on, the, on the adverse party. And where that adverse party is a, for, is a, is in, is a resident abroad, then the, hearing, the first hearing must take place 40 days after the proceedings have been served. Now, the significance of this is that uh, this is a country where a new suit may not be assigned to a court by the chief judge or the administrative judge of the court in two or three months. And, and I'm talking about assigned administrative assignment, not uh, coming up for hearing in the court for the first time. But this law now requires that any arbitration claims must be in the high court must be listed for hearing 30 days or 40 days, as the case may be. To me, as, as a litigator, that is also quite significant because it shows that the, the, I mean, if these rules are properly implemented, that they, you know, showcases Nigeria as a jurisdiction that is ready for business in terms of efficiency of the judicial system. Now, in, in relation to any appeals arising from arbitration matters, the, the, the rules provide that when you are filing your notice of appeal, you can, at the same time, compile your records of appeal and file the records of appeal together with the notice of appeal. Now, the significance of this is that under the rules of, under the appellate rules currently, you, you, it takes between 90 days, between 60 days and 90 days to compile record of appeal from the lower court to the court of appeal. But here we have a law that requires you to file it together with the notice of appeal or in any event, not more than 14 days after the notice of appeal has been filed. It goes on to provide that if there is any breach of, these, of the timelines provided in the law, then in relation to any application to set aside an award or to, or to set aside or challenge an interim order, then such an award shall automatically become enforceable unless otherwise ordered by the court. So I think these are very significant uh, uh, you know, provisions in the sense that if uh, properly implemented, it will significantly reduce the timelines for uh, litigating any um, 
any disputes, any arbitration disputes, whether you go to court to challenge an award or whether you go to, uh, um, to defend an award or to obtain any relief at all relating to arbitration. So uh, to that extent, I would say that the, the current law that we have is, is, is fit for purpose, is forward looking, but as you know, uh, everything depends on implementation. Uh, the law is barely one year, so I don't have uh, any uh, experiences to show in terms of, I mean, to, to share with you in terms of its implementation. But I do, I do hope that in the next uh, maybe uh, two years or, or, or thereabouts, we'll have uh, the um, we will have experiences from how that law has been applied in practice. I currently have an application at the Supreme Court where I'm asking the Supreme Court to apply this set of rules to an appeal that is pending at the Supreme Court, and I'm waiting to, to see how that pans out. Um, I, I, I think I'd like to emphasize again that, you know, uh, whether a, uh, you know, a jurisdiction is, 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 is uh, chosen or by, uh, you know, by users as a seat will depend on a number of factors, but the judiciary must be perceived to be very efficient and supportive. I do think that the current law and the rules that we have in Nigeria projects Nigeria as a country that we, uh, will, will, all things being equal, be, become um, a, a hub for arbitration in West Africa or, in fact, in the entire African region. Thank you, Festus. Very useful insights. I think we are approaching our last five minutes. I'm just going to ask Natasha one last question. Um, and we've spoken a lot about collaboration and connection, uh, particularly with non-African states. We've also spoken about capacity building. So just from your perspective, Natasha, and your role again as a foreign qualified lawyer with experience in, in, your, in Europe and, and, and arbitrations in that field, um, do you have any insights as to how non-African role players can potentially play a role in contributing towards building capacity and, and enabling African practitioners to claim ownership of the international arbitration work in their own continent? Well, thank you. I, I think it's a very good question, and it's one that one could speak for hours on, but I won't. Five um, minutes, please. <laughs> five minutes, four minutes. I, I think Cecil made some excellent points about showcasing and about capacity building, uh, and Professor Liz Bosman this morning as well made some excellent points, so I'm not going to repeat those, um, but I think there are two things that I'd like to add. And the first is, it's maybe obvious, but arbitrators are made, they're not born. Um, and I think a lot of the skills that you need to be a really good arbitrator are not the sort of things you can just read up on, they're not written down, they're interpersonal skills. They're things like dealing with a situation where one of your parties has much better legal representation than the other, for example, or where there's a really tricky question that goes to the heart of the case and you need to be able to pose that question without seeing bias towards one or other of the parties. I think the second point is that in our industry, in arbitration, uh, by comparison to most other fields of law, it really is a world that is very focused on reputation, on connections, on interpersonal relationships, and on being the part of, of the arbitration community. So I think these two factors do put an enormous responsibility on all established practitioners. Um, and I'm talking in particular about established practitioners abroad because that's your question, but I think it applies to African uh, established practitioners as well. To really support the younger generation of lawyers, to encourage them from the beginning of their careers uh, to take an interest in arbitration and to explore it. Um, and also to break down the barriers to entering to the profession. So I think we've talked a lot already about the many ways that we can do this. It starts from the very beginning and getting involved in educating students from a practitioner's perspective about arbitration. Uh, student moots are an excellent thing, I think. Um, and I know Africa and the moot is doing some great work there. Um, but also, uh, showcasing visibility is so crucial. Um, and I think there's a lot that we can do to help each other in this regard, um, giving people credit. For example, if you, if you write an article with a younger practitioner, put the name on it. Um, showing, showing people off in terms of uh, selecting them to speak on panels. Um, and 
I think it's something really that is important throughout one's career. And, uh, so in a sense, I'm talking not just to younger generation people, but to everyone. I think it takes a while to plant the seeds that will then grow into an important arbitration later on. Um, so I think we all need to find ways of making meaningful connections. And I think there's not a one-size-fits-all uh, answer to how to go about that. I think everyone needs to develop their own skills and their own interests, um, and that will contribute towards the richness of the arbitration community. Um, but one important last point, if I may, and that is that capacity building is all very well, but sometimes as an established arbitration council, the most important thing that you can do for a new entrant or a relatively new entrant into the market is just to make space at the table um, and to appoint someone new as an arbitrator. If you know someone who you find impressive, but they don't have 50 arbitrations to their name, just appoint them. I think it's as simple as that. So I, I could go on, but I'll stop there. Great. Th thank you so much, Natasha. I really appreciate it. Um, I think we've used up our allocated time, but a big thank you to my panel and for sharing all of your insights and views. I hope it's been informative for everyone who's here. I had hoped to have some time for a Q&A, but we, we don't have that now, so I'm not letting my panelists entirely off the hook. Please find them if you have a question and let them know. I'm sure they'll be willing to oblige. And thank you all for your time. Hello? Good stuff. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've reached uh, the final panel session of the day, and I've been um, politely asked to please stick, stick to time. I don't know how we do that if we're already one hour behind, but let's, let's try in any event. Um, quick introductions. I am Vian Mankis. I am a senior associate at Alan and Overy, part of the Global Disputes Practice. I specialize in uh, disputes in the energy and infrastructure sector with a focus on international arbitration and, importantly for this uh, discussion, enforcement. Um, our topic is, as you can see on the board, challenges, strategies, and practical considerations uh, in the African context in relation to enforcement. Now, I think it dovetails quite nicely with Jonathan's uh, panel immediately before this, which, which goes to the point of, of what can African, African states do, what can we as lawyers in Africa do to promote not only the, the, the um, feasibility and the attractiveness of our, of our countries as seats for arbitration, but also 
to simplify enforcement once we get to that stage in, in disputes. I'm fortunate enough to be joined by four esteemed panelists from around the globe, um, except for the man immediately to my left, who is uh, just from around the corner. But um, I'm fortunate that, that I'm not alone to, to unpack these, these topics. Um, and, and I'm going to go through, through introductions um, shortly. But if you, if you would excuse me, I want to do justice to the introductions. So I'm going to, to be led by my, by my script for this. Um, firstly, we've got Harold Rudolph to my left. He is the head of litigation and investigations and also the managing partner of Allen and Overy in Johannesburg. And he's also a member of the firm's international arbitration group. He has extensive experience in representing and advising both domestic and multinational corporate clients in a broad range of contentious matters in South Africa, Africa, and around the world. He has a truly international practice with numerous cross-border mandates in the energy, mining, and infrastructure sector. He also has extensive experience in com complex transactional and regulatory disputes involving financial institutions, including investigations, asset tracing, global recovery, and judicial commissions of inquiry. So my first question is, is there anything you cannot do? But we'll get to that shortly. Um, moving then just across to our neighboring country, uh, Zimbabwe, to the left of Gerard, we've got Daniel Tividar. Dan is a barrister qualified in England and Wales and an advocate in Zimbabwe. His main areas of practice are commercial litigation, domestic and international commercial arbitrations. He regularly sits as an arbitrator and has been appointed several times as a Zimbabwean legal expert. Next in line, all the way from Keating Chambers in the United Kingdom, we've got Abdul Jinadu. Since being called to the bar in 1995, Abdul has established a distinguished career as a barrister and arbitrator with Keating Chambers. He focuses on construction, engineering, and energy disputes, and has experience in both domestic and international arbitrations. His clientele is diverse, encompassing construction and engineering firms, government entities, corporations, public utilities, local utilities, and design professionals. He's bilingual in both English and Yorubu, and maintains significant contacts with his home country, Nigeria, which is actually where I met, met Abdul for the first time last year in Nigeria. He frequently engages in a range of energy-related matters in West Africa. Last but certainly not least on our panel, we've got Yassine Francis all the way from the Middle East. Yassine is a partner and one of my valued colleagues in the Global Disputes team, and he's based in Dubai. He specializes in international arbitration, including those relating to joint venture and shareholders disputes, as well as cross-border litigation proceedings and corporate fraud and regulatory investigations. His renowned sophisticated arbitration practice extends across the Middle East, India, Africa, and Europe. Yassine has experience of complex international disputes across a wide range of sectors. So with those introductions, I think important for us to start at the beginning. And yes, this is an enforcement panel and we'll, we'll get to enforcement in a bit. But I think a common misconception out there is, is perhaps that enforcement and the relative success of, of enforcement, whether it be of an arbitral award, adjudication award, whatever the case may be, starts when an award has been delivered. Now, while that is true to some extent, I think what is oftentimes overlooked, and particularly in the African context, is the importance of the integrity of an arbitral process, the integrity of the arbitration itself, what the parties are doing during the arbitration, because that can ultimately have detrimental effects on your enforcement prospects. And Yassine, if I can maybe start with you, I think a prime example of where this is borne out quite succinctly is the recent judgment in England and Wales where the High Court in the, in the now, I think, very famous case of Nigeria and PNID found quite, quite substantially that, that, that the integrity of the arbitration proceedings was of such a nature, it was questioned to such, a, to such an extent that an 11 billion US dollar dis, uh, uh, award couldn't be enforced. Um, can, can you maybe share a few practical practical takeaways from that case and, and key, key points? Yeah, thanks, Vian. I mean, this is a, a really extreme case, and I think, as, as Vian has flagged, it, it shows how important it is to get the arbitration set up right from the outset and how disastrous it can be if you, if you don't get that right from the outset. So, as Vian said, this was an $11 billion um, award 
in favour of PNID and it came before the English courts on enforcement, uh, a challenge to the award, and the judge went right back to the beginning of the story, right back to the contractual negotiation. The underlying contract was held to be obtained through corruption, and then through the arbitration process, there were various findings that the arbitration process has been corrupted by, by the claimant party making bribes payments to one of the government officials on the other side and th through that process the claimant was able to obtain privileged and confidential legal advice of one party which gave them a huge advantage in the arbitration and also their positioning on settlement negotiations, how much they were willing to pay, how much authorization they had at various stages. So this all came out in front of the English court and the English judge was critical of all parties involved. He was obviously very scathing about the claimant party in the arbitration, but also about the English lawyers who were involved as well. So a solicitor and a barrister were reported to the Solicitor's Regulation Authority and the Bar Standards um, Board uh, as well as a result. <coughs> he was also scathing about the respondent party, which was the state of Nigeria in this case, and said that they didn't organize themselves well enough. They didn't respond to deadlines, they didn't appear at all the hearings, they didn't invest in the arbitration from the outset. Uh, uniquely for this judgment, and this is why it's such a controversial judgment, it, uh, it has a long criticism of the tribunal in this case. So the, the judge criticized the tribunal in this case for not stepping in and raising issues and really challenging the claimant party in the arbitration. So. It's quite an unusual case of controversial, which we might come on to in terms of some of the, the impacts of some of that part of the judgment. But in terms of the takeaway, the first takeaway from this is um, African disputes, Middle Eastern disputes can be complex and they can go very badly wrong. So I won't pause for any gasps of shock and horror and surprise in, in this room. But when you're looking at these arbitrations, which are related to emerging markets in Africa in particular, when they come before the English courts, there's a very different lens which will apply to them, and especially judges who maybe are not as experienced of how, how complex these disputes can be. Um, the second uh, takeaway for me is it just highlights how getting a successful award is really just one part of the process. You can spend years to get there, but it's becoming more common in my experience, especially with more emerging markets, disputes, going all the way to arbitration for challenges to be brought. So you, I think we're very used to seeing challenges in the courts in various African states, certainly in the Middle East. I think you'll see it's, it's becoming increasingly common that you're gonna see these challenges in jurisdictions like London and Paris. And this case demonstrates there's a real willingness of the courts to delve into the real detail of the arbitration and find a way through those strict limits on challenging um, an arbitral award or going back over the merits of the disputes and public policy is obviously one of those doors which can be smashed wide open for a judge to really go back and reevaluate the merits of the dispute and this is a really good example of the English courts doing that. Um, the third takeaway is um, allegations of fraud, dishonesty, corruption, illegality. These are pretty standard in emerging markets disputes but this case demonstrates how important it is to get on top of those as early as possible and be alive to the real risks that fraud can unravel all. So after you've gone through years of negotiations, years of an arbitration, then years of challenges before the court, fraud is one of those few things that can really rip its pieces. So I think this is a really good judgment for everybody to read through. It's a great read, it's 140 pages. It reads like a, a movie script in, in places. It's a real warning uh, as to how bad things can go. Thanks, Yasin. I think such a key point and, and also matters that we've been involved in together, you know, really shows the importance of how to keep the integrity of the arbitral process intact um, and, and not only chasing the award and, and, and knowing that you can enforce that, but, but making sure that it's got its integrity behind it. So, you see, I'm, I'm going to stick to you just for a moment. Um, you, you say that fraud and dishonesty is perhaps a common, a common, a common theme. Um, I know you've been involved in quite a lot of, of matters on the continent. I mean, it, has, has it been a common thread through some of the matters that you've been involved in? Have you seen it and, and, and what, what impact did it have on those, on those cases? It, it's easier for me to think of examples of cases that I've worked on related to Africa and the Middle East which don't involve 
allegations of corruption and fraud at some level. I had, I had one fantastic experience um, last year where we had uh, an arbitration where it was, it was seated in Lagos, governed by Nigerian law, and we were working with excellent Nigerian counsel on the ground. And um, we'd gone through our opening submissions. Uh, the first witness for the claimant party went through his evidence and then suddenly started going into a monologue of allegations of fraud and corruption. And the arbitrator in that case allowed the claimant to amend their case to adopt all of these new allegations. And then suddenly we went through five days of hearing. Half an hour before the hearing ended on the, la on the Friday, it, the tribunal granted an application to adjourn the hearing and have another three-day hearing where we were addressing a completely new case which was based on allegations of fraud and corruption. Now, because this isn't our first rodeo, we had anticipated this from the outset, so we, we had prepared properly for this. We had got the best Nigerian council we could get on the ground, who were an integrated part of our team, and we were fully interchangeable in terms of how we could respond and react to these unexpected complex changes. So we were able to seamlessly move through this three-day extra arbitration dealing with a completely new case on the fly. Um, and I'm glad to say that we were successful in the end. Of course, it's gone into um, challenges in the Nigerian courts, which again is pretty, pretty standard. So that's the next phase which will keep us busy for God knows how many years. Thanks, thanks, Yasin. Yes, I, I think a couple of years is, is perhaps optimistic. But um, Abdul, if we, um, if we now move, move to you, I think we've been speaking about arbitrations, the integrity of arbitrations, the, 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 the integrity of the process of arbitration, but that, that's, not, that's not the only form of dispute resolution that, that can suffer from, from these chronic issues that we see. I mean, adjudication is another one, right? And I know it's a, it's a topic close to your heart. Um, how can we improve the DAB process and the enforcement of DAB decisions? Can you talk th to th that? Thanks, Will. Um, I think I start off by saying, as the only Nigerian on this panel, I feel duty-bound to defend the honor of my country. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the fact is that in PNID, we did not cover ourselves in glory. The Nigerian state did not behave particularly well. And I think the judgment um, in oh, uh, Mr. Justice Robert Knowles in that case is actually is, is worth a read. It's really, as Jason says, it's a really fascinating um, narrative of how things can go wrong um, on, on major projects in, in Africa generally. Um, Dealing with the um, issue that Will raised about DABs and DAABs, uh, yeah, I mean, this is challenge with arbitration week, so I feel a bit of a fraud talking about DABs and DAABs, but I think it's a closely related topic. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the construction industry, a DAB is a dispute adjudication board, and a DAAB is a dispute avoidance and adjudication board. Now, these, the, 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 these are creatures of, of contract. Um, you find them in the fitted contracts. They are very popular with the standard forms of contracts that are used by the major funders funding projects in Africa. And what they are essentially is, um, well, the, the idea behind them is that you're supposed to have a, at the, at the, at the outset, the parties agree to uh, form a tribunal, a DAB, Dispute um, Adjudication Board, usually three people, um, composition, usually the lawyer, um, as a president, they have a QS, an engineer, or however you want to compose the DAB. The idea behind DABs and DAABs is that there's recognition of the fact that in the construction industry, cash is the lifeblood of a project. And the prospect of parties warehousing disputes until the very end of a, of a project that can last two, three, four, in some cases, large infrastructure projects, even longer, was a problem. And um, in the 70s, I think it started in America and then gradually sort of found its way across um, uh, the Atlantic into projects um, across Europe and Africa. Um, the idea about DABs and DABs is that if a, a dispute arises in the course of a project, the parties can refer that dispute to the standing DAB or DAAB and get a decision from that um, body. The, critical, the, the crucial point about the DAB or DAB decision is that it is meant to be temporarily binding. As a matter of contract, the parties are obliged to comply with the decision of the DAB or DAAB. The only enforcement mechanism for that, unfortunately, is to bring a claim for breach of contract, unless 
I'll come on to this in, in, in a while, unless like in, in the UK where you have a statutory provision, statutory regime, that deals with it differently. But if you don't have a statutory regime, you're forced to enforce by means of contract. That means going to the courts to get a decision to enforce the decision. That is where the problem lies in Africa. As we all know, African courts are not necessarily the most efficient when it comes to dealing with, 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 with matters. Um, stories abound of, you know, in Nigeria, matters taking 10, 15, 20 years to get to eventual resolution. That is not an exaggeration, that happens. The notable exception, I think, on the continent to this would be South Africa, where, for historical reasons, DAB's adjudication is a much more familiar, um, much more familiar process, and the courts are very friendly and very uh, facilitative of of adjudication, and here the courts will enforce very quickly. You don't have that in the majority of the continent. You, do, you don't have that, 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 that luxury. Apart from the general inefficiency that unfortunately you know, attends many of our court systems across the continent, you also have the fact that this is a process that's not very familiar, that, that we, with which courts aren't particularly familiar. I think, I think it was mentioned um, in one of the earlier panels, there is an increasing familiarization um, by judges with arbitration. They're getting training in arbitration, they're very familiar with it, so the hostility that one saw 10, 15, 20 years ago in many jurisdictions to adjudication is waning. That is not the case with DAB decisions. And the crucial thing about DAB decisions is that the adjudicator is, a, is allowed to make mistakes, he's allowed to get the law wrong. The grounds on which you can challenge the decision of the adjudicator are, 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 should be fairly limited, basically natural justice, lack of jurisdiction, that's it. Um, persuading some judges, I found in some African jurisdictions, to take that approach and to convince them that no, you're not going to the merits of the decision, that's not your job. Your job is to simply enforce what's there unless there's a breach of natural justice or lack of jurisdiction. That is, that is another major headache with getting these things enforced in Africa. Now, what that then leads to is a situation where the contract requires the parties as part of a tier dispute resolution mechanism to go to adjudication. They'll go to adjudication, they'll get a decision, will be roundly ignored by the losing party, and then you're straight into arbitration. Which means that, that the, entire DA, the entire DAB process has become is useless, money's wasted, time is, time is lost, and the contract isn't achieving what it's, what it's designed to do. And that is as a result of the inefficiencies that lie at the heart of many of our judicial processes, which are not just not built for this. Com contrast that with the UK, where you know, I, 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 I practice. We have statutory adjudication in the UK. There is a, an act, the Housing Grants Act, which um, now for coming on to 30 years, has made provision for court-backed adjudication. The, a decision of an adjudicator is enforceable by law, by statute. So it's not just a, a contractual right, there is a statutory right to enforcement. And the courts have demonstrated that over the, over the years they are very, very friendly towards decisions of adjudicators. And there is a procedure in the, in the TCC, the Technology and Construction Court, um, in, in, in high, or the High Court in London, that aims to get you from issuing your proceedings to enforce a decision to getting judgment on a summary judgment basis with between six to eight weeks which means that if there's, if there's, a, if there's a decision and the, the, the party who loses refuses to abide by the decision, you can go to court and get that decision summarily enforced and get that done within or between six to eight weeks, which is remarkable. And, and the UK is not unique in this. There are other jurisdictions around the world that have copied the statutory backing for adjudication in Australia, uh, Malaysia, various other places. I, I know there was, a, there, was a, there was an attempt here a few years ago um, through the, the prompt payment regulations to institute um, statutory provisions, but obviously you know, that didn't work out. But I think the problem is le it's less of a problem here, as I said earlier on, because the courts in, the, in, in South Africa are generally friendly towards um, decisions of adjudicators anyway. So the, 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 the problem we have across the continent is ensuring the enforceability of these decisions. Thanks, Abdul. That, that's, that's very insightful. I'll, I'll circle back to you later um, on, on, on how we can sort of bridge the gap while we wait in, with bated breath for the judicial support to come through. But if I, if I, can, if I can move to, to Dan and, and Gerard now, on the, on, and Dan first, on, on enforcement of arbitral awards. Um, Dan, 
we've spoken previously and, and, and you've shared you've shared unfortunately mostly negative experiences of, uh, of trying to enforce arbitral awards against states and barristatals. Um, I'm interested firstly in your experience enforcing awards against states within that state um, for obvious reasons that can be that can be challenging but uh, I'm interested to hear from your from your experience what what are the sort of the common themes that came out of, of those matters? Sure, sure. Behind well, first of all, thank you for referring to them as negative experiences. What that means is that I've lost them, so uh, just to be absolutely clear. Um, so I think the starting point in relation to enforcement is once you're talking about enforcement and having to take enforcement steps with your client, you're already kind of in an unenviable position because you don't have a respondent who's willing to comply with the arbitral award, which is what, of course, the intention behind uh, uh, arbitration proceedings should be. Um, and there are difficulties associated with enforcement, whether those are arbitral awards or court orders. And I think that those difficulties are merely or are compounded uh, by the fact that your respondent is a sovereign state or an emanation of a sovereign state. And the reason for that is that there are certain arguments in the arsenal of a sovereign state that they can deploy that uh, a, a normal respondent, a commercial, you know, a, a company or, or an individual would not be uh, able to deploy. So let me just focus on three of those points. So the first one is, is that there are certain immunities and privileges that attach to, to states and also to state officials. Uh, and uh, states obviously will, will um, uh, try and utilize those uh, anytime they can. Now the immunities and privileges themselves, I don't think uh, anyone would argue that those are not uh, proper for a state to, ha to have. Um, we can't have a, a sheriff uh, selling a hospital in execution or attaching police cars and, and um, fire engines. So they, are, they, they, they need to be uh, um, available for the states. The difficulty becomes, and this is a point I will come back to, if the local judiciary is overzealous in allowing, in allowing the state to, to rely on those uh, privileges and immunities. The sef second difficulty that can arise is that a state, unlike your normal respondent, can sort of legislate themselves out of a difficulty. And they can do that preemptively. Uh, we've spoken earlier uh, today, um, the earlier panelists talked about dom domesticating certain treaties and conventions. And when that happens, very often there are subtle changes that are introduced into the wording. So we've been talking about the ancestral model law. It is, however, very rare for a, for a country to adopt the model law as it is published. There are normally uh, subtle differences. And so, for example, in Zimbabwe, there are some subtle differences that relate to the setting aside of arbitral awards and to enforcement of arbitral awards. And then the third difficulty uh, that can arise is um, the, um, sorry, let me just, oh yeah, the, this is another point that, that has already been touched upon which is that there is, uh, I, I, so Africa is not homogenous, and I understand and I've heard that previous speakers talked about South Africa being uh, an arbitration-friendly venue, and I don't doubt that that's the case. We've heard the incredible statistics of uh, 146 awards handed down by EFSA, and I think only one of them has been successfully challenged. I can guarantee that that would not be the position in every African state and the country where I practice in Zimbabwe, I can 100% guarantee that that wouldn't be the case. I would say about 120 of 140 cases would have been challenged, and a good number of those uh, would have been successfully challenged. And the difficulty there is that if, if the judiciary distrusts the international arbitration uh, community and international arbitration awards, there are, of course, it is very easy for them uh, to do so. There's obviously a, a, a lot of different ways that uh, registration and enforcement can be uh, rejected. Um, I was going to talk about one particular example. I realized that my new, newly appointed arbitrator is about five meters away from me, so let <laughs> me go to uh, another example that, I'm, um, that I can talk about. And that was a case relating to an arbitral award against the parastatal for a, a, a fairly significant sum. And of course, in any arbitral tribunal enforcement proceedings, the, the issue of public policy comes up, and that is, of course, a, a concept that can be stretched to include various different things. And the argument that found favor in the, in the court on that occasion was that given that the respondent is a parastatal, the money that it had to pay out under the arbitral award would have come from the Consolidated Revenue Fund in, 
in other words, it would have been taxpayers' money. And that money is held by the Paris State all for the purposes of providing education or building hospitals or uh, providing pensions. And therefore, it must be against the public policy of the state for a foreign investor to receive that money. Now, uh, in a lot of jurisdiction, that sort of argument would be rejected outright. I think because we found ourselves in the courts of the very state that we were asking to pay the amount, unfortunately, it found favor. So those are just three examples that I've I thought of briefly on. F fascinating. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, and, and, and sticking then, I think, to the topic of enforcing against states. Gerard, I know you, from, from, from corridor chats and, and, and war stories in the office, I, I know very well that you've also been involved in the, the well-publicized Fraser Lesotho matter. Um, and, and there we're dealing also with, with enforcement against the state. And I know there are various publicized issues in relation to the enforcement in multiple jurisdictions, um, not only in the jurisdiction of the state itself. Um, what are some of the common, common issues that, that, that came out um, in, in your experience there? I think not, not, not really the sort of, of, of primary difficulty that, that uh, Dan describes, but, but I think more some level of recognition that many African sovereigns and, and you know, particularly the smaller, less well-resourced ones have, have some real governance challenges, um, and, and especially historic governance challenges, and um, in, in, in circumstances, um, I think the, the, the Fraser Solar matter being one in particular, where you have a, um, a, a contract in the energy sector that gives rise to a dispute, but a, a, a disconnect within the, 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 the public sector, uh, that then gives rise to a referral to an arbitration in South Africa, non-responsiveness from, from, the, from the sovereign, that in turn results in a default arbitration award, non-responsiveness, that in turn results in a, um, a, in, a, in a high court recognition order given by default. Where, where the sovereign finally, res finally does respond is when it gets to the point of, uh, of, of recognition and enforcement and, and when it starts biting. At that particular point of time, it turns into, in a South African context, a, a rescission application in, in the, and, and as well as stay in terms of execution in, in the South African context. And in, on my last count, four other jurisdictions, um, attempts at recognition and enforcement in, um, in, in the, 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 the UK, Canada, um, and the, the state of New York, in Mauritius, in Brussels, in, in each of those instances having to then engage in defense of that sovereign um, to, to, at the very least, suspend, if not, uh, if not counter those recognition uh, and, and enforcement proceedings, both in relation to whether or not the... Uh, the, um, the, the, the judgment is enforceable, alternatively the award is enforceable, and that of course can be a whole separate debate about whether you're trying to enforce a judgment or an award. Um, but this is, um, you know, this is, this is just some, some level of illustration of the, the, uh, the degree of, of litigation and cont contentiousness that can result from um, what, is, what is at face value really a simple, a, a relatively simple dispute in the energy sector, turning on, on validity of authority on, on, uh, on transacting. So, so we, we've, we've touched on some of the difficulties we, we, we may face. Um, Dan, coming back to you then, you've spoken about some of the issues we can encounter when we try to enforce against a state or a parastatal within the borders of that state. Um, how can international international legal principles, case law elsewhere, assist if you identify assets in other jurisdictions? I mean, I mean what are so, some of the practical considerations to take into account there? Sure, so, so one of the ways of uh, trying to get around the difficulties that I was uh, talking about earlier is to look for assets of the, the respondent state, uh, but assets that are held outside the jurisdiction. So you hopefully avoid uh, those difficulties that, um, that I was talking about. So, but there's just two points I want to make in relation to that. So firstly, it's not a panacea that will resolve all the difficulties. So starting with the immunities and privileges that states have, they of course can enjoy uh, immunities in other jurisdictions as well. And there's a recent example of that in the case of uh, Border Timbers and the Republic of Zimbabwe, which is uh, an English uh, High Court decision by Judge Diaz. Uh, which concerned a uh, ICSID award handed down in Washington 
uh, which was then uh, registered um, in, amongst other countries in England. And in the English courts, the state, in this case it was Zimbabwe, relied on section two of the English uh, State Immunities Act. So the fact that you find yourself outside the jurisdiction of the country that you are pursuing does not mean that the, the respondent, the state, will not have certain immunities. Whether they do or don't will be for the courts of the country where you are seeking to enforce. But I'm just, I'm just mentioning that, that that is something that you should, you should always check. The second point I would raise, and this is, uh, uh, this is one of the issues that has come up in one of my cases as well, uh, is this. What happens if you have a, uh, a, an international arbitral award against state X, and you try and enforce it in state Y, but the courts of state, state X, so the domestic courts of the respondent, set aside or annul the international arbitral award that you're seeking to enforce. Um, now, the original answer to that, or the traditional answer to that was, once you go through, once an arbitral award has been annulled, then it's a nullity, and nothing can be based on a nullity, therefore enforcement proceedings can't be based on a nullity. Uh, and that is something that is, of course, open to abuse uh, by states. But there is now a growing body of case law um, uh, relating to this issue. And the one case that I wanted to mention, which I think is the most relevant in this context, is uh, Yukos Capital and Rosneft. So uh, Rosneft is a Russian company that is very close, uh, close or closely affiliated to the Russian administration. Um, that's not my personal view, that's in the judgment. Uh, and um, Yukos Capital um, sued Rosneft in Russia in uh, arbitral proceedings that were seated in Russia and was successful and then sought to enforce that arbitral award in the courts of the Netherlands initially. Now they are, uh, and then later there were uh, English enforcement proceedings as well. But sticking with the Netherlands first, whilst the enforcement proceedings in the Netherlands were pending, Rosneft uh, managed to go to the arbitration court in Russia, and the arbitration court in Russia annulled the arbitral award, which allowed Rosneft to go to the Netherlands and argue you've got nothing to enforce here now because there is no longer an award. And what the Dutch court said in that case is they started with the New York Convention, and they said that if you look at the New York Convention, there is actually no obligation on, an, on a state where enforcement is uh, requested to refuse enforcement simply on the basis that the award has been annulled by a foreign country. So your starting point is, is that the treaty doesn't actually require you uh, by virtue of a, a, another country annulling proceedings or an award uh, to follow suit. So in those circumstances, the Dutch court said, it is therefore open to us to have a look at the circumstances in which the, uh, the international tribunal award was annulled and the Russian court observed that the most basic uh, elements of due process were not observed by the Russian court, and in those circumstances refused to follow the decision of the Russian court. And it was for the Dutch courts themselves to consider the validity or otherwise of the, uh, of the international award. So um, those are the two examples that I, I would Fascinating, thank, thank you, Dan. And then, and then coming back to Africa and, and enforcement against African states. I think, um, Gerard, you, you've, you've got a track record of, uh, of, of having to come up with, with some inventive strategies to, to, to secure inf uh, successful enforcement um, in the African context. Um, those, those were inventive, those were creative. Um, do you want to elaborate a little bit on, on how you can go about enforcement strategies to make sure that you... Sure. Um... I think, again, picking up on, the, on, on Dan's comments, your, your primary difficulty when, when, when seeking to enforce an award against a, a, um, a, a defaulting sovereign um, in the African context is that the last place where you can go is, is, is to the sovereign state itself. Um, so it then becomes an exercise in finding, um, finding assets that are susceptible for attachment in a jurisdiction that will firstly recognize either, either an award or an order of court made pursuant to an award, and secondly um, recognize that you, you have sufficient locus standi and jurisdictional entitlement to, to bring those proceedings within that particular jurisdiction. Um, and then also the issue quite often about um, relating to sovereign immunity that would relate to certain classes of act assets. So 
um, assets that are used for, for public purposes or relate to uh, diplomatic function would be the most obvious exclusions. You cannot go and at, at, attach the assets and the functioning um, um, uh, uh, accounts, etc., of, a, of, a, of an embassy or a consulate. Um, but you need to locate essentially commercial assets that relate to some transactional activity of the state itself. Um, now, again, typically you find that where you deal with with states who, um, who who default and often habitually default on arbitration awards or judgments of foreign courts, is is they've gotten quite good at uh, ensuring that there are intermediary entities um, or or, uh, or various agencies that that um, uh, protect assets um, in terms of their commercial exchanges that are potentially capable for attachment. But there are there are generally certain transactional activities that. Most states have to enter into that um, um, that that potentially expose them directly. Um, the the most common are the, the 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 degree to which they require funding from uh, financial institutions globally, or in a in a particular instance that I can describe to you, um, something such as a sovereign bond issue, um, where they have potential royalty entitlements uh, relating to uh, uh, natural resources or uh, um, or, or, or other business ventures that are conducted in country, but essentially um, through um, uh, foreign multinationals, um, particularly in the mineral and resources space. These are also potential assets that you can pursue. Um, and uh, I think a particular example I can describe was um, quite a number of years ago, but it was a matter um, relating to a judgment by a South African bank against a West African sovereign. Um, where, where, there, where there had been such a default, we had obtained, in that instance, a, an, an LCIA arbitration award uh, for quite a substantial amount of money. I think it was about 30,000 sterling at the time. Um, and uh, the search was then on essentially to find, to find a suitable assets that were capable of attachment and execution. And um, what, what we ultimately did identify was the, was an interest payment on a on a sovereign bond issue that was that was payable on a uh, on a biannual basis. Uh, so so what the matter then in effect entailed was obtaining a freezing order through a UK court um, to along with a gag to be able to attach these funds as they were transferred by the sovereign into the account of the um, of the, of the intermediary bank that was responsible for payment of the um, of of the bondholders' interest. Um, and then the notification that followed to the uh, um, to the sovereign only once the, the the attachment had been effected, that then resulted in some um, some urgent court proceedings in the UK for the better part of a week, um, an application for leave to appeal, um, and um, a, a successful interim implementation of the award. At which point, the 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 sovereign in question then conceded the issue, paid the full amount of capital plus interest and costs against the release of the funds to enable the bondholders to be paid. So that, that I think, is, is perhaps a, um, a striking example of a successful uh, enforcement action against a, against a sovereign. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Gerard. So, um, Abdul, while we're on the, on the topic of, of innovative solutions and innovative strategies, um, Back to the DAB issue, while we're waiting for judicial support to catch up, are, are, there, are there anything that, that you can recommend to clients, to lawyers, in the meantime, to, to make sure that DAB decisions can be enforced? Well, um, my preference, my desire, which I've campaigned across Africa on over many years, is try and get um, statutory adjudication implemented across African jurisdictions. It hasn't happened yet, but I haven't given up hope, and hopefully we can get there one day. Um, in terms of more innovative solutions, another um, one solution which I'm quite keen on, which anybody who's heard me speak about this topic in the last five years will be bang on about this, so please uh, <laughs> forgive me if, I am, if I'm repeating myself, um, is the idea of a bond taken out by the parties at the outset of the project, which is payable on demand on the presentation of a valid decision of an adjudication's a decision. Um, it's a fairly simple, and in my view, probably quite effective way of ensuring that decisions of uh, dispute boards are backed up. Um, the idea is that 
Um, at the outset, the parties agree to this bond. They, they jointly approach a bondsman, um, pay, the, pay the amount required for the, for the bond, and have the sitting there um, against the eventuality of there being a decision of an adjudicator. Now, I fully recognize that this is not without its problems. I mean, it's clearly going to increase costs. Um, the, the costs of taking out a bond could be quite significant. But in my view, if you weigh that up against the benefits of having the certainty, both not just to the, the contract, but also to the employer, that if there is a decision of an adjudicator in their favor, there will be recourse to some mechanism that gets you money quick, quickly. It bypasses, to some, some extent, the problem of enforceability that I discussed earlier on with, with local courts. Um, no doubt, clever lawyers will try and uh, probably try to injunct the call on the bond and another, another sort of um, ways to avoid making sure that that money gets paid over. But in terms of you know, a practical solution to what is a real problem, I think that's one that's worth exploring. Thanks, Abdul. Um, I think with, with just a couple of minutes remaining, um, I, I'd like to just end where, where we started. And, and Yassine, that's, that's back to you. On the, on the integrity of, of arbitral proceedings and, and to make sure that we safeguard those. What's the advice that, that, that you can give at the, at the commencement of proceedings to make sure that these, that these issues of dishonesty and corruption and fraud is avoided, bearing in mind the detrimental effect that it, that it can have at, at enforcement stage? Yeah, I, I think the, the starting point is the, the parties and the legal representatives need to be alive to the risk of allegations of fraud and dishonesty being raised at any point. So not to ignore issues early on. So if you, if you spot that your client has a potential issue that could give rise to such a claim, not just ignoring it, really focusing on it, assessing the risk that that could blow up in the arbitration or that could blow up in enforcement. I, I've, I've been involved in many, many arbitrations where these allegations have been sleeping for the whole process and explode just before a hearing or during a hearing and it's completely disastrous for, for all parties involved. So being alive to those risks, getting the right advice at the outset is absolutely key to mitigating those risks. I think that the, the P and ID case raises a new issue which is the duty of the tribunal where if they are seeing things which don't add up, to what extent do they have an obligation to actually start investigating, start challenging? The, the Justice Knowles view in, the, in this English judgment is pretty scathing against the, the tribunal here, which is, which is difficult to accept because the tribunal is a very eminent, excellent, I would love to have this tribunal on all my <laughs> cases. Lord Hoffman, Sir Anthony Evans, Chief Bio from Nigeria, former Attorney General of Nigeria, absolutely fantastic tribunal. So it seems if they could be criticized in a damning, public judgment of the English courts, then I think there is a real risk now that tribunals are going to feel a real pressure, especially where parties are either not doing a good job or particularly where they're not even appearing at the hearing, where tribunals will want to avoid this risk materializing in such a disastrous, catastrophic way and feeling the pressure to really be much more proactive in terms of raising new points, challenging parties, demanding answers, demanding new documents putting down their, their concerns. I think this is really at odds with the approach of international arbitration lawyers and the arbitration community today. I think arbitrators are usually very good at making sure that their awards are enforceable, but this is seen as a very remote risk. I think this case might change that for the moment, but, but we'll have to see if there, are, if there are any more cases along this line. Fantastic. Thanks, Thanks Yassine. I think that, um, that concludes our panel. I know there are, there are eager, eager moot participants who want to, to, to get up onto the stage now. Um, thank you to the panel and thank you for, um, for your insights. I think we've covered quite a lot of ground and uh, um, at, least, at least planted a few seeds. So, so thank you very much. And um, to everyone who's going to stick around, please enjoy the moot.
all of you uh, and welcome to the sixth and final session of day one of the Johannesburg Arbitration Week proudly hosted by AFSA. My name is Stephen Dodge uh, from Tifantala, Africa. I am a member of the inaugural Young AFSA Committee. Standing alongside me is Nelly Ndlovu. She's from Group One Advocates and a member of the Johannesburg Society of Advocates. And welcome to what we hope is going to be a very exciting session. This is man versus machine in the form of a moot court competition uh, chaired proudly by Young AFSA in collaboration with AFSA. So what is Young AFSA? I don't know if everybody here has heard of what Young AFSA stands for, uh, but the name pretty much says it all. We are young practitioners in this ever-evolving field of alternative dispute resolution across the world. We are vibrant, we are capable, and we want visibility in the profession. So we created Young AFSA uh, with the blessing of Michael Cooper, chairman of AFSA. Uh, we have created this body which hopes to improve that visibility of young professionals and enhance their interests, continue their professional development and give them the skills that they need to become successful practitioners throughout our legal field. We hope to have global reach eventually, and in fact, we have got some global reach already with members participating from around the world. Of course, the most important thing about Young AFSA is its members. And membership is open to all young legal practitioners under the age of 40. It's not only for graduates, not only for people practicing already. It's for people in university, for people who have an interest in arbitration as a dispute resolution mechanism. So, Without further ado, I'll introduce Nelly. She's going to take us through the essence of the question that this moot court will be dealing with, and we will then describe what happens thereafter. Over to you. Yes. Good afternoon, delegates. Um, now, getting to the meat of what we're here to deal with. Uh, the question and the facts which the various moot teams will be answering today. Whilst diamonds might in the ordinary course be a girl's best friend, today they could be an arbitrator's worst nightmare. The dispute in question relates to Castor and Pollux, uh, what has been labelled the heavenly twins. And this, or these at least, are a unique pair of identical emerald cut diamonds, each weighing in excess of 50 carats each. Insofar as the facts which the mood question seeks to answer, there are three protagonists which we must uh, keep in mind and which each of the participant mood teams will be representing. The first of those protagonists is an individual by the name of Mr. Peter Badella, uh, a diamond dealer. The second is Mr. Paul Smith, um, and the third protagonist is Ms. Uh, Fernanda de Sosa. Briefly stated insofar as the facts are concerned, on the 16th of June, Mr. Peter Badella, the diamond dealer, sent an email to a Johannesburg collector, Mr. Paul Smith, in which he advised that he has one of the heavenly twins that are up for sale, um, in specific caster. Uh, in this regard, an offer insofar as the amount of 10 million US dollars was made in respect of the delivery of the stone in South Africa. In the email correspondence from Peter to Mr. Paul, um, Peter advised um, that the transaction must be confidential, and if uh, Paul is going to buy a caster, he must nominate an arbitration institution that would deal with the dispute between the parties. Paul very excitedly then responded to the email from Peter and said, of course I'm interested in acquiring caster. Um, upon sending this response, uh, Paul also emailed Ms. Fernanda de Sosa in respect of putting in an offer for the purchase of the second of the Heavenly Twins. In this regard, and so far as Paul's email, um, Paul agreed that in respect of the disputes or any disputes that may arise in so far as the transaction in question, that they must be decided according to the rules of AFSA, International Arbitration Federation of South Africa. In respect of the email that um, Paul had sent to Fernanda, uh, Paul had advised Ms. Fernanda that he has now received an offer from Peter, a uh, forecaster in the amount of 10 million US dollars, and inquired with Fernanda whether she would be amenable to selling Pollux um, for the purpose of keeping both of the diamonds together. Ms. Fernanda ultimately agreed to the offer in this regard, and furthermore advised that she accepted that uh, the AFSA arbitration rules will apply. 
Now, with every dispute that lawyers deal with, there was, of course, disagreement which arose. Lo and behold, a few days later, Peter, the ultimate, uh, or the initial dealer at least, sends an email to Paul in which he states, Hi Paul, I've been out of office and did not see your email in which you wanted to accept my offer. Alas, I warned you that there would be others that would want to buy Costa, and in fact, that's happened. I have a Russian businessman whose identity must be kept secret, and this individual will be purchasing um, Pollocks. Immediately upon receipt of Peter Badella's email, Paul Smith sent Fernanda an email in which he said, listen, Fernanda, things are not working out because behind my back, Peter has sold Castor, and so I've lost my chance in reuniting the heavenly twins, as was the plan. So I'm not going to buy Pollocks anymore because, of course, it all depended on whether I could get both stones and not just one. And this, in summary, are the facts of the dispute. Insofar as the crux of the dispute or what the participants will be required to answer, um, these are the uh, questions which must be answered. Firstly, has the tribunal uh, have the necessary jurisdiction in order to uh, arbitrate the disputes in question, first and foremost? Secondly, which body of law is the proper law for determining the dispute in question in circumstances where there are a variety of jurisdictions which play part in the transaction? Thirdly, assuming that the tribunal does in fact have the necessary jurisdiction to arbitrate the dispute, then there were two transactions that were part of a single contract, uh, or w were in fact there two transactions part of a single contract, or does each stone stand alone? Fourth, in any event, could Paul Smith's email responding to Peter Badella's offer result in a binding contract between the parties? And if at the moment of the transmission of the email from Peter to Paul, uh, was Peter unaware of the content of the email at three o'clock on the 19th of January, 2024? And lastly, what award should the tribunal make in the circumstances? As mentioned, there are three main protagonists insofar as the facts are concerned, and each of our participant mood teams will be representing them. In respect of Ms. Fernanda de Sosa, the SADC team will be representing Fernanda. In respect of uh, Mr. Paul Smith, uh, the Advocates for Transformation team will be representing him. And in respect of Mr. Peter Dabella, uh, young AFSA will be representing them. Um, I would now like to call um, each of the respective mood teams to the stage to, of course, present their arguments. And the order in which each of the teams will um, at least uh, come to the stage, and I will uh, thereafter introduce each of the participants, is that the SADC team will be first up in presenting their arguments to um, the panel. Uh, the AFT team will be second up, and the young AFSA team will be the last team. Each of the teams will be provided with up to 20 minutes uh, to articulate their argument to our esteemed panel of arbitrators who will be shortly introduced to you all. And thereafter, once there is at least two minutes remaining in their time, we will provide an indication by just raising our hand uh, to indicate to the panel that uh, their time is drawing to a close. Um, I will now just hand over to um, Stephen to introduce us all to our panel of arbitrators, and thereafter I will request that the first team, being the SADC team, perhaps um, make their way to the stage, and we will then get off, um, at least insofar as the arguments are concerned. So you've heard the facts, and now we need to talk about the people who will decide them. Advocate Patrick Lane is a member of the South African Bar and in London, after formerly practicing until 1977 as an attorney. He's a member of the Maisels Group and 39 Essex Street Chambers. He acts as counsellor and arbitrator under various rules in domestic and international matters and has chaired and been a member of numerous dispute adjudication boards. He is vice chair of the AFSA Board of Directors and is a member of the KJAC International Guiding Committee and a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Advocate Lane has spoken regularly at both national and international conferences. First appointed to the KwaZulu Natal High Court in January 2009 and then to the Supreme Court of Appeal in June 2011, Justice Malcolm Wallace began his legal career after graduating cum laude from the University of KwaZulu Natal when he started practice as an advocate in 1973. 
He is an expert in maritime, commercial, labor, and company law, and he is described by Judges Matter as one of the most well-rounded judges at the Supreme Court of Appeal. He is also an honorary professor of law at his alma mater, the University of KZN, and he has written various articles on shipping law. Dr. Fuyong Chen is a, the, the Deputy Secretary General of the Beijing Arbitration Commission and the Beijing Arbitra International Arbitration Center, and the Vice President of the Asia Pacific Regional Arbitration Group. He is a qualified lawyer in the People's Republic of China with an LLB from China University of Political Science and Law, also with an LLM from Peking University, and a PhD from Tsinghua University. Locally, Dr. Chen is a member of the AFSA International Court and has extensive experience in handling various commercial disputes through arbitration and mediation. He's also a regular speaker at international conferences and seminars. Leyu Tamuru, te, te, Tameru, I beg your pardon, is the founder of IARB Africa, which describes itself as Africa's online international arbitration hub. A court member of the International Court of Arbitration at the International Chamber of Commerce, she is an arbitration expert and regularly consults on international arbitration projects. Ms. Tamero previously worked with international private and government organizations, including the World Bank, the IMF, and the African Union. She's an experience, she has experience rather in private sector development, international arbitration, and youth empowerment in Africa. Ms. Tamero has law degrees from Addis Ababa University and Georgetown University. Ms. Susan Mutangadura is an internationally certified commercial arbitrator and an associate of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in the UK. Susan has served as non-executive director in various industries, including banking, insurance, telecommunications, real estate, and non-profit organizations. She holds an MBA and an LLM from universities in the UK, and an undergraduate and a graduate degree from the University of Zimbabwe, and a graduate degree from the University of Bangor. She sits on the AFSA SADC Division Panel of Arbitrators and currently practices as a full-time independent commercial arbitrator. And last but certainly not least, James Bunda is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and the past president of both the Law Association of Zambia and the SADC Lawyers Association. He is also a former council member of the International Bar Association and holds an LLM in construction and dispute resolution from Leeds Beckett University in the UK, as well as an LLB from the University of Zambia. He is an advocate of all the superior courts in Zambia and a member of the Disputes Resolution Board Foundation and the Society of Construction Law. Now, one of the big things that we're here to deal with is the influence of artificial intelligence on the arbitration field as we know it. What we have done to shake things up a little bit is to get a team from the University of Pretoria. We'll introduce them more formally later on, but they have programmed an artificial intelligence bot to render its own award. More on that to come in time. We will now hand over to the first team to come and present their arguments. That is the SADC team representing Fernanda D'Souza. Yes. And forming part of the SADC team who is just making their way to the stage. Yes, as mentioned, forming part of the SADC team is um, Nakasamba Banda, the only female member of this team I see. Um, Charles Mhone, Muleba Chitipule, Nyasha Munyuru, Demetrio Manrate and Jan Greling. Um, as mentioned, teams, uh, you will be provided with a period of 20 minutes in which to present your arguments to the human arbitrators. Once you have approximately two minutes left of your time, we will indicate same to you, and we will advise once your time is up. Please let us know when you're ready to start. Um, could you kindly just indicate who will be uh, the spokesman in respect of the teams, just so we have an idea of that? I was saying that the way we have uh, structured it is that each one of us, within the time frame that has been allocated, will um, address the, the honorable members of the tribunal. 
All right, might I just request that when each of the participants do make their submissions, you just briefly advise of your name, surname, uh, so that the arbitrators can note that where, where that is relevant. Thank you. All right, uh, I think the clock will start now, um, and you can go ahead and make your submissions. Honorable members of uh, the tribunal, my name is Demetrio Majat. With me, Nakasamba Banda, <coughs> who will address the issue related to the jurisdiction of the tribunal. And then Nyasha Munyuru, who will address the issue related to the applicable law to the contracts, then Muleba Chitupila will focus on uh, whether the transaction uh, stand uh, alone uh, contracts or interrelated contracts. Charles Moon will, will refer to the issue whether there was a binding contract uh, between uh, Paul Smith and Peter Badella. And last but not least, our colleague, Councillor Lezeko Bolhogo, will look uh, at uh, conclusion and he will plead on the reliefs we are seeking um, uh, for the tribunal to, to grant us. So I will now hand over to Council Nakasamba. Thank you very much. As has been indicated, my name is Nakasamba Bandachanda and I will be determining the first issue relating to the jurisdiction of this honorable tribunal. Um, we invite the tribunal to review the respective correspondence between the parties. Effectively, we submit that there was agreement reached to use AFSA as the administering body in relation to the Pollux transaction. And in relation to the Custer transaction, there was essentially agreement as regards the rules applicable to the dispute. We are cognizant of the error in reference to the International Federation for Southern Africa but submit that we have submitted various authorities as to vague and imprecise references which have been accepted by various tribunals with, in the interest of upholding the intention of the parties to arbitrate. The preamble to the AFSA rules provides that where an agreement in whatsoever manner has been made for arbitration under the AFSA rules or administration by AFSA, it shall be taken to be an agreement to conduct the arbitration in accordance with the Ms. AFSA International Ms. Arbitration Rules. Thank you. Uh, is it necessary to address the panel on that, given that in the written submissions on behalf of Mr. Smith, it's conceded that the tribunal has jurisdiction and it is a jurisdiction that vests in AFSA International Court? Um, apologies, I didn't hear the question. Is there any need to go into this, bearing in mind that your opponents agree with you that we've got jurisdiction and aren't worried about the mistake in our description? Um, I, um, I suppose we will consider that, um, given that nobody has um, challenged the error in reference to AFSA. Um, on the basis of what I have submitted so far, we essentially argue that this Honorable Tribunal has the jurisdiction to determine the dispute herein. There has, however, been um, arguments by the responding parties, in this case, Peter Bedella, that challenges the jurisdiction of this tribunal on the basis of the validity of the arbitration agreement. And so to start with, we will obviously highlight the, the, the powers of this tribunal to determine its own jurisdiction based on the principle of competence, competence under Article 31. I'm sorry, could you, could you explain why, on behalf of your client, you're in the slightest bit interested in what Mr. Badella has to say. You're not litigating against Mr. Badella. Um, uh, insofar as we look at the submissions, they also essentially argue that the agreement um, with respect to the Pollux transaction would therefore be invalidated because there is no agreement. So we feel that we must justify the jurisdiction of this tribunal to determine even the Pollux transaction. As submitted pursuant to Article 31 of the Rules and, and Article 16 of the Model Law, this tribunal has the jurisdiction to determine its own jurisdiction. 
on the principle of separability of the arbitration agreement, which is contained in Article 31, Rule 2 of the rules, essentially what we have is the arbitration agreement being separate from the actual substantive, um, the substantive agreement of the parties. That means that what is expected as, as in any arbitration is an agreement as to the governing law that governs the arbitration agreement, and then you also have the agreement as to the arbitration agreement itself. The parties must also agree the seat of arbitration, which is essentially the lex arbitri or the curial law. In the case herein, which seeks to determine the validity of the arbitration agreement, it turns on a determination of what the applicable law to the arbitration agreement should be. Our colleagues have submitted that it should essentially be English law, even though the submissions turn on submissions as to the South African law of arbitration. Honorable members of the tribunal, in the case herein, it has not been expressly agreed what the law governing the arbitration agreement is. And in such circumstances, we acknowledge that it tends to create an unnecessarily complex situation, but is determined in a three-step process. Firstly, it simply requires a determination as to what the express choice of law is, and in this case, there is none. You then move on to what could be the implied choice of law. In this case, you would impute the governing law of the main contract as being the governing law of the arbitration agreement, but again, in this case, there is none. And so you move on to a determination as to the system of law which the arbitration agreement has the closest and most real connection, and in this case, the general law is the law of the seat is the most closely connected with the arbitration agreement. While we recognize that the seat has also not been agreed, we also acknowledge that the AFSA court has the jurisdiction to determine what the seat is. And we posit the view that AFSA being within the jurisdiction of South Africa, it is the most appropriate seat of this arbitration and ultimately the governing law of the arbitration agreement. And so the International Arbitration Act, number 15 of 2017, which incorporates those synchro model law, would be the governing law of the arbitration agreement. In motivating for South Africa as the governing law of the AA, we recognize that South Africa accords with international law as embodied in the New York Convention. Its arbitration laws incorporate the model law, ensuring consistency in the application of international principles and standards. And finally, it is likely to uphold the reasonable commercial expectations of the parties. We therefore submit that South African law be maintained as the law of the arbitration. Having determined what the law of the arbitration agreement is, we therefore must review the requirements of this law in order to determine whether the arbitration agreements are indeed valid. And in this regard, we make reference to Article 7 of the model law, and we have also cited various authorities and scholarly articles and the Osinctual Case Law Digest, which provides clarity on the import of Article 7. Contrary to the submission by Peter Bedella that in order for the arbitration agreement to be valid, other elements must be determined such as the place, the mode of appointment of the arbitrators, and the number of arbitrators, we submit that in a nutshell, the authorities provide that the arbitration agreement simply needs, be, needs to be in writing. It need not be executed. It could be in electronic form, as in this case, the email correspondence between the parties. And no other additional requirements would be necessary in order to validate the agreement. And notably, on the basis of the principle of separability of the agreement, the AA would remain valid despite the findings that this honorable tribunal might make as to the substantive agreement between the parties. In essence, the Honorable Tribunal herein is reminded that the authorities provided and the stance taken by a number of um, tribunals and courts alike in international commercial arbitration underscores the flexibility of modern arbitration laws and the approach which strives to uphold the arbitration agreement as long as there is an intention to submit the dispute to arbitration. In totality, we submit that in accordance with South African law, the arbitration agreement between uh, Ms. De Sosa and Paul Smith is valid and enforceable. I will therefore um, call on my friend Nyasha to proceed with uh, issue number two. Thank you. If I may proceed to address the honorable members of the tribunal. Uh, my name is Nyasha Mnuru. I'm going to address on the issue of the applicable law to the contract in dispute. 
As submitted my, by my colleague, uh, Madam Nagasamba, uh, the parties have agreed that AFSA has jurisdiction to determine the dispute within, between the parties. And in light of that, the international rules are applicable under the circumstances. It is also our submission that as per Article 9 of the AFSA rules, uh, this honorable tribunal has, has, a, has a jurisdiction to determine the law which is applicable uh, to the merits uh, of the matter. I will demonstrate to the honorable tribunal uh, on five limbs why we are motivating that the law which should be applicable to the present facts before this honorable tribunal should be the unidroid uh, principles uh, of international contract law. On the first uh, leg, uh, it is clear that the contract presents uh, connecting factors where two countries are involved, that is uh, Angola and South Africa, uh, Angola being uh, where our client uh, originates from and, uh, and, and South Africa. It is clear uh, according to the, uh, to the claimants that there's no predominant, um, there's no uh, country which is predominant enough to justify application of uh, domestic law. That's why we are motivating for the application of uh, the unit rate uh, principles which are of, a, of an international nature. The reason why we motivate this particular point is uh, international arbitration by its very nature is meant to settle um, disputes between parties and in so doing uh, it is uh, premised upon two issues. That is the, the issue of neutrality and uh, equality of treatment uh, uh, before, between the parties. It is our submission that the application of international law um, in the form of unit rate uh, principles ensures that uh, that is achieved. The other issue is uh, the decision by the parties not to specifically identify um, the law which is applicable to the uh, dispute is a clear indication of a negative choice uh, of law and their rejection of uh, the application of national laws and uh, their amenability to uh, the application of non-national or international uh, rules of law like the unit road principles. I believe our submissions properly address uh, that particular issue. And it is our, our submission on that particular aspect that it is only um, clear from the circumstances of the matter that uh, the unit rate principles be um, applied in the present case. I uh, will note the submissions by our learned colleagues. Um, they have sought to uh, make the proposition that because there is a, um, the, the respondent who is domiciled uh, in South Africa and the, con and the contract is also supposed to be performed in South Africa, then South African law should be, should be, should be applied. I, I, we submit on behalf of the, 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 the claimant that uh, that pro pro proposition is untenable and in our submissions, in particular paragraph 6, we have made reference to a case by the ICC which dealt with a similar provision like the Article 19, which is provide for, provided for uh, under the AFSA rules, wherein they bypassed um, the, um, the conflict of rules uh, principles and applied uh, international uh, contract law provisions like under the unit right, uh, principles. Uh, in conclusion, um, it is our submission that considering also how the contract was um, consummated by the the, the, the party, it is clear that the parties consider the transaction to be of an international nature, and as such, it is our submission that the unit rate principles are the. There we go. Um, would it make a difference if it was decided under Lesotho law or South African law? Do you need to spend any time actually finding what the proper law which governs this arbitration is on the facts? I didn't quite, I quite understand the question. Well, you, as I understand your argument, you're saying that South African law is the governing law. 
is there such a distinction between Lesotho law and South African law that requires you to address that question in so much detail? Yeah, we thought it was uh, very prudent for us to address on that one because our land colleague, obviously, they didn't take time uh, on that particular aspect. But uh, considering what we have said, I think I've probably addressed the issue in time. If, if, we, if you recall, your colleague argued uh, in glowing terms that in relation to the arbitration agreement, South African law is perfect. So trying to understand why that cannot be the same also with the merits of the case, why South African law, for instance, can't apply. Are you suggesting that if we use South African law as compared to what you're advocating, the unit right, the interpretation will be different? or the outcome will be different? Okay, my learned colleague uh, propagated for the uh, application of South, South African law to when in relation, and we are propagating for application of uh, unit rate in relation to the merits uh, of the matter. The reason why we are making that proposition, um, uh, obviously, is as I've highlighted, the merits of the matter warrant the application of international uh, principles given the nature of the transaction and how the parties perceived uh, the, the, the transaction. <coughs> Might I defer to my uh, colleague, uh, Mr. Mleba, to address on the third issue. Honorable members of the tribunal, as indicated in introductions, my name is Mleba Chitupila. I will address the tribunal on the third issue, which is um, basically a determination of whether the two transactions so the two contracts form one transaction and whether they are standalone contracts. Our submission here largely is that um, the contract between Paul Smith and Peter Badella, contract one, and the contract between um, Fernando de Sousa and Paul Smith are two separate um, independent contracts. And this, our submission is based on two legs. The first leg is based on a determination of the agreed terms of um, the contracts, contract one and two, and the second leg will be largely dependent on what is deemed as commercially sensible construction of a contract. Honorable tribunal members, with regard to the first leg, um, the agreed terms and conditions um, of the contract one and two are ascertainable from the email exchanges, the emails dated 17th, 18th, 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th of January 2024. With respect to contract one, our submission is that the agreed terms were the purchase of Casta on its own. And that's a crucial consideration. The purchase of Casta on its own. And of course, at the purchase price of $10 million, with AFSA selected as the arbitral body. The, in terms of the second contract, contract two, the agreed terms were the purchase of Polax at $10 million, and AFSA again was um, nominated as the arbitral body. Um, outstanding from this is that our submission is that there is no, based on the agreed terms and the reading of the email exchanges, there was no agreement where one contract was conditioned on the other. There is no express wording where either party said, if this doesn't happen, if contract one doesn't happen, contract two will not then happen. Honorable members of the tribunal, with this in hand, we then refer to the authority of Lehman versus Automotive Industries, where I'll paraphrase, it was stated that if a contract, if contract terms are unequivocal, plain and clear, the court is bound to enforce the contract as it is written, and parties are bound to the terms agreed upon. In that sense, we submit that the terms of contract one and two are unequivocal, plain and clear. The parties are therefore bound to those terms, and more importantly, this orbital tribunal is then bound to enforce those terms. And in enforcing those terms, it is our submission that the tribunal will find that one, um, contract one is not linked to contract two, and vice versa. And two, the tribunal will also find that it was a specific term, clearly agreed that the purchase of Casta would be on its own. Um, Due to time, I'll then move to the second one, which is our commercial construction. Um, I'll refer the tribunal to the authority of Lord Napier versus R.F. Kershaw. Again, I'll, I'll paraphrase, where it was established that in interpreting the language of commercial document, 
the court will favor a commercially sensible construction which will give effect to the party's intention. And again, the intention we've stated is the agreed terms of condition, terms and conditions we've already stated. Um, in doing so, it's our submission that it is, it does not make commercial sense to then argue that with the parties against the background of the agreed terms and conditions, there is no commercial sense to then try and totally annihilate and terminate the transaction. Contract two, standing alone, agreed terms can proceed, and it makes commercial sense for it to proceed that way. Um, I think I'll end here to give my colleagues so that we, we do not run out of time. Um, but we did note that there was a slight issue with the mic at a certain point and the question, so we will perhaps um, a minute or two extra, three minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, esteemed members of the tribunal, um, we now have to address the pivotal question, uh, whether there was uh, a binding contract between Paul Smith and uh, Peter Badera in terms of the email that was sent by Paul Smith uh, to Peter Badera, having got to the fact that at the time, uh, Peter Badera was not aware of the contents of the email. Basically, we are submitting that there is a binding contract uh, between Peter Badera and Paul Smith, and we are basing that uh, position, having regard to the unit right principles, uh, where we are looking at uh, that there was an effective uh, acceptance of the contract, of the, of the uh, offer that was uh, given by Peter Badera to Paul Smith, to finish your submission. And therefore, we submit that uh, the tribunal should make that finding that there was uh, a valid contract between Paul Smith and Peter Badera. And I hand over to my uh, colleague, uh, Lesego. Lesego Bulawe, um, I'll be dealing with the issue of what award should this tribunal made. That has been made clear in our submissions and will, in the interest of time, um, Reed has said that the hour the hours that should be made in this uh, matter is as pleaded in the submissions. Thank you. Thank you, Sadik team. That is your time. Um, over to the panel of arbitrators. If you have any uh, very brief questions in which to pose to the Sadik team, um, you may indicate so. Otherwise, we will be calling the next team uh, to proffer their arguments in respect of the moot question. Thank you, though, Sadik team. No, we, we don't have any questions. Like, just to let you know, as far as the argument is concerned. We have, of course, read your submissions. So please bear that in mind. I know 20 minutes is a very short time, but uh, it's called chess clock rules. And you'll come across it often in international arbitration. Thank you. All right, next we will be calling the team that is representing Mr. Paul Smith to the stage. Um, and that team is uh, Advocates for Transformation. If you could just make your way um, to the stage, please. Again, just a reminder to the teams that are up next, you will be provided with 20 minutes in which to make your submissions. So we would suggest that you use your time wisely. And the Advocates for Transformation team, which is representing Mr. Paul Smith, is comprised of Bouche Lekokotla, Camille Premid, Sichaba Mohapi, Kitumete Mashishi, Zusipe Nako, and Tabang Matopo. When you're ready, team, your time starts now. Sorry, can I just ask before you begin, do you have a spokesman or are you going to do it individually? Do we have that? Sorry. A spokesman is one person going to talk, we or do. all of you going to talk? We do. So it's myself, Bucheli Kokotla, as well as uh, Mr. Camille Pramit. Good, thank you. Thank you, team. Don't worry, you still have your full 20 minutes on the clock. <laughs> Haven't subtracted that. And you may go ahead and begin. Um, so the issues for determination before this tribunal are the following. 
The first is whether this tribunal has jurisdiction to determine the two um, disputes that arise between the parties. The second one is the applicable body of law. Um, the third being whether there's a valid contract, firstly between Mr. Smith um, and um, Mr. Patella, as well as the, sec the, the second issue, which is whether there is a, co a valid contract between Mr. Souza and Ms. Mr. Smith. Um, the next issue is uh, whether, what is the nature of all of these transactions? Are they related? Are they separate? And then lastly, the issue of the award that this tribunal is to make. So I will deal with the first three issues uh, and Mr. Premit will deal with the nature of the transactions as well as the award. Now, starting with the first issue of um, jurisdiction, I'll start by setting out what is not in contention. So between Mr. Smith and Mr. Souza, the issue of jurisdiction is not in dispute. Um, uh, our learned friends for Mr. Souza have confirmed this. They've also confirmed that the applicable law, insofar as Smith and De Souza are concerned, is also not in dispute. However, these two issues are in dispute insofar as uh, Smith is concerned, as well as Mr. Patella. Now, the submissions that we make on behalf of Mr. Smith is that the tribunal is actually clothed with jurisdiction to determine uh, the dispute uh, between these two parties. And we rely on Article 31 of the AFSA International Rules. Um, I will not read it in detail, but I will just summarize it. It allows for the tribunal to um, decide any dispute that is between it. Um, firstly, whether the parties have agreed uh, on, the, on the dispute, and secondly, it allows the tribunal itself uh, to decide on its own jurisdiction, including whether there is an arbitration agreement for starters, and if that arbitration agreement forms part of a contractual agreement, uh, Article 31 says th these two can be separated. So meaning that if um, it is found that there is no commercial agreement, that doesn't mean that the, um, automatically the tribunal doesn't have jurisdiction and the other way around. So these are two separate agreements. Now, our submissions on the jurisdiction of the tribunal, insofar as Mr. Patella and Mr. Smith are concerned, is premised on the following. When the emails were sent on the 16th of January, Mr. Patella to Smith, uh, telling him about his offer uh, of the diamond, um, he then allowed Mr. Smith to choose uh, the arbitral uh, body that will have jurisdiction. Our submission here is this. One, this was not conditional, as in he did not say, give me three options. He did not ask uh, to have a say in whatever body that will be chosen. He, just, he merely said, please choose the body. Smith comes back and he says, I'm choosing AFSA. Now, this is relevant not for this question, but for the question of the contract as well. Because on the 19th of January, when Smith comes back to, to Padella to say, I'm now happy to accept your contract, and um, Padella says, by the way, you can't accept the contract anymore because I've sold the diamond to a Russian businessman. What he does in question is, the issue, the issue of the arbitral body that he chose. So we are submitting that there was his chance to lay out everything that he has in dispute. He did not. Therefore, we submit that in, in the absence of that, the tribunal has jurisdiction. In fact, on the heads of argument of Badella, it seems to be that even though they start by not agreeing to the jurisdiction of the tribunal, but later on, we, we, we submit that they actually clothe this tribunal with jurisdiction because there are certain concessions that they make. For example, they say uh, where it appears that there is a gap. They say that that gap, the tribunal has the jurisdiction to close that gap and then decide on the applicable law, including um, the jurisdiction itself, but also 
the terms of the agreement, including the language and things like that. So we say that concession clothes the, juris uh, the tribunal with, with, with jurisdiction, and we say that this is common cause between um, um, Smith and uh, Patella. On the applicable law, as we already said, um, De Sousa doesn't have an issue with South African law, so that is settled. But insofar as Patella is concerned, we are actually not sure of his position because his team starts by questioning the applicable law and making um, alternatives. But at the end of their, of their written submissions, at least, they say they concede that South African law might have jurisdiction, but in the alternative, the Lesotho law um, may be clothed with jurisdiction. Our submission is that it's unequivocal that South African law has jurisdiction for the following reason. It's the principle that Mr. Patella himself accepts, which is the closest and the most real connection. Now, when we look at the facts, which law uh, between the South African law and the Lesotho law has the closest and the most uh, real connection? One, uh, Mr. Patella himself chose that he will deliver the diamond to South Africa. Had everything gone right, he would have delivered the diamond to uh, Mr. Smith in South Africa. But secondly, uh, Smith is um, domiciled or based in South Africa, and it would have been delivered to him, and presumably he would have paid in South Africa. So we say for these three reasons, South Africa has the closest and the most real connection with um, uh, to determine this dispute. And another issue that shows us that maybe Mr. Patella does not really take an issue with South African law having jurisdiction is insofar as when they discuss the issue of whether the contract is binding or not. He concedes that in Lesotho they don't have um, an equivalent of the Electronic and Communications and Transactions Act. He then says they only have a bill and then he applies South African law in so far as this is concerned. So we say that is a concession of the applicability. But then, assuming that we are not there yet, I will then take a step back and, and deal with whether there is a binding agreement or not, because that's the next issue that I'm dealing with uh, before Mr. Premit uh, takes over. Now we've got two different contracts. We submit that insofar as Smith and um, Patella are concerned, there is actually a binding contract. Uh, Patella does not agree. Now, the reason we say there is a binding contract is because after the offer was made, we then went to De Sousa to say, because uh, the dream of Smith is to own these heavenly twins, um, will she be interested in selling the, the other part of the twin? She agreed. We tell all of this to Patella, and on the 19th, when we come back to him, he says, by the way, I've sold the, the, the diamond to a, a, a Russian businessman. But now here, what we are concerned with is, is there a meeting of the mind? Is there an unequivocal agreement that we can say on the facts exist? It doesn't appear so, but what guides us is the nature of the communication that was agreed by the parties um, in, in terms of which um, they, will, they will communicate, accept offers, etc. Now, it's common cause that email was the chosen method. And as I said earlier, Mr. Smith re, um, refers, uh, Mr. Patella refers to the Alcoholic Actor, it's the Electronic Communications and Transactions Act. He refers to Actor and he accepts its applicability. Now, Actor says when we are dealing with email communication, when is the moment when an email is received? It says it's when it lands. I'll use colloquial language for when it lands on somebody's inbox. And if once they've received it, they can transfer it to a, another party. We've read Mr. Patella's submissions. He seems to accept that exactly is the position. But now he raises two defenses. 
He says the first one is by the time that Smith communicated his intention to accept the contract, the contract itself had expired by a fraction of time. And then the second one, um, I'll deal with the second one. Uh, on the first one, he says, the affliction of time is because of the three days delay between the 16th and the 19th of January. And in their heads of argument on behalf of Padela, our learned friend said, but he should have accepted on the 16th because they accept the common law position of South Africa that when there is no express agreement on um, when you can accept an offer, then we are dealing with reasonable time. And the only question for this tribunal to decide is, is a matter of a day unreasonable delay as alleged by Padela? Because even though the initial email was sent on the 16th, on the 17th, Smith goes to De Sousa and says, this is the offer I've received, I'm willing to accept it, but I want to find out um, if you are willing to sell me your diamond. Then the following day, which is on the 18th, uh, De Sousa comes back and says, absolutely. Then on the 19th, we communicate our intention. We submit that there is no unreasonable delay here. Uh, we, 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 we communicated on time and that it reached him. The fact that he says he saw it late, uh, we say it's immaterial because there is a factual issue that Patella does not address, which is even though he's apologetic in his email about not seeing the email earlier, what he doesn't say is when did he sell to the Russian businessman? That's unclear, but we say it's immaterial anyway because by the time we express our intention, he then knew that we had already accepted um, the, the contract. Um, the second point that they raise, may I just be given one second? Uh, he says that there's been a rejection of, of an offer by means of a counter offer. Now, how Badella premises this defense is to say, when Smith came back and said, I'm willing to accept your contract, but um, now because Ms. De Sousa has indicated that she's willing to sell me her diamond as well, uh, because I've got this dream of owning both, then um, I'll be happy to accept your contract. But now we, 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 we submit that this is not a counter offer because what it was, Smith did not accept Badella's contract on different terms. It was exactly the same contract. I'm buying this diamond for $10 million. All he told him in addition was that the Sousa has also agreed to sell me the, the, the diamond as well. Now, this raises the question that Mr. Premit will deal with, which is what is the nature of all of these transactions being looked at together as well as what is the status of the presumed agreement between uh, Smith and De Sousa. We say there was no agreement, but he will uh, take over and deal with in detail. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the panel, may I start at the end just reminding the panel what relief it is we seek on behalf of Mr. Smith. In respect of the first claim we seek, uh, that the tribunal find that there was a contract, Mr. Badella breached that contract, and that if damages are to flow, they would flow in due course. Obviously, specific performance is not available given the alleged on-selling of the diamond to the Ru unidentified Russian businessman who's obviously not subject to sanctions so he can perform these transactions and costs. In respect of the second claim, we seek that there's a finding that there was no contract at all, and consequently, that there is no enforceable agreement as against Mr. Smith and costs for the purposes of the suit. The reason I start there is because it's important to contextualize what it is we're dealing with as to whether or not it is a single contract or whether or not there are two separate contracts. For the purposes of the relief we seek, we say it's a distinction without a difference with respect. Self-evidently, the contract between Mr. Badella and Mr. Smith were self-executable on its own terms. If Mr. Smith had replied to Mr. Badella and made no further mention of Mr. Sousa, and I'm aware of mentioning that name with Justice Wallace on the panel, um, if he made no reference to De Sousa 
there can be no debate that there was a binding uh, contract that arose between them. So insofar as Mr. Badela is concerned, whether or not it is part of a single contract or not part of a single contract doesn't matter. The smith badela contract was self-executing and on its own terms. In respect of the second contract, which is perhaps the more interesting one, in light of the concessions made by our learned friends for uh, Mr. Sousa, the two points we would make in respect thereof is similar, is that if the terms of the smith badela contract are held side by side with the terms of the smith Sousa contract, there are significant distinctions between them. The first one is we would say that Mr. Smith made the so-called offer conditional on uh, uh, Ms. Smith, Ms. Mr. Sousa, I apologize, uh, making herself subject to the agreement that was at that stage going to be reached between Mr. Smith and Mr. Badela. The second critical point of distinction that we would make is that there were uh, explicitly conditional elements of the second, uh, uh, attached to the second transaction, because as uh, all teams agree, the commercial intention of the parties is fundamentally important. And here, what is incontrovertible is that Mr. Badela, Mr. Smith made it abundantly clear that the commercial purpose he wanted to achieve was owning both diamonds, not one of them in isolation from the other. So the second transaction was made explicitly conditional on the first in the sense that... Uh, what, what, what language... Sorry, Justice Wallace. What language used in the email exchange amounted to an express condition? Well, Justice Wallace, with all due respect, I'm, I'm, not, con I'm not contending that in the context of the smith de Sousa transaction, it was a conditional transaction or conditional contract in the way that we'd understand it. The position taken from our perspective is that no contract arose, and to the extent it's contended by Mr. Sousa that there was a contract that was, or that was uh, advanced, the uh, involvement of the fact that uh, if you look at page three of the document containing the facts, the email appears at the bottom, uh, it starts with, Dear Fernanda, uh, the second sentence is of critical importance. He I'm, says, anyway. I'm, I'm rather more concerned with the uh, manner in which Mr. Smith put his case uh, in his response to the AFSA Secretariat in accordance with the rules, uh, where he said that he's bringing a claim against Mr. Badella to enforce the Castor transaction. And if he fails in that case, then he is raising the defense against Fernanda de Souza that the purchase from her was only part of an overall transaction for the acquisition of the heavenly twins. And if Peter Badella is not liable to yes. him, then he's not liable. No. Now, uh, there's no basis in, any in, in, in Mr. Smith's response to the AFSA Secretariat that there was no contract at all. That's not, his, that's not his case, it's not the basis pleaded, and it's not the basis Mr. Souza's been brought to this tribunal. So how can you advance it? No, with respect, uh, Justice Wallace, I read it slightly differently because the question that was posed in the statement of, uh, in the questions that need determination is at page six, whether or not there were two transactions part of a single contract two or does minute each start warning, alone. Team. Thank you. Whereas the sentence you've just read out to me at line two talks about the purchase from her was only part of an overall transaction for the acquisition of the heavenly twins. And if Peter Badella is not liable to him, then he's not liable to Fernando de Souza. That's the point I make about it being a distinction with the difference. There's no you, suggestion. You, you, you can't take the formulation of that key issue as detracting from his response to the AFSA secretariat. Uh, Rules is rules, as Justice no, Thurgood with, Marshall with used respect, to say. With respect, Justice Wallace, I'm not suggesting they're at odds with each other. I'm reading them consistently. What I'm saying is that the transaction had two composite parts. The first one was the transaction with Mr. Badela, and the second part, which was then made subject to the Badela transaction being successful, was the subsequent transaction with uh, Mr. Sousa to achieve the overall commercial purpose of owning both heavenly twins and not one in isolation from the other. That, with respect, is my answer to the question, and I think that's the appropriate time at which I will end 
Mr. Smith's submissions as well. Thank you, Aftim. Um, unless the uh, panel has any further questions. I take it that there are no further questions. All right, thank you very much, Aftim. Thank you to our speakers there. Last but certainly not least, we will now be calling uh, Young AFSA's uh, representative team who represents Mr. Peter Badella um, in this dispute. Young AFSA's team is made out of Priyanka Soni, Ledile Maloka, Melandri Naidu, Carl Melville, Amandla Mahorana, and Nicole Gilfillan. Might we just um, query whether the Young AFSA team has any speakers and who those speakers might be, and thereafter I will start your 20 minute time period. Good afternoon, members of the tribunal. My name is Kyle Melville, and I, along with the colleagues to my left, represent Mr. Peter Badele. Ms. Makungwana and I will be presenting the oral argument today on behalf of Mr. Badele. With regard to the issues for determination, I will be dealing with issues one and three, respectively, and Ms. Makungwana will deal with issues two and four, respectively. At the end of each of our respective submissions, we will detail the award that we believe this honorable tribunal should make. Before dealing with the first issue, we wanted to place on record that we note and accept the Tribunal's Directive of the 4th of April, which ruled that any additional oh, factual and expert yeah. evidence outside of the factual complex provided yeah. is inadmissible and will hold no probative value. Also, we note that Mr. Souza has no claim against our client in this respect, and therefore, I do not touch on the Polix transaction. Turning to issue one and whether or not this honorable tribunal has the jurisdiction to, to, to determine any disputes between Mr. Smith and Mr. Badele, as a starting point, we accept that this tribunal has the competence to rule on its own jurisdiction. We acknowledge that this is an accepted principle in pro-arbitration jurisdictions and is highlighted in both the South African International yeah, Arbitration Act yeah, by yeah, the model law, as well as article 31 of the AFSA International Rules. Our argument, however, is that in exercising this competence, this tribunal should rule that it doesn't have the requisite jurisdiction to determine any disputes between these parties. Our primary argument is that pro-arbitration jurisdictions, such as South Africa and the United Kingdom, define an arbitration agreement as an agreement. The email from Mr. Badele to Mr. Smith on the 16th of January was nothing more than an offer to nominate an arbitral institution in the event this transaction crystallized further, which, as we know, did not transpire. Here, our learned friends, for Mr. Smith, confuse the distinction between nominating an arbitral institution versus appointing one. In the written submissions of Mr. Smith, our learned friends, at paragraph 17.3, suggest that Mr. Badele gave a unilateral right to appoint an arbitral body. It is clear that this isn't the case when one considers the express wording of Mr. Badele's email on 16 January where he states, you must nominate an arbitration institution. Another point worth mentioning is the blurred distinction between the so-called written requirement vis-a-vis -vis the consensus required to establish an arbitration agreement. Authorities of sources such as Mr. Gary Bourne have noted that simply satisfying the written requirement does not automatically Mr. mean... Mr. Melville, you read only part of that sentence. If you're going to buy Custer, you must nominate an arbitration institution that could deal with any dispute between us. It's not just the nomination. It's saying you identify the institution that could deal with any dispute. That's the language used. So Thank you, Mr. Arbitrator. We still believe that the distinction between nomination and, appoint and appointing an arbitral tribunal is, is that's, relevant. That's a rather rather narrow passing of the language. Uh, you would expect um, some addition such as, and if I'm agreeable to that institution, well then we'll go ahead. But if I don't like it, we'll have to sort out something else. 
That isn't the way it's worded. It's quite straightforward. Nominate the institution that could deal with any dispute. But with respect, Mr. Arbitrator, again, we just hold the view that the distinction between nominating and appointing is crucial in this, in this situation. Is Mr. Badella looking at his Oxford English Dictionary before he wrote the email? That is something Nobody. we haven't conferred with our clients, unfortunately. <laughs> Another point worth mentioning is the blurred distinction between the so-called written requirement vis-a-vis um, -vis the consensus required to establish an arbitration agreement. As mentioned, authoritative sources such as Mr. Gary Bourne have noted that sim simply satisfying the written requirement does not automatically mean that the, requ the requisite consent has been established. Case law supports this. In Bothell v. Hitachi, the Washington District Court held that where a series of documents refer to a proposed arbitration agreement and are so vague as to be meaningless and no further explanation is provided, such does not constitute a valid arbitration agreement. We submit, with respect, that this is no different to the situation before us. It follows that without a valid arbitration agreement, this tribunal, with respect, does not have the requisite jurisdiction. In the alternative, we request that the AFSA court determine that the law of the seat be that of England and Wales in accordance with Article 18.2 of the AFSA International Rules. Without doubt, this honorable tribunal is cognizant that this arbitration, can be arbitration agreement can be regarded as pathological or blank given its failure to identify a seat of arbitration. The seat of arbitration is not only important from a procedural point of view, but absent a choice of law provision in the main contract, and in line with the seminal decision of Enker versus Chubb, it is accepted that the law of the seat is to be regarded as the law governing the arbitration agreement. To support our submission that England and Wales be directed as the seat of arbitration, we note that England and Wales has a pro-arbitration regime. There is no inconvenience to the parties, given the seat is a legal concept as opposed to a physical one. Any award made by the tribunal will be subject to the New York Convention, and it will adhere to the neutrality principle given that Mr. Smith is a South African national and Mr. Badele a Lesotho national. Is there anything in the letters exchanged which indicates any connection with England or Wales? No, Mr. Arbitrator. For, on our basis, that is the reason why we would, su we would suggest... But on what basis in law do you then suggest that? The fundamental basis is that the neutrality principle in international arbitration supports the idea that not to, it wouldn't subject the arbitration or the procedure of the arbitration to favor one of the parties. What is the effectiveness then of holding it under the AFSA rules? We believe that you could still hold it under the AFSA rules and let the procedure itself be governed and by... And where would you hold the arbitration? Uh, physically, Mr. Arbitrator? Yes. We could, you could hold it in Southern Africa given... But would you go to London to hear uh, a dispute between a South African and a Lesotho citizen? Uh, no, Mr. Arbitrator. Uh, we could hold the arbitration in Southern Africa. It's given that the uh, arbitral seat is a legal concept as opposed to a physical one. If you require court assistance, the parties still have to physically go to the UK, appoint a UK council, and that would be a problem or costly for the parties, isn't it? That may very there's, well. there's 15 Sadiq countries, and these parties are in, uh, in Sadiq. Can't you think of a, a neutral Sadiq country? That is, that is one of the risks that we, that we, along with our clients, have taken into account. Mm. On the basis that the law of England and Wales is directed to govern the arbitration agreement, we submit that this case is no different to that of Black Sea Commodities, where the United Kingdom High Court of Justice found that no arbitration agreement came into existence because no substantive contract was agreed to and the parties were not in agreement regarding the arbitration clause itself. In light of the fact that our learned friends have failed to address the lack of a seat of arbitration and in the event South Africa is regarded as the seat of arbitration, we submit that this case before us is no different to the recent Supreme Court of Appeal decision in Remo Ventures where South Africa's penultimate court found there to be no arbitration agreement given the conditions leading to the enforcement of the main contract was not adhered to. Again, something we submit is no different to the case before us.
In summary, the relief sought in respect of issue one is that the tribunal rules that it has no jurisdiction to hear this matter. And in the alternative, allows the AFSA court to rule that the lex arbitrary be that of England and Wales. Those are my submissions relating to issue one, Mr. President. Thank you, Kyle. And to my honorable tribunal, we thank you for inviting us and having us. I will be dealing with the second issue which relates to the body of law proper for the determination of the disputes. Now, we are indebted to the tribunal in the question posed to us in respect to the seat of the arbitration. And in light of my argument on the body of proper law, I will make a submission that um, there is a discretion to be exercised by this honorable tri um, tribunal in respect of Article 19 of the AFSA International Rules. But before I do that, I would like to set out that it is common cause between the parties that there was no election of the body of laws that was to be applied in the resolution of any disputes arising between them. Therefore, we are here asking for this honorable tribunal to make that determination on behalf of the parties. Now, the question of the law that governs the arbitration agreement, where the law applicable to the commercial contract differs from the seat of the arbitration, arose in the anchor case, as mentioned by my colleague. In that case, the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom held that where there is no agreement on the choice of law to govern the arbitration agreement, or the law which is to govern the contract as a whole, the closely connected standard ought to be applied. Now, our colleagues agree with the closely connection standard, which, was, which is also recognized by the Rome 1 regulation and the Swiss rules of international arbitration. In regard to Article 4 of the Rome 1 regulation, it states that sh the contract shall be governed by the law of the, of the country where the party required to effect the characteristic performance of the contract has its habitual residence. This means that, for an example, in a contract of sale, delivery is the characteristic performance. Therefore, we would need to consider where the party making the delivery is habitually resident and or conducts his business. As recent as February 2023, the ICC held in the Carlos Kaufman case, which is properly cited in our written submissions, that the connecting factors, there are connecting factors specifically applicable to arbitration agreements, such as the seat, language, administering institution, and the applicable rules of the arbitration, as well as the place of performance. In this regard, and should it be found that there exists such an arbitration agreement, it is submitted that the body of law regulating the arbitration agreement would be South African law as the location of the AFSA as the administration, as the administering institution, my apologies, and the place of performance in the commercial contract. Also, in January 2022, the Swiss Arbitration Center held in the case of Prolific that the closest connection test is an objective one and based on the intensity of the nexus between the case and the possible applicable laws. And this is done by considering where the contract is performed or the place of business or habitual residence of the party who performs an obligation. With respect to the commercial contract, where such is found to exist, which is denied by Badella, it is submitted that the intense nexus of the case and the possible applicable law would be the South African law. And the emphasis is would. It, we are not making any concessions that the South African law is applicable, as will be advanced. And we say it would be South African law in this case because that is where the contract would be performed. However, and with consideration to Article 4 of the Rome 1 regulation, which places emphasis on characteristic performance of the con commercial contract, the applicable law based on the closest connection standard would arguably be Lesotho, where Badella is habitually resident. As for Council for Disosa, we will not even entertain the concept of the unit right principles because Angola and Lesotho are not signatories and the parties did not agree. And as my colleague has indicated, we will not be entertaining that. 
therefore with respect, we submit that in line with Article 19 of the AFSA International Rules, this honorable tribunal exercise its discretion that the body of law applicable in this dispute is between the South African law and Lesotho law. With respect, we submit that both jurisdictions follow a Roman Dutch law and common English, English common law regime. Therefore, they are effectively similar. In this regard, considering that South African law has a more matured um, approach or a more matured law, we would agree, we would ask this tribunal to please consider that South African law is the law appropriate for the determination of the dispute. You say there's a difference between South African law and Lesotho law insofar as the facts of this case, in other words, contract is concerned. Does it matter as far as your argument is concerned? Thank you yeah. for the question. So, with the Roman Dutch law, well, basically South Africa and Lesotho follow the same regime. So the law that will apply in determining the dispute would effectively be similar. Except uh, your colleagues for, for Mr. Smith, uh, relied upon a South African statute which is not applicable in Lesotho. So uh, for saying that it was the receipt on a server of the email message that constituted the acceptance of the contract. Um, whereas if one were to deal with it under Roman Dutch common law, uh, the requirement of a contract is that the, it must the uh, acceptance must be communicated to the offeror. And, and the evidence is, as I understand it, Mr. Badela says, I didn't, I didn't actually get it because I was out of the office at the time. So I, it wasn't communicated to me and I only found out about it after I'd sold the diamond to somebody else. Thank you for the question. So in that respect, and we note that um, counsel for Smith sought to argue our case, obviously, in misconstrued terms, which I, so I seek to, to rectify. But Dela accepts that, yes, according to Section 22, Subsection 2 of the ACTA, which is a South African law, which is mirrored by the Lesotho Electronic Transactions and Electronic Bill of 2013, and these, uh, and these statutes are substantially similar to Article 15 of the model law, which is an international law. So let's unpack that for a little bit. So on the 19th of January, 2024, at, 13, at 1500, an email is received by Badella. We accept, according to the reception theory, there is um, purported acceptance. However, you now have to consider the form and the manner of acceptance that is being argued. And but Della's argument is that in terms of Roman Dutch law and English common law regime, and there has to be an offer and acceptance has to be unconditional and unequivocal. We, agree, we argue that that was not the case in this regard. The offer was based on two conditions. One, that Smith responds as soon as possible and that he should keep the transaction confidential. He already breached the confidentiality aspect of it. Now let's focus on the time aspect. Article 18, sub-article uh, sub 2 of the United Nations Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods, which we refer to as the CISG, states that an acceptance is not effective if it is not within the fixed time or within a reasonable period of time taking into account the circumstances of the transaction and the rapidity of the means of communication. This was, what, this was echoed in Laws versus Rutherford. I will not go into detail in that regard. Safe to say, on, on about 17 January 2024, Smith already knew that he would accept Badella's offer, but he felt to respond as soon as possible or within a reasonable period of time, which would have been between the 16th or 17th of January, give or take when he received the email and prior to engaging with Ms. D. Souza. 
or on the 18th of January after Mr. D after Ms. De Sousa responded to him. Therefore, we, 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 we argue that on that basis alone, there can't be acceptance. Obviously, we also address the effluxion of time. And we also address the fact that there was effectively a, a counter offer made by Mr. Smith to Mr. Vadella. I will come to this point at a later stage because we still need to, to deal with the third issue. And should we run out of time before we address that particular point, I would humbly ask that this honorable tribunal defer to our written submissions. Two minutes left. Honorable members of the tribunal, I now turn to the third issue for determination, which is whether the alleged transactions between Mr. Badela, Mr. Smith, and Mr. Souza constitutes a single or separate transaction. transaction. On behalf of Mr. Badela, we respectfully submit that these transactions are separate. In light of our, our learned friends' reliance on auction alliance in their written submissions, the following three examples will support our contention that the commercial construction of the exchanges supports a separate transaction. Firstly, both diamonds have been separated for an extended period of time, yet are still prized and valuable uh, possessions. In support of this contention, that the diamonds have been held separately for an extended period, I refer to Mr. Sosa's email of 19 January. The value of the diamonds individually is also clear from Mr. Smith's email to Mr. Sosa on the 17th of January, where Mr. Smith regards the asking price of $10 million as fair. Secondly, the picture of the two diamonds shows that despite being cut from a single stone, the diamonds were cut and set in a manner to be regarded as indiv individual pieces and not to be joined or formed into a uni new unique item. The value of the diamonds are also not contingent on each other, as would be the case if they were a pair of earrings. Furthermore, the names of the diamonds resemble those of the Castor and Pollock stars, both individual stars in the Gemini constellation. Our third and final submission on this point is having the two diamonds together is nothing more than a sentimental game for Mr. Smith as opposed to a commercial one. The sentimental nature of owning both diamonds is clear and is expressed in Mr. Sosa's email to Mr. Smith on 18 January. Also, Mr. Smith confirms that it was his ambition to own the two diamonds. In his email to Mr. Sosa, dated 17 January, Mr. Smith states, if you were prepared to sell, then I will achieve a lifelong ambition in one go. In light of this factual position, we submit that the appropriate commercial construction of these exchanges Time. is that the alleged transactions are to be regarded as separate. Thank you. That concludes the submission from the three parties. If there are no questions from the members of the tribunal. You've conceded that the electricity Electronic Communications Act is applicable here and that uh, messages are deemed to be delivered when they are capable of being retrieved. Uh, but you've sort of tried to excuse uh, that the validity of the contract by coming up with other arguments of a fluxion of time, etc. Does the law provide those exceptions? And can you excuse the provisions of the law by what you are arguing? Thank you for the question. So the act should be read also in conjunction with the, the laws that are governing the actual contracts being created. It is not a, a statute that needs to be read in isolation because there are fundamental and essential requirements for the, valid, for the conclusion of a valid agreement. And the act facilitates that in light of the digital world that we're moving into. It does not seek to now negate the essential requirements. Thank you. Thank you very much to the Young AFSA members team. So we've heard some interesting submissions from all three teams, and if we were arbitrators, as our esteemed panel here is, we're going to go away and consider everything now. However, there is another player in this game. With us is a team from the University of Pretoria. They have used a, an AI model, an artificial intelligence model, to deal with the dispute as well, and to render an award. 
So give us a few more details about that. They'll come and join us in a second and some brief details about them first. Professor Sylvia Papadopoulos is an expert in law, technology, and AI. She is a full-time associate professor in the Department of Private Law at the University of Pretoria and also serves as the acting director for the Center of Intellectual Property Law. She obtained a BLC, LLB, LLM, or cum laude, and an LD from the University of Pretoria, where she wrote her thesis on selected aspects of e-commerce, digital content, and consumer protection in South Africa. Amongst others, she is an advocate of the High Court of South Africa and an academic at UP. Professor Papadopoulos has advised the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee on aspects of the Protection of Personal Information Act. And she is the current chair of the New Technologies and Law Working Group for the prestigious Law Schools Global League. Yes, our second professor who will be assisting in presenting the machine that will also consider the question which um, the three respective teams argued ever so brilliantly is Professor Rashri Babulal Frank, who is an associate professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Pretoria. Uh, professor Babulal Frank is also a member of the International Association of Procedural Lawyers, um, as well as a member of the Rules Board of South Africa. Uh, she's also on the AFSA panel as a commercial mediator as well as an arbitrator. She holds an LLB from UKZN, an LLM from UCT, and an uh, MBA from the University of South Wales. Her academic scholarship has been cited by the High Court, Water Tribunal, Companies Tribunal, Rental Housing Tribunal, just to mention a few. Her areas of expertise include civil litigation and alternative dispute resolution. Finally, our third professor who will be joining the panel that will present the machine that will consider the question is the head or dean of the Faculty of Law of the University of Pretoria, and might we stress the first female dean um, of the Faculty of Law of the University of Pretoria. Professor Alsabi Skuman um, holds a BLC from the University of Pretoria as well as an LLB, LLD. Professor Al Sabi specializes in uh, private international law, conflict of laws, as well as comparative law. She's published widely in these areas and has made various um, invaluable contri uh, contributions to international legal encyclopedias, as well as submissions to law commissions, um, both in South Africa as well as internationally. She's advised law firms in South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, the UK, the US, uh, again, just to name a few. Um, Professor Al Sabi is an elected associate member of the International Academy of Comparative Law, as well as a full member and judge of the expert committee of the St. Petersburg International Legal Forum. Now, if you are like anything like me and wondering how it is that this AI that these professors will tell us about very shortly will consider the legal question or even in fact take into account the arguments which have been presented to today, if at all, um, we invite our professors on stage to um, give us a PowerPoint presentation in respect of how that process uh, insofar as the AI consideration of the mood question will run. And with that, might we just give them a round of applause and invite them to the stage. All right. Good afternoon, or should I rather say good evening, esteemed colleagues. I know it's been a very long day, so you'll be happy to hear that it'll be quite short and succinct um, as, as possible, um, given the, the, the topic of AI is, is, is quite vast and, and awe-inspiring, if I can put it that way. So thank you for the opportunity to present to you on AI, generative AI, and the future of law. Now, I am going to start, uh, there we go, with just a very basic overview of AI. Um, and the question is, what is AI? What makes AI different to any other software that we have become accustomed to? So both the OECD and the new EU AI Act have substantially similar definitions. Whereas the software that we are used to is a single set of code, when you come to AI, it is a set of technologies. So it's several technologies that work together 
to produce the outputs that it does. Its deployment is diverse in its sectors from manufacturing, healthcare, um, bolstering productivity, and addressing critical global challenges. It is everywhere already. Nevertheless, alongside these benefits, AI introduces very complex issues, including economic shifts, labor market disruptions, and impacts on democracy and human rights. Okay, so generative AI is one example of AI. Um, so it is a branch of AI, and there are several branches or several different types of AI. And generative AI is focused on creating new original content through learned patterns and data. It is the result of extensive training on enormous, enormous data sets, allowing it to not only recognize, but also generate complex text, video, and images from simple text instructions. It demonstrates a capability of responding to nuanced queries, summarizing succinctly the content of, of, of documents, and creating content that is credible, correct, and creative. ChatGPT, um, as we will demonstrate, shows proficiency in processing and analyzing substantial volumes of legal text. It has already passed the bar exam in America and produced some pretty good legal drafting in our own courts. This image that you see on the slide here and the previous slide was also AI generated. I asked it to give us a visual um, depiction of what generative AI does. The result is that picture there and it gives us the caption. Here's an image that captured the essence of what generative AI does, translating streams of digital information into unique creations. But ChatGPT is a very general generative AI. It has amazing capabilities. And what we want to set out today to, to show you is that even though it is a general generative AI, it is still pretty capable. But when you take generative AI and you train it on law-specific materials, the legislation, the cases, the judgments, the articles, the law textbooks, it is truly next level and is capable of almost, or of generating almost anything a human lawyer would be able to in a matter of minutes. It streamlines your workflows across by, or sorry, it streamlines your workflows by assisting in the preparation of detailed documents it can draft contracts, it can automate legal process, conducting due diligence, and it can provide insights that were once only attainable through very long human effort. It offers the agility to respond to a myriad of legal queries, enhancing the quality and efficiency of legal services that we can offer. Oopsie. All right, now it's a little bit different because I'm sure many of you have come across various forms of legal tech that are already in practice, that are already being used. Here are some of um, them listed on this particular slide. I'm not going to go through all of that. The one that I might like to highlight is the immersive technology and advanced computing because these are emerging and they are new and they are AI driven and they include the use of virtual and augmented reality. This is used for presenting evidence into courts. It is used in obviously training and, and, and legal education as well as for legal research and um, the mooters might have used it for practice sessions. 
All right. Using generative AI specifically has spawned since the launch of ChatGPT in November 2021, has spawned a number of new legal specific tools. Most recently, Thomson Reuters um, has incorporated generative AI into its practical law platform. It has added in a contract clause finder, which is a comprehensive clause library integrated with Microsoft Word to help you in your contract drafting. Additionally, they have a co-counsel tool which uses generative AI to assist you in statement preparations, heads of argument, document summarization, and data extraction. Another is from the world's largest repository of law in the world, LexisNexis. They have launched Lexis Plus AI. And this, I have seen the demonstrations. I've been part of a panel that had a view, uh, a preview of the capabilities of this particular tool. And it is a conversational interactive search engine. It can draft legal documents that many of us only aspire to draft. It can draft clauses in contracts with nuances and different facts. Um, it can attend to client communications on your behalf based on a simple, please answer the client with this. It gives you legal summaries of vast repositories of data in seconds. You can upload documents extract and summarize the salient points in those documents. And the most important thing about it is it gives you the legal citations for your arguments that are cited properly and without any imagination or hallucination, as they call it in generative AI. Truly, truly a remarkable um, change. ChatGPT itself, the general AI, you can use that to create your own custom versions of ChatGPT without developer or coding experience. You just have to look through the explore the Ch GPTs and it gives you the prompts, it gives you you cut and paste, you tell it what it wants to do and it does it for you. For example, in a teaching and learning experiment, I created an ICT law tutor to help students with studying and preparing for exams or tests. The moot arguers might have benefited on the ECTA Act from that tutor. Within the last couple of weeks, Microsoft has launched a product called Azure. For $200, Microsoft Azure allows you to create multifaceted AI-powered tools without any tech knowledge. You literally cut and paste, give it its instructions, and the AI creates AI for you. Fit for purpose to do exactly what you want it to do. So you can create the AI to deal with an arbitration award. It will accept the written submissions. As Rashri will show you, it will show, it will take your verbal arguments. And it will then create your award using hallucination-free citations based on applicable law. What we can say from this is that technology is increasingly capable. And that capability is increasing at an exponential rate. If we look at the neural networks, the heart of machine learning and large language models that form the basis of ChatGPT and other generative AI, it is estimated that their capabilities are increasing or doubling every three and a half months. So if you think it's amazing now, we don't know where it will go in a couple of years' time. Um, and that's where I'm going to start, because what I want to show to you is where we are now, 
based on a very general $20 a month chat GPT that has passed the bar exam and let you think about the future. Where will it go? If it's capable of that without being trained on legal materials, where will it go? And what would an AI trained on legal materials in a relevant jurisdiction be able to do? Rashri, I'll hand over to you. Okay, so everyone, um, I'm at the back here because for some reason my computer wouldn't connect, but you don't have to focus on me. I want you to focus on the screen. So what, what we find that's important here is that AI requires human interaction, right? And so it's very important that, of course, um, the, the person that is inputting the information has the requisite you know, expertise as well as specialization in the area in order to know what are the right questions to ask. And so the submissions made by the three MOOT teams basically was in excess of 88 pages or so. We could even say about 100. And that information was put through ChatGBT, as well as the facts. And so I'm just giving you an indication how much volume it can take. And I basically did that in under a minute. And what it did was it generated an analysis of each team's submission. And for purposes of the exercise that uh, we'll do, which award is which one, I'm not going to reveal too much depth in terms of that visually, but I'm sure by applying your mind you will get it. And so um, what's important also is that we have a tool that can give us information really fast. It's quick, it's efficient, and it's accurate. And so for example, if you tell ChatGBT, basically, this, these are the facts, these are all the submissions, what award would you generate, considering on page six, those were the issues? And then it generates a, an award, which it did, and then you can ask further questions. So, for example, it gave um, a justification about, it depends on the contractual principles, as well as the case law, as well as the rules. And then you can ask it for, give me more details about specific case law and specific contract principles. And then it gives you the citations of the cases. So, for example, it cited English cases. It gave two lines about the principle. Then I went and verified those cases as well. It was accurate, it did match. And so um, what, what has been a development with ChatGBT is we have 4.0, as you'll see there. So the free version is 3.5, and of course there's restrictions and limitations in that you can't upload a lot of documents on the free version. Also, on the free version, there was inaccuracies. So, for example, if you asked for case law, it gave you incorrect citations. And ironically, some of my students for the um, arbitration assignments, they quoted that incorrect citations. But because, of course, um, I know the literature out there, I was able to obviously, you know, catch them out. And so, we are very impressed by uh, 4.0, and of course, it's, it's getting better and improving with time, and it, it doesn't require years for improvement. For example, last year we had 3.5, this year we have 4.0. And so there's another version that is coming out as well. And so where does that leave us as academics, as legal practitioners, because there are obviously, I would call 
them traditional folk that are scared of, you know, this so-called technology. But what we find is that technology does indeed save time. So for example, there are judges in America that have used ChatGBT to generate their judgments, and they would input the evidence that they heard in court, and they want an analysis that ChatGBT gives. And they use that in their award and in their judgments, and it wasn't, of course, appealed. And so we reflect and we think that the world is changing before our eyes, and if we, if we don't change with it, then we obviously will fall behind. And so um, my proposal is that we walk the path with AI because, of course, AI needs us in order to generate the information. And AI is the wealth of knowledge that we can tap into. So thank you, um, Cynthia. Uh, Sylvia, over to you. Right. Professor Richard Suskind um, is a pretty f decorated professor from the UK and he uses a Black & Decker training anecdote to explain how we need to think about AI. And his anecdote goes something like this. When there are new employees at Black & Decker, and they are being trained in the company protocols. They are asked whether or not this particular piece of equipment is what the company sells or not. The answer is an obvious yes. We all know Black & Decker are one of the world's largest sellers of power tools in the world. The trainers will then tell the audience that they are completely wrong because that is not actually what the customer wants. What they want is that hole on this particular slide. And the lesson for us lawyers is that we tend to think around how we do things today and how we can improve them with technology instead of considering how to do things differently or how things will be done differently by technology. Now, up to this point, we've had a look at the tools that assist us as lawyers, possibly taking over some of our traditional tasks, sometimes giving us a bit of reprieve and a bit of time, saving time, saving a bit of money. But I would not be doing justice to the topic if I didn't consider things that will be different in the future. So we will see a rise in regulatory technologies. Tools are already streamlining legal process and tasks, but we will see a rise in regulatory technology. So the same mechanisms that we already find in online chess games that prevent you from making a cheating move or an incorrect move will be upscaled to regulate most things in life, all right? So they will do the risk analysis, they will do the compliance checks, and they will make sure that the technology and the processes that we are engaged in comply with applicable law. The legal profession has to adapt and become digitally and AI literate. This entails a comprehensive understanding of how digital influences legal proceedings, client engagement, and the management of information with a particular focus on cybersecurity. It's a matter of fulfilling our duty of competence when advising clients and adjudicating matters with proficiency. This not only includes knowing which questions to pose to these tools, 
but also critically evaluating their outputs. It requires an acute awareness of ethical implications of using AI and ensuring that we uphold the legal profession's dedication to confidentiality, impartiality, equality, and justice. Traditional fee structures will change and access to justice will increase incrementally over the next couple of years. And I'm predicting the next three to four years, not long term. <laughs> so in an era where AI is pivotal to legal operations, traditional fee structures within law firms are on the brink of a huge disruption. Ease of use, time and cost saving will force the uptake of technology and AI to remain relevant and competitive. AI's potential to democratize access to justice is inevitable. It will reshape public expectations around the delivery and cost of legal services. Consider the scenario. If law firm A bills three hours for drafting court documents, and law firm B bills for only 30 minutes to review an AI-generated document, it's clear where business is likely to gravitate. There's an integrity consideration in this as well. Lawyers cannot justifiably bill for three hours of work if AI assistance reduces the task to 30 minutes. With legal-focused AI chatbots and sophisticated AI tools, basic legal guidance will become more accessible and affordable. And this shift will gradually alter the public's expectation of legal services, delivery, and pricing. For this, law firms are facing an evolution that challenges the status quo of billable hours and fee arrangements. Clients are empowered with alternatives, and they will no longer accept pricing models as the only option. Incorporating AI into service offerings is not just about cutting costs, it's about creating value. It's about enhancing the client experience by providing swift, accurate, and cost-effective legal solutions. And it's about lawyers redefining their roles as not merely providers of a legal service, but as holistic problem solvers in a complex digital world. Transparency becomes paramount. Clients today are more tech, more tech savvy and expect to know if and how AI is being utilized in handling their matters. They are interested in understanding how the use of AI might translate into cost efficiency, better, faster resolution of their legal disputes. All right, and I'm going to close off just with a summary of the risks and the benefits that AI will bring to law and practice. Some of these benefits I have already mentioned. Efficiency and speed, cost reduction, improved access, enhanced accuracy. Predictive analytics is a very, very interesting field in AI. They have used predictive analytics to um, find weaknesses in cases. They will input a judge's past um, decisions and based on that, determine the way in which that judge might decide your case based on your facts in front of you. And it has predicted the case outcomes with a 98% accuracy. All right, the risks are quite a lot longer than the list that I've put here, but these would be the most. Dependency and over-reliance on AI will release or will decrease in fundamental legal skills among professionals. Make us lazy. We won't be thinking too much for ourselves anymore. There are significant privacy and security concerns around the data, using it, inputting it, 
um, where is it stored, how is it used further on along the line. There are ethical and accountability issues. Job displacement is a very real problem. Um, it, it's something that is concerning the whole world. Bias in AI algorithms is something which is, keeps popping up. Legal and regulatory uncertainty, which is the case that we are sitting with in South Africa at the moment. And then the loss of the personal touch, the human touch. Humans will always want a human to speak to about their problems. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the in a nutshell, the amazing AI that is available, that is still coming. Um, I do know that you know you, you sort of sit with two two hands on one side. It's just this this amazement at what is coming and what could be, and on the other side you have the the, the doom and gloom and the end of the world and your Terminator scenarios. I think the truth is somewhere in between, but digital and AI literacy remains paramount for all in the legal fraternity. You cannot effectively use or control technology that you don't really understand. Thank you. Oh, hello everybody. So I know it's been a very long day and I promise I will be very brief. Um, first of all, I, I want to thank Michael, Cooper, and AFSA for inviting us, for giving us this opportunity. When Mark, Michael wrote to me, it was a challenge I could not resist. He asked me whether we could produce an award out of a machine. And I wrote back to him just to confirm, Michael, you want us to do an AI-generated award? He said, yes, please, can you do that at the University of Pretoria? Even though I didn't quite know how to do it at the time, of course, I said yes. First, I can't say no to Michael. And also, I can't resist a challenge. So fortunately, I had two experts in my faculty to call upon, Professors Papadopoulos and also um, Babulal Frank. And fortunately, they work in slightly different areas, but they complement each other perfectly. And so we set to work, we had a few meetings as well, we experimented, and I can confirm that that award was generated in a matter of minutes. So we had the award, but I also had to do my part, right? So because we were pushed for time on Good Friday, I sat down and I started knocking this into the form of an award. Now, I'm no arbitration expert. I dabble a little bit in arbitration clauses when they appear in a contract. But I've never drafted an award. So I didn't know what it looked like. But then again, that was not a problem. I asked ChatGPT, you know, the format of an award. And so I got one. And then what I did, I did not change the substance of the original award generated by ChatGPT, what I did was to make it look like a formal award. So things like numbering paragraphs, um, putting in headings. But trust me, that's all I did. I did not change the substance or the essence of what ChatGPT decided. And so the award has truly been generated by ChatGPT Four, that is the pay version. So if you want to get access to that, you have to shake your pockets a little bit. Um, the um, open access version, of course, only goes up to, I think, 2021. Um, the pay version, definitely much more powerful. We were able to feed in all these um, submissions, the facts of the case, etc., etc. And I think we... Um, ended up with a very respectable award. So thank you again for the opportunity. 
thank you also for your patience this afternoon. I know it's late already for bearing with us. And um, Michael, I hope this will meet your expectations. Um, we, we know where we are now, and we know it's not perfect. But maybe in two years' time, the, um, the challenge will be on again. <laughs> thank you very much. A very big thank you to the team from the University of Pretoria. That concludes today's proceedings. What's happening next? The award will be published tomorrow. The AI award will be published tomorrow. It will be available from the Young Apps stand in the room behind you uh, tomorrow, sometime during tomorrow morning, so please make sure that you pop past, grab a copy, and see what you think. The Human Arbitrators Award by our esteemed panel will be published on Thursday. At that final session, we will deal with the award. There will be a brief discussion about it as well. And of course, we will announce the winner of the Moot competition. Thank you very much for your time on behalf of Young AFSA. And with great thanks to AFSA, Michael Cooper, and his esteemed colleagues, thank you very much, and see you on Thursday. <laughs>